Good morning and welcome to day two of the Jobs and Skills Summit. I hope everyone's feeling energised. It's another massive day ahead of us. Uh, I acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on, on whose traditional lands we meet today. I pay my respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri elders past and present. And I extend that respect to other First Nations elders, delegates, public servants, politicians, and staff who are in the room today. Aboriginal people have been telling stories and discussing ideas on this land for tens of thousands of years. Today, we walk in the shadow of their footsteps, working towards a shared future. Uh, as I say, we do have a, a big agenda and um, I won't waste a lot of time, but I do want to start with my highlights from yesterday. It was a selfie with Dylan Alcott. If you haven't got one of those already, I recommend you, you do that. Um, <laughs> I, um, I also uh, got to meet Greta, who turned up um, with, uh, on the hip of uh, Minister O'Neill. That was definitely a highlight of seeing her yesterday and meeting her today. Um, and I also want to call out Terry o, um, O'Toole from the Flight Attendants Association who lent me her flats last night in the great tradition of helping out another woman. Um, my feet were completely done. Um, the first session, Skills and Training for the Future Labour Market, follows the discussion we began yesterday afternoon. To commence day two, please welcome the Honourable Brendan O'Connor, MP, Minister for Skills and Training. Well, thank you very much, uh, Helen. Can I uh, firstly um, uh, welcome everyone here to the second day of the summit, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we meet today, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Yesterday we heard powerful presentations across a range of topics, including the mega trends that provide challenges and opportunities for our economy and our society. This morning we turn our focus to the role of skills and training and how the vet sector can, be, can more effectively provide the skills that workers and employers need now and in the future. Common ground and the outcomes already achieved at this summit give cause for optimism that further ground will be made today. The National Cabinet on Wednesday demonstrated that we have begun a new era of Commonwealth state cooperation on skills and training. The announcement of over $1 billion co-funded for national skills agreement that will deliver 180,000 fee-free TAFE places in 2023 was a good start. A further commitment by all governments to guiding principles that will underpin a five-year national skills agreement from 2024 has the potential to deliver lasting national reform. At the same time as nine governments were doing this, the BCA AI Group, Aki and the ACTU, developed for this summit the Statement of Common Interests on Skills and Training. Even though the two processes were entirely different, there is remarkable similarity in the principles and aims for VET agreed to by the Australian government leaders and those agreed to by the ACTU and employer groups. It is in the national interest for the VET sector to be supported by cooperation and agreements of this magnitude. It is my pleasure to welcome our wise and diverse group of panellists for our discussion on skills and training for the future labour market. And in the interest of time, I have asked each panellist to introduce themselves and open with a short statement of views. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Jennifer Westacott, the Chief Executive of the Business Council of Australia. And as all of my colleagues have done, and as a profound mark of respect, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. There were two highlights from yesterday. We achieved great success in making women's participation a core economic issue, not a topic you have after lunch on day two of a summit. And secondly, every discussion went back to skills. So today it's time for action. Catherine Livingston yesterday put a fabulous framework which I think allows us to think about this in those three horizons, jobs, skills and competencies which build the skills of the future. The other takeout from yesterday is everything we do in skills, every dollar we spend, every decision we make has to help us get ahead of the mega trends we discussed. 
So I start with competencies, the things that build the skills of the future. I'm not going to get into the school system because that would take a five-day summit, but there are two or three things that we could do uh, on competencies. Catherine said early childhood, let's get on with that. But we could intervene in the pathways that young people take, how they leave school, the competencies they leave with, so they're not just getting a mark, they're leaving with a set of recognised competencies. And of course we could completely transform careers advice. Now let me quickly turn to the skill system. We need to revitalise and refresh and properly fund the VET and TAFE system. Fantastic to see the announcement yesterday, 180,000 extra places, new skills agreement. But we need to move quickly to transform that money into transforming the system. And that transformation has to be about a tertiary system where we remove the cultural and funding biases that push people disproportionately into the university system or into a pathway that's not right for them. We need to make the system more interoperable. By that I mean interoperable between VET and higher ed, interoperable between learners and employers, driven by learners and employers, and interoperable between institutional learning and workplace learning. Workplace learning needs to be part of the qualifications framework, part of the actual way we train and skill people. It has to be recognised, there has to be standards, and we have to make sure it's portable. And where it's credential, where it has integrity, it potentially should be able to be used by other people. For example, Microsoft and IBM both do digital apprentices. Why can't that be available to a wider group of people? Next thing is micro-credentials, getting the skills we need when we need them, not waiting three years. We need a framework for micro-credentials, making sure they're credible, meaningful, portable, they can be stacked. They're a supplement to the qualification system, not a replacement model. Workplace learning needs to be part of the micro-credential framework. On top of all of that, we need to think about the apprenticeship system, modernisation of it, making sure we're looking at things like digital apprentices, making sure we're expanding beyond the uh, traditional sectors and incentivising completion rates as much as we are incentivising starts. And then all of that requires us to have a digitised system where we can recall what people have learned, um, they can kind of keep that record, it's against a set of standards, an employer can see a candidate set of credentials, and people can build up this body of evidence about what are their competencies, their capabilities, the skills, not just the qualifications they have. Final couple of points. Uh, we talked a lot about gender yesterday, and we've got some specific ideas about gender, skills guarantee for older women workers, making sure we target digital apprentices, broaden the apprenticeship scheme. But make no, no mistake, fixing women's participation isn't about carving out a few courses for women. It's about a fundamental premise that the skill system has to be designed to address the skill gaps and close the access problems for women across many sectors. And then crucial point that um, Aki, the ACTU and AIG have called for is that we have to revisit foundation skills. You can't continue to deny the fact that many people who are not working to their potential or who are long-term unemployed simply don't have the basic skills of reading, writing, spelling, numeracy and digital. So asking those people to upskill is simply not realistic. We have to go back to a proper foundation skills model. What are we willing to do as business to take the Treasurer's Challenge? Firstly, we at the BCA want to work with other business groups to design an industry skills guarantee. We would commit to stepping up and doing more on training, voluntary reporting on the training we were doing, sharing our work-based training so that they could form the basis of other micro-credentials, and then commit to sharing leading-edge courses, and then work with Jobs and Skills Australia about the skills that we need. Secondly, we want to work with government to design a trusted trainer program. We have to recognise and give credit to the many employers in this room who are at the leading edge of the pack, strengthen the connection between training and skilled migration, see them as complements, not substitutes, remembering that well-managed permanent migration adds to the skill base, creates other jobs, and then employers who are leading become trusted trainers. They get faster, easier, access less costly to uh, skilled migration, which supplements and allows them to expand and grow. Look, what we're doing today is essentially writing, I think, Minister, the first three months job description for Jobs and Skills Australia. We have to stop talking about it. We've got to do it, do it step by step, because all the stuff we talked about yesterday, if we want to get to the frontier, it's the skills and capabilities of people that get there, it's the skills and capabilities that give them access to high paid jobs, it's the skills and capabilities of people that drive innovation, and it's the skills and capabilities of our people that will make our country a magnet for investment. Thanks. Thanks, Jennifer.
Thank you. Good morning, delegates. Karina uh, Haythorpe, Federal President of the Australian Education Union. I'd like to acknowledge that it's a privilege to walk together and to learn together on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country and pay my respects to the elders past and present and also acknowledge the elders uh, of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us today. Prime Minister, your announcement yesterday of a $1.1 billion package uh, for TAFE sent a strong message to Australia about the importance uh, of TAFE uh, with respect to jobs and skills, and it was heard by our members, the TAFE teaching workforce, and certainly by the students of Australia. Building and investing in the skills uh, and capacity of our national labour market is critical to creating greater economic and social opportunity in Australia, yet it's been a nine long years for TAFE. The coalition government had no coherent plan for skills or migration, largely leaving it to individual employers to set the course with dismal learning outcomes and economic results and a demoralised workforce. Vocational education and training is the foundation of our broader skills system and it needs to be a core part of our workforce development strategy and properly integrated into our overall tertiary education and training system. Investing in skilling and reskilling Australians is a priority that we share with employers and all beneficiaries of an efficient and effective national education and training system have a responsibility to contribute, aided by the appropriate supports and incentives. But the VET system has fragmented, it's been underfunded and run down. It does not provide a holistic picture of the skills needs and is not integrated with industry policy. The voice of industry, both unions and employers, is essential to our national skills and training system's success, and it needs to be heard at every level uh, of every system. Jobs and Skills Australia, as a newly established independent tripartite body, needs the resources to assess skill shortages and to carry out workforce planning, and it also needs the authority to help coordinate skilled migration to ensure that this complements rather than undermines our skills system. TAFE has a strong social contract to our communities, but it must be backed by governments to fulfil that contract. We need to rebuild TAFE as the centre of the VET system by guaranteeing VET public funding for TAFE, and we also need to invest in the TAFE teaching workforce, pay teachers more, and encourage a range of industry experts to move into the TAFE sector. Australia's system for apprenticeships and other on-the-job training can be world-leading, but it needs to be reinvigorated, needs to be expanded, adapted and supported to meet workforce needs now and into the future, including in digital skills with the increasing digitalisation, requiring enhanced and portable skills across industries and between related industries. And we need to support increased uptake and completion of apprenticeships and traineeships by a Commonwealth-funded 50% wage subsidy directed to both employers and employees, including retention bonuses and apprenticeship support with the creation of a National Apprenticeship Advocate. Next Tuesday is National TAFE Day, and we'll be celebrating uh, and recognising the awesome TAFE teaching workforce right across Australia, and I ask all of you to join with us on that day and celebrate TAFE for the incredible public institution that it is. Great to, <coughs> to follow those comments. My name is Mary Ferrone. I'm Chief Executive of uh, a large TAFE in Victoria Homes Glen Institute and also Chair of TAFE Directors Australia. And I too would respect respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet. Um, firstly, great opportunity to be here today, so thank you, and a great thanks to Prime Minister um, and the state and territory governments for the free TAFE announcement yesterday. TAFEs deliver from over 550 sites and deliver the majority of high volume complex qualifications and deliver more to underrepresented uh, under and marginalised cohorts. We have a significant role in social inclusion and social cohesion, and we see firsthand how education changes lives, and we should not lose sight of that. The Free TAFE initiative has had a positive impact on access and equity, in particular for women returning to study. I am hopeful that the discussions at this summit will ultimately have a positive impact on demand for training in key priority areas. The churn, attrition and low demand we are seeing needs to be addressed. Simply identifying a need for training does not always translate into a demand for training. Students first choose a career, 
and then a provider. Recalibrating demand is a significant issue to ensure that we are not talking about labour shortages in three years' time. In fact, these trends have been evident for at least six years, but COVID has exacerbated the problem. I am hopeful we can work together to boost demand for the future. The other major issue for us is the VET system and product architecture and whether it is fit for purpose in 2022 and beyond. It was established 25 years ago. It is considered to be too, rigid, too complex and inflexible and not focused sufficiently on tra transferable skills for current workplaces and to address future industries and emerging needs. We are proposing an overhaul of the system and a role for TAFE and VET providers in the future design of the system and products, including the role of micro-credentials, which are useful in upskilling and reskilling and should augment qualifications, not replace them. Our future is in partnering with industries. We have some great examples in TAFE and we need to further maximise opportunities to share knowledge and skills, facilities and have access to cutting-edge technology and access to industry experts. Our biggest challenges are recruitment of staff, in particular teachers. Our ability to contextualise solutions for employers at a local level and access to practical and clinical placements to grow our student numbers. Another challenge for us is providing wraparound services to our students, including mentoring and wellbeing. So what we're seeing is a significant number of students coming into the TAFE uh, who have mental health issues and, uh, and have difficulties in their workplaces. So how do we support them? The VET sector is crucial to providing a skilled workforce for the future and should be seen to complement higher education and vice versa. When one sneezes, the other gets a cold. Let's ensure the two sectors work together to develop a skilled, skilled workers for the future. Even with considerable challenges in the past 10 years, TAFEs have um, continue to deliver to hundreds of thousands of students. Let's not let the narrative of the system issues diminish VET even further. We need to be seen as an equal pathway to jobs and careers as higher education is. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister, for the opportunity to contribute today. Um, my name is Innes Willox. I'm the Chief Executive of the National Employer Association, the Australian Industry Group. <clears throat> As has been referred to, a golden thread of, that ran through all of yesterday's discussion, all the discussion around the jobs of the future, around <clears throat> gender equality, around workplace relations, the golden thread was the need for skills a proper skills base and a proper program of skills development. The reality is, is that our future depends on a highly skilled workforce. We have no option but to focus on skills in a significant and focused way. Another reality is, is that there are significant pay increases occurring right now within workplaces but they are primarily focused on the skilled component of those workforces, those who are highly sought after, highly contributive and seen as highly valuable. Catherine Livingston yesterday went back to the 2020 summit of 2008 and talked about Groundhog Day. Uh, my experience is a little bit later than that. In 2016, with others, I stood in front of the then Prime Minister and the Premiers at a COAG meeting. Uh, don't worry, none of you were there then, so not being held responsible. Um, but we talked then of the looming skills sh shortages that industry were experiencing at that time and the crisis that was unfolding before us. And here we are. 
We still have crippling labour and skill shortages with no relief in sight. And to be blunt, there is no more important issue for employers. We need urgent and wholehearted action that makes a significant down payment on developing a pipeline of skilled workers for at least the next decade. Enough of the excuses. This plan must deliver bold generational reform. A history of tepid reform has left us unprepared and wasted precious time and money. It now seems that our teenagers would rather be influencers than engineers. We are at a critical juncture with no option but to step up to the challenge. As we see it, there are seven priority areas for reform, and I'll touch on them quickly. The first is new entrants, reinvigorating our apprenticeship system, evolving it to a model that embraces higher and degree apprenticeships, traineeships and cadetships across more occupations is crucial. It must become a system that people are keen to join, keen to complete, and is the primary skill development pathway for industry. For existing workers, we need to focus on the skills of those currently in the workforce to ensure that their skills remain contemporary. This will involve developing a lifelong learning framework that builds skilling options for existing workers and mature age people seeking employment. A particular focus is on developing a range of industry-endorsed micro-credentials, enabling shorter and sharper and targeted upskilling and reskilling. Careers are no longer linear and predictable, and every worker, young and old, needs to be flexible, adaptable and capable of rethinking on how best to use and, their, how best to use and grow their skills and their capabilities. The high-paying, high-skilled jobs of now and the future are digital. We need a national strategy that includes digital capability standards and a framework that supports the digital transformation and enablement of our economy. Nobody should be left behind. We need to provide the skills to power our companies, large and small. Industry knows this, but the education and training system is just catching up. Fourth point is foundation skills. Without a, successful, without a successful foundation, you can't build something that you are proud of. Without language, literacy, numeracy and digital skills, we will not have successful participation in employment and the necessary capacity to upskill. On the tertiary sector, if we are really serious about focusing our education and training sector on our future needs, we need a coherent and connected tertiary sector, a sector that equally values vocational and higher education in a fluid, seamless and dynamic way. Full implementation of the Noonan Review of the Australian Qualifications Framework is an essential first step. We also need a tertiary system that consistently provides high quality, trusted education and training worthy of our investment. This means lifting our game on funding and regulation to ensure that every dollar invested, public and private, delivers for us all. Pathways from schooling are crucial. Our, our nation's skills will better match those that industry needs where young people move into careers that are right for them. Our systems of careers advice from an early age still need great improvement. And funding. None of these actions will be possible without adequate funding of our tertiary education and training sector. Yesterday's announcement was fantastic, but to be blunt, as Mary alluded to, more will be needed. We need urgent action which restores investment levels in, in VET, remedying long-term declines. We need federal and state governments to be together and working off the same page. Six years ago, we told the Prime Minister and the, and the Premiers that building our skills base was the great national challenge, and it still is. Thank you. My name is Duncan Bentley. I'm Vice Chancellor and President of Federation University Australia, Victoria's regional university. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and uh, uh, pay my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging. 
I'm here to tell you about something that works and why we're doing it. It really follows up on all of the uh, panelists so far. I'm going to say something which is quite shocking to you, but um, try, try, try to manage it. When you combine work and learning, graduates have better employment skills. Students are less likely to drop out, and they're more likely to continue learning throughout their career. Why is that important? Because as the Treasurer said in an op-ed uh, uh, last week, nearly a third of disadvantaged and regional students drop out of higher education, and over a half drop out of vocational education. University enrolments for lower socioeconomic students is stuck at 15%, yes, 15%. And yet we know from the Megatrends report, the Jobs of the Future, that most future jobs will require a higher qualification or a degree. Youth unemployment is twice the national average. In outer regions, it's up to four times the national average. The regions have worse underemployment. And in regions like Gippsland and the Wimmera, a massive need for reskilling and upskilling through transition. So we need to find a way to break the barriers and create pathways for all our community. That's why Federation University is a dual sector, regional university, introduced Australia's first co-op model of delivery. It's been delivered in the United States and Canada for decades. But we've been partnering with IBM in our technology park in Ballarat on our campus for 25 years. There are two and a half thousand jobs there, non-university jobs, and we're going to double that by 2030. And together with IBM, we built pathways and courses, including industry certifications, for every cohort of student, from school through vet to degree, and some go on to PhD. Our joint Bachelor of IT offers 1,600 hours of training with IBM. Well, not surprisingly, IBM hires 75% of the graduates. Do you know that seven years later, 70% of them are still with IBM in global careers? The other students are snapped up by SMEs in the Technology Park or in Ballarat. 90% work in the regions. Federation and IBM have shown that co-design, co-creation, and co-delivery in the workplace works. We are now scaling it to all students across every discipline and sector. The prosperity of federations, regions, and employers depends on us implementing it quickly and well. And as the chair of the Southeastern Melbourne Manufacturing Alliance said to me recently, don't do it to us, do it with us and our people, or you'll stuff it up. Thank you. <laughs> Well, before I ask uh, participants from the floor to ask questions of the panellists, I just want to ask a couple uh, uh, myself. Can I first uh, ask you, Jennifer, uh, that um, uh, in, in relation to the joint statement that was released by the BCA, Aki AI Group and the ACTU, um, the, if you could outline the basis for the statement and why the tripartite arrangements are important for training from an employer perspective. Sure. Thanks, Minister. So the basis of the statement was basically around a few things, some of which we've talked about. So urgently establish Jobs and Skills Australia, but we were very clear about its role, which is it's got to kind of be um, providing advice to government and industry on economy-wide workforce needs and, and guide the allocation of skilling investments invest in vocational education and training with those sustained funding increases, um, but also making sure that the system's meeting market needs and a focus on increasing accountability and reforms focused on learner outcomes. Um, reinvigorate and adapt Australia's apprenticeship system by increasing funding in the October 22 budget, and that's got to focus on incentive, incentivising completion rates, wage subsidies for both employers and apprenticeships, and payment for mentoring programs for apprenticeships for apprentices. The guarantee foundational skills, including digital literacy, was uh, another focus. And we thought that could be done by updating the National Foundation Skills Strategy for Adults to recognise the impact of digitisation and refreshing national language, literacy, numeracy and digital skills strategies um, to include 
kind of realistic KPIs to ensure accountability and expanding funding for delivering that relevant training. And then this kind of lifelong learning framework that adapts to those ever-changing needs um, and gives incentives to upskill and increase the delivery of more flexible options like micro-credentialing. So why is it important? Because I think both employers uh, and, and the union movement need to see a skills system that's working in a way that we talked about yesterday. So everything sort of came back to skills, but the skills system doesn't encourage uh, easy movement. You know, it doesn't encourage people to be able to upskill. It's too slow. It's too clunky, uh, and also it's it's kind of out of date in a kind of in a curriculum sense in many respects. So, and it's it, it's not interoperable. So I think what employers tell me, and they tell Innes, I know, is they want interoperability. They want people to be able to go to vet and higher education in a seamless way and to be able to get courses from both of those rather than having to choose a pathway that actually doesn't suit the employer. And then the final thing is employers tell me, and I'm sure they tell the unions as well, that they are already doing fantastic courses, already doing great work-based learning, but it's not integrated into the skill system, so it's got no status. And so it's sort of these things just exist as kind of dual systems. Our, our kind of quest, I guess, in putting this together is to get that to be inter interoperable, to make it focused on the learner and the employer, and to get mechanisms that allow it to change and adapt over time. Thank you. And Karina, I was going to ask uh, you with your AEU and ACTU hat on today, um, just the pers your perspective as to the importance of that statement and the, and the support across employer and union uh, in relation to this matter. Yes, thanks, Minister. Well, uh, you know, it, it, TAFE uh, is in our communities right across Australia, and one of the important things that we know is that that, it, that, that strong connection with industry um, supports our students in terms of their qualifications uh, and certainly their experience uh, and outcomes uh, as they enter the workforce. So it's, a, it's a, a very important statement for us, and we believe that um, in terms of uh, addressing the skill shortage and rebuilding uh, uh, TAFE in terms of its workforce and its in infrastructure, it's going to take all of us. It will take very strong uh, working relationships with industry, with governments uh, and unions. And we have to do this because uh, it's been now many, many years um, uh, and, and our, our panellists have talked through the, the issues that are facing the vocational education sector many, many years since we've had this opportunity uh, to come together and to work together and to create a different future uh, for our students. And I can tell you that fills our membership, the TAFE teaching workforce uh, with a great sense of hope for the future. Okay, thank you. Um, Mary, we've heard from you and uh, other panellists about the attrition in the vet sector uh, and, the and the completion rates, uh, which are of course woefully low. Uh, can you outline your thoughts on why attrition and completions are a concern and what we can do to attend to that? Uh, thanks, Minister, for the question. Um, what we are seeing um, right across the board is uh, a softening of demand in key priority areas, such as nursing, health-related programs, early childhood education, which is particularly um, distressing, and of course in aged care. Uh, we also have seen churn and attrition in many courses uh, across, uh, across a number of disciplines and in particular in apprenticeships where we have woeful um, completion rates. Our work with apprentices in particular shows, because we have an a, a, a apprentice support unit that helps apprentices, the, the majority of issues um, related to attrition in apprenticeships is workplace issues. It's not They don't leave because they don't like the training, they leave because of workplace issues. Um, obviously this is costing taxpayers a lot of money in regards to you know, turn in the education and training system, so how do we address this? I think um, there's been lots of proposals about how do we provide, as well as providing um, money for uh, the training, how do we provide support for our students in the system? How do we provide, in particular, support for apprentices in the workplace? Um, and it could be through other avenues. Um, 
uh, other government agencies to provide that support. But we have to now step in because we are, in a sense, wasting taxpayers' uh, money if we do not address both the demand issue, as I said, there's an identified need for training, but now it's about getting people into those priority areas. So how do we work with industry? People choose a career, they choose an industry. So how do we bolster um, the uh, voice of industry in regards to the demand for training? And how do we help apprentices um, remain and other people, uh, uh, other um, workers in their workplaces. How do they um, stay there? And a lot of those issues, I think, were talked about yesterday at the summit in regards to workplace issues of uh, of uh, pay conditions, harassment, etc. So it's not an easy question, I think, to no. answer, Minister. But I think we need to address them and start to really think about what are those strategies that we can put in place that will help uh, both the churn and attrition. Thanks, Mary. Innes, I mean, you've been you know, a long-standing uh, advocate for apprenticeships. You've got a great level of expertise in the sector and manufacturing and representing your members. Um, you talked earlier about needing greater investment in the VET sector um, by government, state and federal, uh, reforms required as well. Um, but when you look to some of the exemplars in the economy, in the labour market, when you see employers getting higher completion rates, working with the VET sector, uh, and Duncan touched on this as well earlier, what is it you think we can do to increase completion rates? What are the ingredients that make up uh, the successful uh, completion rates that we see among some apprentices, uh, apprenticeships, but not others? Thanks, Minister. I think it's a really core question. We're seeing completion rates in some parts um, of the apprenticeship system at below 50 per cent. So you know, that indicates to us that there's a problem both around the style and the substance of the program. Part of the issue, you know, and we run an apprenticeship program, we're having a good conversation around this, is it starts before the apprenticeship even how do you get the people who are considering an apprenticeship to be aware of what is expected of them uh, and how they then can, and how they can contribute more quickly into workplaces is another conversation uh, so they're productive and they feel productive from the start one of the big problems we have is that we have uh, over 100 vacancies in our apprenticeship system at the moment. So it's getting people uh, interested, getting them focused on it. And this, what, this is where it comes back to that issue uh, around schooling, career pathways and the like. I think that's where a lot of focus can be so that people just don't stumble into, into this or feel that it's the last best option, that it is a real career pathway. It is exciting. It does make things. It does contribute to the economy. It is highly skilled and increasingly highly skilled. So I think a lot of the focus, we think a lot of the focus needs to go into the pre-apprenticeship and the pre-apprenticeship system. And I think that's where a lot of gains can be made to get those completion rates up. We can have a whole range of other conversations and they're really controversial and now's not the time around no. whether the four-year apprenticeship's the right way and all those sort of things. But if we just focus on the pre-apprenticeship, we get much better outcomes. Thanks for that. And uh, Duncan, uh, you talked about the beneficial cooperative models that you're obviously directly involved in. And I think we're all in agreement about that's a very great vehicle for success. Uh, I want to understand the types of foundation skills and supports required to assist students, particularly those who face types of disadvantage, and um, uh, how, do we, how do we provide the skills they need? How do they get access uh, to, to uh, the right form of learning, and what do we need to do to provide the right support for those who are disadvantaged and locked out of either the training sector or, the worst, the labour market? 
Yeah, thanks, Minister. Um, uh, solving, solving that problem is, is quite a challenge, but it does go back to the early childhood uh, interventions that, um, that we've seen recently from the states. Those are going to be really important to start really early and take those uh, right the way through. What we find is that um, um, schools, exactly as others have said, are critically important in building that capability. We need the, um, the teaching staff and educators, particularly in the uh, disadvantaged areas, the remote regional areas, to be able to work with the students. But we need to do more than that. And so with the Asia Pacific Renewable Energy Training Center, where we had fly in, fly out around the world, to maintain and repair wind turbines. You might have noticed we've got quite a few around and um, <clears throat> offshore is starting to happen. No heights training, no apprenticeship. Industry came to the party to say, well, we need a pipeline of skills there. We need reskilling and upskilling. But how do we actually encourage people to come in, particularly in the regional areas? Uh, a lot of uh, people won't have a clue as to what that job means. And it goes back um, to the earlier comments about working with industry to be able to engage with the young people to show them what it is they're going to do. There's no point going for a, a training on wind turbines and then discovering at the end of the apprenticeship that you can't stand heights. It's not going to work. And so that's why industry invested in this hands-on way of training. And it is why industry and our local government, uh, Victorian government and local governments are supporting students with packages of support which allows them to go financially hundreds of kilometers away to do training, childcare packages, support for them to be able to manage their day-to-day -day living costs while they do this training and upskilling. They've got petrol, they've got accommodation, they've got block release, they need to be able to cater to that and together only together can we support that industry, um, government support, and uh, the universities and vocational education organizations. Because that flexibility and that ability to reach people where their point of felt need is will ensure that we can increase the demand and keep them engaged. Thanks, Duncan. Can I just now I understand that the Queensland Government just this week announced a workforce development strategy and I'd like to call upon the Queensland Premier uh, to, to comment upon this announcement. Uh, can I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather today? Uh, thank you, Minister. And that's right, this week we actually launched our own uh, workforce strategy where we actually recognise that Queensland needs 280,000 new workers uh, by 2024-25. And I think just listening to what everyone's been saying here today, everyone's identifying the problem, but what's the solution? And I just thought I'd give a practical example of some things we're doing in Queensland. So first of all, we actually mapped regional Queensland and all over Queensland and worked out what are the, the, the skills and training that are needed to match with industry over the coming uh, 10 years. So, for example, in Maryborough, where we're building trains and investing in a train um, manufacturing centre, we are linking in with the local high schools and the local TAFE to make sure that there's a clear pathway for students. Likewise, with hydrogen in uh, Gladstone and Townsville, the same thing is happening, linking the schools with the industries that are needed. In Ipswich, where we're building the boxes, we know there's a huge supply chain that is needed for defence. So we've mapped that with industry. So I think if you, if you break it down, there are going to be different needs in different communities. Uh, one other need we recognised quite clearly was that in regional Queensland, um, healthcare is a really big issue, trying to attract our nurses and doctors to go out to more rural and regional areas. And one idea that came up to us, which I raised at National Cabinet the other day, the other day was that if our retired nurses were able to come back into the workforce and not have their pension impacted for a very short period of time of one to two years, we could have an extra 2,000 healthcare professionals across Queensland uh, tomorrow. So I think that's something that we can work with the Commonwealth uh, on. Uh, finally, can I just say that you know, we've had free TAFE for under 25s in our core courses, which has worked very well. 
and we've had over, over 200,000 people that have actually been able to be trained uh, in Queensland. Our school-based apprenticeships are very good. We're investing in trade training centres as well. But also, too, there's a role here where industry and unions have actually been working together with government to identify those uh, training centres which can facilitate uh, the jobs that are needed. So I think the practical solutions need to be looked at, and it's going to be very different across our nation as to what those, uh, those skills are. And finally, can I just comment on this? I know we're coming up next to talking about skilled migration. As a, a granddaughter of um, a boiler maker, my grandfather left war-torn Europe, uh, came to Australia with absolutely nothing. Um, skilled migration is good for our country. Um, there are good, decent families that will come to our country, that will contribute to our country, and we will be giving them the opportunity for long-term secure jobs. So, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Premier. Uh, I'm just going to now call on uh, the CEO of COSPOA, Alexi Boyd, to, real, to, I think, to make a contribution about small business and the way in which it, it, it navigates the vet sector. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having the Council of Small Business Organisations participate in this important discussion. We too respectfully acknowledge that we are on Nunnamore land. I'd like to thank the Minister and the panellists for your expertise in guiding this important discussion. COSBOA values conversations about improving accessibility because we believe a more straightforward system will assist small businesses to maximise training opportunities and increase workplace productivity. We wholeheartedly support the role of the JSA and agree with the potential interoperability role it will play in areas such as future funding models and expanding apprenticeships into new areas. COVID-19 has taught us an important lesson. People want and will seek constant career sea changes. And a system which recognises this and the way small businesses navigate and work within the system will improve accessibility. These include engagement with TAFEs and private RTOs, micro-credentialing, lifelong learning and upskilling both externally and on the job. The system has been primarily designed to provide young Australians with qualifications before entering the workforce. The difference now is that we need future adaptations for the fact that people are living longer and their qualifications may become outdated. As we pursue a more straightforward system, our members, through discussions, seek answers to things like what solutions will benefit local economic development connecting businesses, local skill providers to meet the needs of a changing local workforce? How do we collectively generate demand for individuals like the self-employed, micro-businesses and small businesses owners to invest in their own education and skills development? Which current constraints regarding policy, funding, structure and regulation can be removed to improve accessibility of small businesses and their industry associations to navigate the system? And how do we put small business associations at the front of strategic planning to recognise their unique expertise and knowledge as to the future workforce development? To support small businesses, local employers should be connected with local training programs so that job outcomes meet the future local workforce needs. We believe this can be achieved by ensuring there are enough local economic development agencies who are well connected with local businesses to think strategic planning, programs, qualifications and graduates to the needs of the local business community. We know that small businesses have always played a vital role in industry restructuring during the past economic shops like COVID and will continue to re-employ and retrain workers as we weather the storm of climate change. We agree that the possibility of businesses contributing to, a more to fund training and skills is an important objective, but presently many are in a fragile state as the impacts of COVID-19 continue to affect them. They may not be in a financial position to contribute to the effort. And one final point we'd like to make is that right now, essential workforce planning must get underway to address the unprecedented labour crisis across Australia's food supply chain. The Food Supply Chain Alliance, comprised of many COSBOA members and other key groups, is calling on the government to prioritise the sector to meet 172,000 worker shortages from paddock to plate, a shortage that will have significant and long-term impacts on the price and availability of food for Australians unless solutions are found quickly. Thank you. Thanks very much. I've, I have been advised we are getting very close to the end of the session, so I will ask participants to be very brief. 
uh, just call on Melissa Donnelly to, from the CPSU to uh, contribute to this discussion. Thank you, thank you, Minister. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we all meet, the Nullarbor and Nambri people, and pay my respects. As the economy moves out of the COVID-19 crisis, there is an urgent need to address the foundational skills of Australia's workforce, as well as those seeking to enter it. For a wealthy nation like ours, far too many employers report low levels of literacy, numeracy and digital capability among their workforce. People without adequate foundation skills are at greater risk of disengaging from learning and face barriers to fully participating in the workforce as well as society. Poor language, literacy and numeracy levels will continue to constrain productivity, labour mobility and the capacity of the economy to achieve the high skills needed for an increasingly knowledge-based and digital economy. Digital literacy is now an additional foundational skill and one that will require continual updating to keep pace with technological change. Individuals need access to digital training, both in the workplace and in order to gain access to employment and services. As our economy evolves and skills and education become increasingly essential to securing future decent jobs, it's critical that we don't leave Australians behind just because they have missed out on the basics. That's why we think that funded access to fund foundational skills should be guaranteed. Our experience ac across the public service in recent years makes this case more urgent than ever. A lack of investment in skills and staffing, an over-reliance on outsourcing, and a failure to support and develop talent across all tiers of government has limited our, our ability to respond to the challenges we faced and continues to limit our ability to respond to the challenges ahead. Rebuilding on national infrastructure in human capital and skills is more urgent now than ever and has to start from the, the foundations. Thank you. Thank you. And and the final contribution from the floor, uh, can I ask uh, Steve Fordham, Managing Director of BlackRock Industries, uh, to make a quick contribution, if that's okay? It's gone. Um, before I do start today, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional lands we stand on today and pay my respects to all elders past, present and emerging elders today and tomorrow. Um, being invited today, I thought it's a great opportunity, but I think listening to everyone, I think the pathway forward is a common sense approach. We talk about female unemployment, women back into the workforce, disability, the gap for Indigenous people into our industries and unskilled labour. This is not a, a short term problem that's come up, this is a problem that's been going on for a very, very long time. Today is about solutions though. I think a few uh, solutions that I've, I've sort of come across is Kids. We're focusing on kids in year 11 and 12 for education to get them into a career paths. We should be focusing on them in year 7. We have National Book Week, why not National Job Weeks? Bring large industries into the schools, start encouraging people to create a career path in a way in which they go forward. Guidance counsellors. Putting guidance counsellors into schools so we can turn around and actually help kids find the trajectory of what education purposes they need for the skill sets in which they're going to go forward. 50% subsidies for apprentices and trainees. It was an initiative that was brought in and it's come up quite irregular. I think it'd be something great. I'd love to see that for mums going back into the workforce as well. Crazy out of the box thinking, prisons. Big issue that we have across every state. I'd love to see our uh, prisons be turned into trade colleges. Anyone that does under a three year sentence does a traineeship. Anyone that does over four, an apprenticeship. This will help skill the workforce that is untapped and help us cr uh, create a recidivism rate that we can drop and help pa save money for the taxpayer and do something good going forward. The other big one that I'd like to bring up today is too is the Hunter Valley. And we've been talking about climate change and, and all the issues, but from a local resident, we're, our issue is not just the climate war, but it's the job war that's happening on our industry. Our industry has been seen as a long time for the Hunter Valley as Musbrook is District 12 in the Hunger Games. We contribute billions and billions of dollars into this economy and none of it stays into the local area. We've got a, a, a bypass that just got approved recently. It's been in the works since before I was born. We need to start looking at ways in which we can turn around and wean money back into our local economy and create diversity. But what I'd like to see, if we're going to start weaning ourselves off coal, we should start weaning ourselves off our mining royalties and put the money back into the Hunter Valley. 
We want jobs. We want to be able to go forward into this industry. We know there's a gap, but we do not want to be left behind. We keep talking about every election that we even had the last federal election. It was the war on jobs and coal. It's a war on our industry. It's a war on our pathway going forward. I recently had to move to Newcastle just so we could have a baby in a hospital because we can't get a doctor at our local hospital. We need to start looking for ways forward. We need to create some realistic approaches, but we need to, to start going events. And my last little point is we look at the, uh, our sigil is the, the kangaroo and the emu. They're two animals that do not go backwards. They can only walk forwards. And that's what we need to do. Thank you. I may just conclude from, from my seat rather than the lectern. I'll do, I'll do so very briefly. Firstly, can I thank all the panellists uh, and all of the contributors uh, for this, uh, this very important issue. I know everyone's very keen to have a significant critical discussion on skilled migration pathways. It is absolutely critical. And Claire O'Neill and Andrew Giles has, have done a power of work in that area, and we're soon to move to that. But I also want to make it very, very clear that it never has been a binary choice. And for this government, investing in our workforce, investing in our future workforce is as important as it is as important to us as ensuring we have effective skilled migration pathways. Um, it's, it's that important. And so can I thank the panelists and the contributors over the two days? Be, uh, focusing on some of the more immediate issues, and I thank the premiers and chief ministers too in terms of their support for the in investment in TAFE. That's been critical too. But also, we need to focus on the structural, systemic, and even cultural challenges to reform our vet sector, our higher education sector generally. Uh, what was interesting, as I said, um, from the outset was that the nine governments got together and found common ground for reform. And so too did the employer bodies and the ACTU. The, statement, the common statement of principles by, the, by industry and the guiding principles that will inform the long-term government agreement have common themes. And, the, and some of them are foundation skills. We need to do much better there to make sure that people access the labour market, that employers have the skills available, numeracy, literacy, digital literacy, uh, so that working people have secure jobs and can have a career progression because they have those foundational skills. That's a common theme and that's something the government will be working with other governments and industry upon because it's that critical. We'll also be, of course, focusing on the creation, uh, the architecture, the governance of Jobs and Skills Australia. Again, an absolutely vital, independent body informed by industry and experts and state and territory governments who are the deliverers of much, of course, of the skills to our labour market and prospective labour market. And that in itself is another key issue, and I assure you it's the priority of the Albanese government. It was not a coincidence. It was the first piece of legislation introduced into this parliament. Uh, there are so many other areas we could touch upon, uh, but we do, know, we, we do know we have to work on the fundamentals to reform the vet sector and higher education. I know Jason Clare is focused on that, uh, focused on ensuring, for example, we have the teachers and trainers to skill our workforce. If you talk about a skill shortage in our economy, you have to start by ensuring we have the skills in the vet and higher education sector to teach and train the future workforce and retrain the existing workforce. And uh, Jason Clare and I will be working together. Uh, Tony Burke in employment services, fully uh, presiding over employment services, fully understands that they have an obligation and we need to dedicate those resources to ensuring that job seekers can access foundational skills. And of course the states and territories are absolutely vital. The school sector that they of course deliver. So when we talk about foundational skills, it's not an employer requirement or, or you know, the obligation on an employer. It's, an obliga it's not an obligation just on the federal government. It's an obligation on all governments and employers and of course the training and education sectors. 
So I'll, I'll stop there. I want to thank everybody for this very important discussion today. I look forward to further engagement with all of you that have a keen interest in reforming uh, these sectors. And I now hand over uh, to my colleagues to have a very important, uh, uh, very significant discussion about the skilled migration pathways. Thank you very much. Thank you, <coughs> Minister, and <coughs> excuse me, and the, the panel. Um, this next session tackles the role of skilled migration in resolving the current skills and labour shortage crisis. On the panel is Annie Butler, Dr Joanna Howe and Andrew McKellar. To open this panel, firstly, uh, we'll hear from the Honourable Claire O'Neill, MP, Minister for Home Affairs, followed by the Honourable Andrew Giles, MP, Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs. Minister O'Neill. Thank you, Helen. Good morning, everyone, and it is absolutely wonderful to be here with you. As Australians, we are so lucky to share our country with the oldest living culture in the world, one that has been thriving for 60,000 years. That history is a reminder to us that every challenge can be overcome. To have the blessing of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people to have the discussion here today is a great gift, and I want to thank them for it. Migration has been one of the most discussed topics leading up to the summit, and we have an exciting 95 meaty minutes of discussion ahead with some really significant outcomes on the table. So how are we going to address this complex topic? First, our current skills crisis. We start with a panel of incredible experts to speak about some urgent, necessary reforms that will help us address the current situation. Then we're going to open up to a broader discussion. The saying goes, never waste a crisis. Well, COVID is presenting us on a platter, an opportunity to reform our immigration system that we will never get back, and I want us to take it. Today, we want to hear from you about what a migration system to serve Australia's future would look like. So let me just start with some very brief context about how we are thinking about the skills issue in Australia at the moment. The first thing I want to say is that the skills shortage in our country is real, and this is not a problem affecting just business and organisations. This is a problem affecting the everyday lives of every Australian. We have a teaching workforce at the end of their tether. We have nurses who cannot work the double and triple shifts that they have been pulling for the last three years. We have got an agriculture workforce where farmers are having to leave fruit on vines rotting because there is no one to pick them. We've got flights being cancelled because there aren't enough ground staff and we've got funerals being delayed because people can't go through with a funeral service. So this is real and it's affecting all of us. The second thing is that our focus as a government is always going to be Australian jobs first. And that's why so much of the discussion at the summit so far has talked about how we can use this incredible opportunity of low unemployment and a skills shortage to bring marginalised groups into the workforce, some of whom have been locked out for a very long time, and we have a chance to change that. But the impact of COVID has been so severe that even if we do all of those things, we are still going to be thousands and thousands of workers short of where we need, at least in the short term. Over the past few weeks, the size of this year's permanent skilled migration program has been a subject of furious discussion amongst the people in this room and indeed many outside of it. There isn't anything in this room that has universal support, but an area where almost everyone agrees is that we do need to lift the permanent migration numbers for this year. I want to emphasise that one of Labor's priorities in, in immigration is moving away from the focus on short-term migration to permanency and citizenship and nation building. 
So one of the responses today that we're announcing um, in response to the skills crisis is that the permanent skilled migration rate for 2022, which had been set at 160,000, the government will now increase that number to 195,000 this financial year. So what does that mean? What it means is thousands more workers, thousands more nurses coming into the country, thousands more engineers so desperately needed coming into the country in this financial year. I note that David Littleproud is here. This is important, David, for the regions. This will mean 34,000 places in the regions for this year, 9,000 more than would have occurred otherwise. To our state and territory premiers, I know this has been a big discussion with you, with our Prime Minister, and I can tell you that a big part of this program will be a lift under the state and territory allocations. So we'll move from what was 11,000 places allocated to you last year to 31,000 this year. Now, we've made that decision because of the discussion and the input of the people in this room. That's your voice being reflected in government decision making. So I want to hand now to Andrew Giles to speak about um, another change that we're proposing to make, and then we're going to hear from some of our amazing panellists. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much, Claire. Um, and I join you in acknowledging that we're meeting on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Since the borders opened, many have rediscovered that visa processing is a, an essential, indeed fundamental, function of national government. And as the Prime Minister reflected on Monday, if the government of the day treats the public service with respect and professionalism, public administration will improve. This is of course true of visa processing, an aspect of public administration too long neglected, with far-reaching consequences for our economy and for our society. Australia's visa system rests heavily on the shoulders of hundreds of people around the country. This system, these people, represent the foundation on which so many of the aspirations we are discussing here rest. Since I became the Minister for Immigration, I've met with visa processing staff around the country to thank them for the critical work they are doing and to discuss the tasks that lies ahead. There were almost a million visas waiting for this government at the election. Today that number is 900,000. We understand that when people wait and wait, the uncertainty can become unmanageable. Since I became the minister, I've heard hundreds of stories of people waiting for their application to be progressed, partners separated, not knowing when they would see each other again, businesses unable to plan an investment decision because they don't know when their applications will be finalised. This is not good enough and reflects a visa system that has been in crisis. This government is getting on with the job of ending this crisis. Since the election, an additional 180 staff are working on visa processing. And right now, an additional 190 staff are being onboarded, with up to 200 working regular overtime. Because visa processing is critical to an effective migration system for individuals, including workers, and for businesses. Now, the whole point of a temporary skilled visa is to facilitate workers into high-wage jobs quickly, but this has been frustrated by delay. Now, the median number of days it takes for a person coming to Australia on a temporary skilled visa is down, from 53 days in May to 42 in July. The median time taken to approve new businesses for sponsorship has halved from 37 days to 18. The border closure also wreaked havoc on Australia's higher education sector and for many of our regions. Again, repair work is well underway. In May, students outside of Australia had to wait an average of 40 days for their visa. Now the figure's down to 31. Importantly, over half of working holiday visas for young people overseas are now finalised in less than one day. The actions we are taking are making a difference, but we recognise there is more to do. And we will do more to clear this backlog and set up our visa system to meet the challenges of the future. We will invest $36.1 million in visa processing to surge staff capacity by 500 over the next nine months. In addition to clearing the backlog, this will help deliver the permanent migration program that my friend Minister O'Neill just spoke to. The backlog will be cleared. Waiting times will continue to come down 
We will address this crisis while looking to position Australia to realise our potential as a reconciled nation that harnesses the great strength that is our diversity. Because this is the beginning, not the end. Immigration is about nation building. And central to this is the manner in which people are welcomed after they've made the decision to make Australia their home, whether for a period of time or for the rest of their lives. We want, indeed we need, people to choose Australia. And our processes and our policies must work together to support that choice. Getting this right in the national interest is my focus. Listening to and working with the people in this room and the millions of Australians who are our migration story. Thank you. Andrew, thank you. So starting out with two big policy commitments there that I hope indicate a real um, commitment on behalf of the government to work with all of you in this room on this really, really important subject. Now, we have three extraordinary people here to talk about some of the issues that we're facing in the immigration system in its current form. And so I want to introduce um, each of them and then I'll ask them all to make a brief opening statement. So firstly, Annie Butler, registered nurse, the voice of 310,000 nurses, midwives and carers. Um, and she's a very amazing uh, person and a good friend of mine. So, Annie, wonderful to have you here. Um, Dr Joanna Howe, a brilliant Australian migration expert. Uh, she's joining us on the panel. She's written and spoken widely about what is not a particularly well understood topic. And uh, we've got Andrew McKellar here, CEO of Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. They've been enormously important to building consensus around these topics at the summit. So I want to start uh, by uh, opening up Annie, if you could share some of your opening thinking with us. Um, thanks very much, Minister, to you and to Minister Giles and to the government for this um, great opportunity. I'd just like to start by acknowledging also the traditional owners of the lands we're meeting on today and pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging and any First Nations people joining us today. As we all know, we've all talked about this morning and throughout yesterday, Australia faces significant workforce challenges right now, with shortages across sectors and essential workers who've supported us throughout the pandemic exhausted and genuinely burnt out. Health systems across the country are under enormous stress, and while the government is working on it, the aged care crisis remains unresolved. And as we continue to deal with the ongoing impacts of COVID, shortages in some areas are acute. But this is not unique to Australia. Workforce shortages and health system stresses are global. We therefore cannot seek to solve Australia's problems by worsening the situation for other countries. We also cannot return to the pre-pandemic situation of using temporary migration to fill skills gaps because we have failed to conduct proper workforce planning, failed to train and skill local workers, and failed to offer secure quality jobs across sectors. We especially cannot return to the previous practices of treating temporary migrant workers as disposable. Additional workers are urgently needed, as the minister said, especially in health and aged care. And migrant workers have a long history of contributing to our health workforces. Almost 20% of nurses and midwives were educated overseas, and almost 40% were born overseas. But to ensure we have the skilled workforces we need, we must plan appropriately, train our local workforces, then encourage overseas skills through permanent migration programs, supported by industry-wide sponsorships, access to affordable housing, childcare and healthcare, and genuine secure futures as vital, vital contributors to Australian society. Thank you. So the labour migration system in Australia is fundamentally broken. And I know that's a big call, 
but we, I think, can all agree that the pandemic was a lost opportunity to reset labour migration when the borders were shut, to properly review what we're doing and to come out of the pandemic with a strong response. I think we know it's not working when we have employers who say they're crying out for workers, so labour shortages are endemic. But at the same time as shortages are endemic, we have an entrenched systemic problem with migrant worker exploitation. So I welcome and congratulate the government for putting this summit together as an opportunity for a much needed reset. And I've got three points that I wish to make today. So the first point is that the biggest driver of exploitation is temporary status and limited worker mobility when they are tied to an em employer. So in that respect, I welcome the announcement just made about this new consensus in favour of increasing permanent migration. The second point I wish to make is that bipartisan reforms are the only ones that last in the migration space. So, you know, I, I don't think we need to look back too far to recognise this. So, for example, when the UK said they didn't want our backpack, their backpackers working and tied to horticulture anymore, and the government announced an ag visa on the run. It was announced by the last government. It's abandoned by this new government because there wasn't the hard work done on building tripartite support for that and bipartisan political consensus in favour of it. The reality is we need that bipartisan consensus for lasting migration reform and employers need that. They shouldn't, be, um, they shouldn't have new visas waved in their face only to be taken away because the hard work wasn't done. And you know, at the same time, the labour shortages are genuine across farms in Australia, as the minister pointed out, fruit rot rotting on the vine. But at the same time, I think there are many of us that question whether the hort industry has the social licence for a new visa like that. So I welcome this summit as an opportunity to bring together that consensus that we need on the hard questions that have plagued us for decades. The third point is we need public confidence and trust in our migration settings. So it, to achieve this, we need transparency, enough, decisions made, enough to decisions made by bureaucrats behind closed doors. We need public accountability about how our migra migration settings are devised. A simple proposal, we need to abolish employer-conducted labour market testing. It's a tick-the-box exercise for the good employers. It's just more red tape for them. It delays how they access workers. And fundamentally, it doesn't catch the bad guys who can easily tick that box anyway. And it just adds more, to the bureau more, more needless work to the bureaucrats. I think the announcement of Jobs and Skills Australia is a really welcome one. And the connection between the earlier panel this morning to this panel, connecting skills, training and migration for the first time really is, is, is critical. And we should be modelling this on the Migration Advisory Committee in the UK, which does this kind of work. And finally, I just want to conclude by noting that I strongly believe in the transformative potential of migration. My own dad's story, immigrating from India to Australia, is testament to this. But you know what? My dad came here on a permanent visa, not a temporary one. And, you know, the fact that my own five children grow up in the best city, Adelaide, in the best country in the world, um, is testament to the permanent visa that he was on. So Australia is an immigration nation, but when we use immigration for an ulterior purpose and there aren't robust checks and balances and the public lose trust in the system, the employers can't access the workers they need and migrants are getting exploited and it's not a level playing field for business, then we need to fix it. So this isn't a question of whether we let people in, it's just a question of how we do it. Thank you. That was great, Joe. Thank you so much. And uh, what is it about South Australians? It's like a cult over there. I don't <laughs> um, Andrew, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. And indeed, uh, I too pay my respects uh, to the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting today, the Ngunnawal and Nambri uh, peoples. Uh, and indeed, look, uh, I think uh, it's uh, great to see that there's uh, um, a, a consensus emerging and I think some real breakthroughs uh, being achieved. I very much uh, welcome what I heard uh, from Minister O'Neill and also Minister Giles. Uh, I think the announcement today to move uh, to increase 
the permanent migration program to 195,000 uh, places uh, is um, a significant step forward, a very good decision uh, by the government and also the measures uh, to address uh, visa backlog. These are important steps. So uh, I think this is very uh, encouraging to hear. Uh, from a business point of view, um, I would say alongside the need for skills development and increased participation, it is essential that we get our migration settings right. Um, they have been very much uh, complex uh, and they're not meeting, it's clear they're not meeting the urgent skill needs uh, that we have. Um, I think we do have to recognise um, all of the legitimate skill needs that, um, that are there and some of these do not show up in the national skills shortage analysis um, and there are many examples that I could go to in that regard. Um, I think it's important that um, employer-sponsored temporary and permanent migration needs to return to the sorts of settings that we had prior to 2017, uh, which allowed sponsorship of all skilled occupations. So I think if we can take a step forward or st take a step to those arrangements, increase the flexibility, then that will serve the needs uh, of the economy uh, much more flexibly. Um, Employer-sponsored migration in Australia is the most successful form of migration um, for Australia as well as the migrant. And I think that's uh, something that we've got to try and get the system uh, back to. I want to address just a couple of points, uh, quite specific points quite uh, quickly. The first of those is to talk about the temporary skilled migration income threshold, uh, the acronym the TISMIT. Uh, so a couple of points that I just uh, note here. This uh, TISMIT, this income threshold, has a couple of key roles, um, not just ensuring that there is a minimum income, but also it's an eligibility uh, barrier. Um, any occupation below that threshold, which is currently $53,900 a year, uh, is not eligible. So even though there's a sort of a dominance of higher paid occupations at the moment uh, in the um, temporary migration program, um, this does not make the, the need to fill skilled roles, which have a market rate um, at the lower end, any less uh, important. Uh, I would say that the program is built on the requirement to pay market salaries, and that's, uh, that's how it should be, so as to be fair for everyone. Uh, three quarters of the current entrants are in fact uh, at, for professionals and uh, managers with a salary over 100000 So I think um, it, it's misleading if there's suggestions that the program's dominated uh, by exploitation of guest workers. Um, I think there's an acknowledgement by business. Um, this uh, threshold hasn't been increased for a long while. Uh, we think it can go up. Uh, I've seen suggestions that it should go up to as much as 90,000. I think that would be uh, excessive. Uh, and I think the risk with that is that we would carve out uh, and restrict the eligibility for a whole range of areas where migration is important in aged care, areas like uh, cooks, uh, cafe and accommodation uh, managers, uh, mechanics, hairdressers, to name a few. Uh, the impact on the regions as well, I think we've got to bear that in mind. So I think some flexibility there, but it's certainly an issue that business acknowledges is on the table. Another very quick point on labour market testing, very much uh, welcomed uh, Joanna's uh, comments uh, on that. I think this is a, an important uh, realistic perspective uh, to have in mind. Uh, we do see labour market testing uh, as being a significant uh, restriction uh, for many uh, employers who are seeking uh, to bring uh, people into the country at the moment and honestly when we have an unemployment rate at the moment of 3.4 per cent and in fact the number of registered unemployed uh, <coughs> is less than the number of job vacancies that we have in the economy for the first time in our history. I think to be tying people up in knots uh, with that is something that we'd urge caution on. So look, I might just wrap up with uh, three or four very quick summary points. Uh, we would say that we should ensure that the TISMIT, the income threshold, stays at a level that does not exclude much needed occupations. Let's show some flexibility there. Uh, strongly welcome the announcement uh, today in terms of the permanent uh, migration uh, intake. Uh, I think that's uh, great news. Uh, let's allow sponsorship uh, for all skilled occupations in the temporary skilled migration program. 
and ensuring a pathway to permanency. We think this is fundamentally uh, important. We need to better match the skills we are delivering to international students with our economy's skill shortages and then to maximise their pathways to permanent migration via stronger, more competitive uh, post-study work rights. Uh, and finally, let's sort out the complexity and mess that is leading to huge delays in processing. And we've heard the minister making some, I think, uh, uh, very um, positive statements in that regard. So look, thank you, ministers. Thanks, Andrew, and um, what terrific contributions from the three of you, and I hope you as the audience hear what I'm hearing, which is that this is one area of public policy where there's actually a lot of agreement between the different parties. So we want to ask a couple of questions off the top to just explore some of those areas of agreement, get to some of the areas of difference, and then we've got some um, great contributions coming from the floor. So, um, Joe, I want to start with you. Um, one of the areas where there does seem to be quite a lot of agreement is that um, we have focused too much as a country on temporary migration, mm. um, but everyone seems to agree that permanent migration is actually much more of an important piece of the puzzle. How did we end up here when the expert advice is all telling us that the way the system's designed is kind of backwards? Yeah, a very good question. And I think if we look back at the inception of the 457 visa in 1996, there was bipartisan support. It was introduced by the Keating government. The Howard government um, was then elected and they carried that through. And ultimately, it's been a fairly enduring reform in that it was abolished by Turnbull but replaced with the 482. So, you know, we've had an enduring um, a temporary skill visa. But what we've seen is that visa was designed originally as a discrete solution to labour market needs and it blew up and became the mainstay. And we've also seen sort of the side door thrown open through international students and backpackers as well. And so the temporary migrant workforce is actually a very significant labour market contributor in this country and it was never intended to be the, that way. But now this is where your government is now, is, is now responding to. And I think we need to be very clear um, that we can't actually have a one-size-fits-all solution for industries as varied as tech and health and care and hospitality and ag. So we heard, you know, about the shortages yesterday from the tech industry and their need for high-wage, high-skill industries. The 482 should be a high-wage, high-skill industry visa. It should be processed within 10 days because there isn't the concern about integrity and exploitation that there might be for th those other industries. But what we need to recognise is that in industries like care and hospitality and hort, we should not be relying on a revolving door of temporary migrants because locals don't want to work there. Because the fundamental problem for the revolving door is low wages, low conditions and poor job quality. And the, re the government, the, the reality is, you know, um, we, we don't offer permanent visas for these industries because we know that the minute we give a migrant permanency, they're not going to stay in that hot job or that care job because the conditions and the job quality are, is so poor. So is it fair to tether them through a temporary visa um, and, and to use that leverage of temporariness. So I, I really do welcome this shift to permanent migration. And I think if we are de designing temporary visas, we need to be clear what the 482 is, which is for high skill, high wage workers. And then if there are going to be programs for these other industries, we need to think very carefully about fixing the fundamental problems and designing those visas so they don't invite exploitation. Jo, thank you. Um, Andrew. Well said. <laughs> um, Andrew, I, I want to pick up briefly on one of the points that you mentioned about graduate students. So we've got this incredible international education sector in Australia that's such an important part of our economy. We are um, putting a lot of effort into training international graduates and you talked about some opportunities that uh, might be possible to allow those people to um, give more back as workers. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Well, look, no, just uh, very, very briefly. I mean, I think this, this is an important part uh, of our, our temporary migration program. Uh, we, we are bringing in um, huge numbers of international students, I think, in a, in a normal year. Um, that's upwards of uh, 500,000. Uh, and we have some important uh, source markets. Of course, it's been um, absolutely hammered uh, during the pandemic uh, period. Uh, we're restarting that program now. Um, from what I understand, 
the visa applications that are now coming through are very encouraging. We are, it's going to bounce back uh, strongly and that's fundamental uh, to our education uh, sector. This is a huge export industry for Australia. It's, uh, it's you know, a, a part of our knowledge base uh, in this nation. So, uh, but I think as there's also an opportunity and it's very attractive um, to people coming in uh, under those arrangements uh, to be able to access uh, work uh, while they're here under defined conditions. Uh, and I, have to, I think we have to recall that they're here principally to study uh, and to participate in the education system and the system has to be designed to facilitate that. But equally, uh, if there are opportunities, if people see that you know, um, there are benefits in remaining in Australia uh, post-study, then uh, we have to ensure that the system is uh, designed to support that uh, where it's appropriate. So I think more competitive post-study work rights uh, is something that we are strongly in favour of uh, looking at and uh, we want to have that dialogue and work with you and your colleagues uh, and the experts uh, who are here at the table uh, to see how we, can, how we can make that work. But I think it is an important consideration. Thank you. And a question for Annie. Um, we've heard a challenge laid out by Joanna on the state of labour market testing, a response from Andrew who also touched on the TISMED, but I think it's really important that we get your perspective, your understanding on those two questions. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, and I would just say that we do also welcome the announcement towards permanency. That's such a great direction. Um, I do agree with Andrew McKellar to a point that, yes, the TISMA has not been increased. It's been frozen since 2013. It needs to be um, increased. But we are the people saying it needs to be increased more, and it does need to in be increased to around $90,000 a year. Um, just in terms of context, that rate's about 1,770 a week, and for the average wage in health and social assistance is about 1,730 a week. Now, we're talking about trying to get skilled people here, and Andrew, I will just take a little bit of issue with a comment that you made about you can't afford that, and you referenced some sectors where you can't afford it, and one of them was aged care. And part of the problem, the crisis that we have seen in aged care is because the lack of numbers of staff, but the lack of skilled staff. We those people deserve to be rewarded properly. It just, and I know you, you it was, I don't mean to pick issue too much, but it just persists, perpetuates that view that that work, it's feminine work, feminised work, caring work, it's undervalued, it's not worth raising the basic average salary for, and let me tell you, it is. And so one of the things, one of the big flaws we also have with labour market testing, uh, and can I just say, if we want to resolve the crisis in aged care, we're not going to resolve it until we get the numbers of people in there right, until we get the skills right, until we reward them properly. So we need to make sure all aspects of how we build that workforce contribute to achieving that goal. Just on labour market testing, again, it's deeply flawed. We agree it just needs improvement. And I'll just again give the example of aged care. Too often, it's what labour market testing, it depends on what an employer um, has determined that uh, a difficulty in filling a role. But they have a difficulty in filling a role at current wage levels. So what we have is sometimes a pay shortage, not a skill shortage. And those issues need to be addressed. Very briefly, Andrew, any reply? Well, look, I, I think uh, hopefully we're pushing in the same direction here. Uh, I think we do need to do that analysis uh, around where this should be set. We agree. Um, as I said in my comments, uh, it's been where it, where it is at the current level, 53,900 for a long period of time. Uh, there was a report uh, that was done um, a few years ago, 2016, I recall. Uh, the author is uh, just sitting over here, uh, <coughs> present in the room, uh, and at the time it was recommended that it should be indexed. So uh, let's have a look at that. Let's see where it should be. Uh, I think our, our sort of suggestion is it could be lifted to 59, 60,000, but I think let's do that analysis and I think let's try and work to a consensus as where it should be set so as to take account of some of those considerations uh, in terms of uh, flexibility, ensuring we're not knocking out 
areas where there are genuine skilled needs and also taking account of things like the regional uh, interests as well. So we might move to questions from the floor and perhaps Premier Perrottet might kick it off, or contributions I should say. Uh, thanks Andrew. Well firstly can, we, can I welcome the announcement um, that you've made uh, today but more particularly as well on behalf of the Premier is the engagement that we've had in relation to the identification of the shortfalls in the skills and, and those gaps in, in the labour market. And there's no doubt for some time there has been gaps between where the priority migration skilled occupation list is and where state needs are. Uh, so from my perspective as, as Premier of New South Wales, I think the, there's two ways of looking at this. We need to immediately address where the pressing challenges are and where those shortages um, arise. And they're obviously in the areas that have been raised today, healthcare, aged care, uh, construction, engineering, um, other areas like childcare as well. I think these are, these are areas we need to address immediately. Um, and then there are long-term solutions that we need going into the future that's gonna drive opportunity um, and productivity. So from a short-term perspective, I think a lot of those areas have been addressed in the announcement that you've made and the engagement that the Commonwealth's had with the states has been pleasing, but whether it's accelerating visa processing for skilled migrants, um, it shouldn't be the case that in countries like Canada, that's taking two weeks, whereas in Australia, that's taking months. So that need, that, that we need to resolve that um, quickly, and I think the announcement today will go some way to doing that. Pathways for permanency as well, um, that's, that's been raised and that's supported by us. Um, accreditation, that's something as well that needs to be addressed, that, we need to move both at a Commonwealth and state level on um, together. Um, I agree with Anastasia in relation to um, finding those opportunities for um, uh, pensioners to, in certain targeted areas who want to return to the workforce, particularly in, say, aged care and health care, that they should not be financially penalised. Complicated, but something that we need to work on, as well as, um, as has been raised, as students. So students who are here, they've got their qualification, how do we move them towards permanency and, um, and, 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 and a greater residency status. But simply adding more people is only a short term uh, outcome. And I agree with Joe's uh, point um, in relation to once people come, we need to in the long term be investing in those areas which is going to drive um, opportunities for them to stay in those professions um, moving forward and also providing opportunities uh, for our people. I think the solution here um, is uh, something that we're seeing a lot more of now, and that's the states and the Commonwealth working together in areas they might not have otherwise done so, um, and ending the blame game between, well, this is the Commonwealth's responsibility and this is the state's responsibility. Um, we saw that in the Commonwealth Government's announcement yesterday in respect of TAFE, which is something that's traditionally been in our area, but I think these are, these are uh, ways in which whilst the state and territory governments invest in fee-free apprenticeships and, 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 and take places and look at, look at ways in which we can drive those opportunities, that should be complemented by the Commonwealth Government, and we're seeing that. And we've done the same thing, particularly in childcare in New South Wales in our most recent budget, uh, which is something that we could have said, well, that's really an area of responsibility for the Commonwealth Government. Uh, we've put a $5 billion package uh, together to help drive um, greater childcare, particularly in uh, where we have childcare deserts. That's a benefit for our state because it's going to drive uh, women participation but also economic opportunity for, for, for New South Wales. So these are the areas I think going forward rather than saying that's in the domain of the Commonwealth, this is in the domain of states. If we can work together on driving those investments, that's going to provide greater opportunity uh, and productivity in the future. Thanks, Premier. Really constructive response entirely in keeping with the, the purpose of this summit, um, something that will, a challenge that we can, we can really work with. I might throw now to Abul Rizvi for his contribution from the floor. Thanks, Andrew. From about 2015, Australia experienced, and most people are probably not aware of this, the biggest labour, mark, mark, labour trafficking scam in our history. Manipulating the asylum system to supply easily exploitable migrant labour. As a result, we now have around 100,000 people in the asylum system, the vast majority of whom will be refused protection but will not go home. We have also been expanding low-skill guest worker visas, particularly for farm labour. 
Due to appalling treatment, thousands of Pacific Island farm workers have run away from their employers. Thousands have applied for asylum to maintain their lawful status, but are being refused. This is very similar to the situation in North America and Europe for the past 30 to 40 years, where there are millions of appallingly exploited migrant workers, some on visas, but many now undocumented after unsuccessfully applying for asylum. They live permanently in the shadows of society. In June and July this year, Australia received by far the highest level of offshore student visa applications than for any previous June or July in our history. We are headed towards the biggest surge in offshore student visa applications ever. Students may contribute more to population growth in 2022 than either permanent migration, and that includes the recently announced increase, permanent migration, or even natural increase. That is being driven by the fact that we offer the most generous student visa work rights of any comparable country. In the medium to long term, that could be a disaster for many students who may struggle to secure skilled jobs and a pathway to permanent residence. They will be stuck in immigration limbo, particularly if there's an economic downturn in 2023-24. They too will be vulnerable to exploitation and abuse. The government has said it does not want Australia to become a low-skilled guest worker society. That is a noble ambition, but I'm afraid that train left the station 10 years ago. Like North America and Europe, we are now barrelling towards becoming a fully-fledged low-skilled guest worker society. And like North America and Europe, we have utterly failed to put in place adequate arrangements to protect those workers. For a proud migrant nation, we should be ashamed. We can and should strengthen laws and funding to address exploitation and abuse. But unless we give unions a strong formal role in protecting migrant workers, I can guarantee you, we will fail. That is because only unions have the footprint and the capacity to gain trust of the workers to be able to provide adequate support and protection. Will this summit have the courage to recognise that? I will thank you for that contribution and your expertise in this discussion is just so greatly valued by everyone at the summit and I just want to acknowledge what an amazing migrant story you have yourself and if you haven't heard it before, go and talk to uh, Abul offline. Um, Joe, I just want to invite you to respond. You've done so much work and research in this area. Could you tell us a little bit about your thoughts on this subject? Okay, so I, you know it's a pretty grim uh, statement that Abel's made and I think we do have to acknowledge that we do have a problem with undocumented workers in this country but also that we don't actually have the data really on on their workforce contribution in the National Agricultural Workforce Strategy report. The, the, the last government lost an opportunity to respond while there was closed borders to deal with the recommendation from the Azarius report but I think at, at this point we, we really do need to gather more data and um, I, I've just been been given a, a, a grant by the Australian Research Council to look at undocumented migrants because I think we need to, we, that's a line under the sand, we need to address that issue. The, the, the second point though that I want to make is a bit more hopeful in terms of does Australia have to become, you know, this guest worker country? I think if we look across to New Zealand, at the start of the century, they had very similar problems in the horticulture space. If I just take that industry as an example of the one that I've worked most closely with. You know, they had undocumented migrants, they had multiple visas for pathways into hort. Um, they had a, a, a labour hire problem, they had um, rampant exploitation. And I think what happened is that industry and unions and government got together to create a tripartite governance structure. And this is sorely needed in the Australian space. Um, and and what, that, what that did is it basically created an industry sponsorship model. They, they reformed so that there was just one visa. So there wasn't a race to the bottom between backpackers and Pacific workers and undocumented migrants and ag visa workers all competing for access to jobs. Um, they created one visa. Uh, industry actually led in dobbing in the dodgy, the dodgy farmers because they recognised that if they didn't do that and if they didn't continue to do that to this day, then the social licence for that visa wasn't there. 
they regulated the contractor system. And you know, this tripart go tripartite governance um, structure, when we did a case study on that at my team, what we found is every time industries wanted to increase the cap, on temporary migrants coming into Hort in New Zealand, they've been able to do that through getting union agreement on that issue. And, you know, that's what we actually need, um, industry and unions working together. And a, a fundamental aspect of the New Zealand system that we do have in our PALM program that I think we could roll out more effectively pulling on Ab Abdul's point, is one of worker induction. Within the Pacific scheme, ideally if it's working well, migrant workers come to Australia and they face-to-face -face meet a union representative. They also meet um, other people that can help them as part of an induction process. You know, I think if we're bringing in, you know, and I'm not certain that, that we should be, but if we are bringing in the cooks and the hairdressers, you know, if, we, if we're drilling down to some of these other industries like care, uh, and we're not just talking about tech and um, high skilled health jobs, when we open this up um, to more occupations, we do get workers who are incredibly more vulnerable and we have an obligation as a country to make sure that they don't just get given a piece of paper which says what their rights are, but they actually know that the union is there, that the community organisations are there. Because let's face it, one regulator, just the Fair Work Ombudsman, it, it's not enough for a country of this size and we need to do more in this space. And uh, notwithstanding the red times up thing I'm looking at, can I call on uh, Michael Kane to make uh, one last contribution from the floor to this session? Thanks very much. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. I've got a short two-minute story and a single proposal on behalf of unions, but before I make that, can I just back um, what Joe's just said? There are actually three Azarius reports um, that are before the summit. Uh, they contain a number of transforming practical proposals beyond those mentioned by John yesterday. And we've seen some great new proposals from the summit, but we shouldn't overlook that existing uh, excellent work. Ours is the story of Nora. In 2012, she came to Australia from Nepal on a temporary visa. She'd left her family, including young kids, to earn some money to gain some skills. She took a job as a cleaner in aged care and disability services. For the first four years of a job, she was paid $14 an hour, about 25 per cent less than the award. She started work at seven. She finished at four, seven days a week. No super, no overtime, no penalty rates, no paid leave. She was never paid for a sick day, and she couldn't visit her family. Clearly, she didn't have the leave. She didn't have the funds. The treatment of Nora was individually appalling and collectively destructive in undermining community standards. It's an unfortunate truth that too many workers on temporary visas suffer in this way. But also bear in mind that she is in the care sector where low pay, overwork and lack of job security are already the norm. And that's why workers are leaving the sector in numbers at the same time as demand for those services is exploding, as we heard yesterday. But going back to treating temporary migrant workers like Nora was treated, that's not the answer to that demand. The solution has to be to make the care economy a great place to work, secure jobs, better pay, proper investment in skills and career development. That said, skilled migration could play an interim role in meeting that demand. But, but to do this properly, we are proposing an end to employer sponsorship of visa workers. It's a recipe for exploitation when an employer can control you and your paycheck because it effectively controls your passport. Instead, we're putting forward the idea of industry sponsorship. Here, visa workers would be free to move between employers across a particular industry. Where Jobs and Skills Australia, not a single employer, had identified a genuine skills shortage. Where Jobs and Skills Australia, not a single employer, had determined workers resident in Australia didn't yet have the skills to fill that gap. After all, shortages exist across industries and regions, not just for a particular employer. Now, we acknowledge the detail will have to be worked through, but the principle is a compelling one. Giving a worker like Nora the power to leave an exploitative employer without threatening her right to stay in this great country.
Michael, thank you for that contribution. We're very grateful, and I'm going to get Andrew to respond to some of the subjects that you just raised there. So um, let me talk about what's come out of the discussion. Um, there are four areas where we can move forward immediately as a government, and I'll explain what they are. First, we talked about an increase to the permanent skilled migration program for 22-23, a lift to 195,000 permanent skilled migrants. Second, Andrew talked about a significant new investment in increasing the speed of visa processing. The third area where we can move forward is a proposal which will allow graduates of Australian universities to work in Australia for longer so our economy can get the benefit of bachelors and masters and doctorate students that have finished their studies here for a period of time. Um, the fourth uh, area where we can move forward is um, we've talked a lot about temporary versus permanent and we, we lifted some restrictions during COVID to allow temporary workers to work for longer. Um, the government will, on the basis of the discussion, agree that we are going to extend this um, lifting of the restrictions until June 2023. So um, this was a very important initiative during COVID. We need it to continue while the skills crisis is so uh, acute, but we also need it to end because this is not what our education system is about. June 2023 feels with the discussion that we've had like the right time. So four concrete changes the government will move ahead with immediately. And now Andrew will talk about some areas where we've heard consensus for further work. Yeah, thanks, Claire. Four immediate changes and six uh, pieces of uh, homework or, or matters of, of, of further work arising from the discussions in the lead up to the summit, but also from the conversation we've just had. Firstly, ensuring that our focus on permanency becomes a reality, identifying the pathways and carving them out. Looking to uh, assessing the skilled migration list, the skilled migration occupation list, to get them fit for purpose now and into the future. I think there is a consensus that we need to raise the TISMET. We have to do that after broad engagement. We saw a very constructive discussion today that I think is the basis for that work again becoming a reality. It's vital that we address an effective package of work to address migrant worker exploitation, a theme that's come consistently today and in the lead up. That must happen soon and will happen next year. We need to also examine, um, picking up on Michael's point at the end, but also uh, Joanna's contribution, the question of industry sponsorship. There's work to be done there, really, really important work to be done there. And finally, there is further work to be done by government, governments, industry and unions to address regional labour shortages and to engage with the issues that small business have raised across the summit about access to skilled migration system. So we'll, we'll wrap the panel up there. Um, I just want to finish by picking up a quick point. Joe, you talked about the need for change in this area to be bipartisan if it is to last, and that's really something I'll take away from this conversation. The point of this summit is about finding those areas of consensus, and I heard a huge amount of it today. So we've got a big agenda for the next 18 months on this subject, and I want to thank these three brilliant people for helping us explore it. Thank you um, to both ministers um, and to the panellists, Annie, Joe and Andrew. And I note the um, news in that panel and the increase in the migra migration cap to 195,000 this financial year. Um, a migration system for Australia's future will be facilitated by Brian Schmidt, the Vice Chancellor of the Australian National University. On the panel is Scott Farquhar, Chief Executive Officer of Atlassian, Mina Radhak, Rak, Radhak, Radhak Rishnan, I apologise Mina, co-founder of Different, Daniel Walton, the National Secretary of the Australian Workers' Union and the Minister, Claire O'Neill. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Helen, and thank you all for the previous discussion and the great engagement that we had in that session. Um, there is a lot of consensus in the area of migration and our government's intent is to capture this and to really push this conversation forward. 
The second migration uh, session this morning is really about opening this subject up to the big picture, and I've been given this amazing opportunity to just briefly set the scene for that conversation. So let me start by saying this. Over the last century, our country has never done anything big or conquered any opportunity that really mattered without inviting people from around the world to come in and help us do it. And when our immigration system has worked, when it has been that special source in the task facing the nation, it's been because it, it was a system that met Australia's needs in that moment. Think about the Second World War, the populate or perish. That program set the foundation for national reconstruction. It formed the basis of the union movement for that period in our history, and it provided the cornerstone of national security after the Second World War. Think of the transition to multiculturalism in the 1970s, when Gough Whitlam buried the White Australia policy. The migration program that came out of that led to the creation of extraordinary, vibrant, entrepreneurial communities that helped power our country's economy and society over the decades that followed, like the amazing Cambodian and Vietnamese communities that make my home in southeast Melbourne pulse with life. But for the last decade, our immigration program has been on continental drift. It has no strategy. We make it easy for temporary migrants to come here, but very hard for highly skilled permanent migrants. We've got the whole thing backwards. The system is expensive. It's bureaucratic. It takes an eternity to get anything done. There is no proper feedback between the migration and the training systems so that areas of skills shortage come onto that shortage list and they never come off again. What a missed opportunity for the young people around this country. Australia's migration system is not serving our needs, and I think we should change it. Because the 30 years that uh, we face as we look ahead looks very different from the 30 years that we have just lived through. What does it look like? Well, we talked about it yesterday. We need to make a big shift to a lower carbon economy. We don't have the skills in the country today that we need to do it. We need to break out of this period of stagnated productivity. That means uh, shaking things up with a faster uptake of technology across the economy, but the people we need to help us, they're not here at the moment. Our population is rapidly ageing. We don't have the workforce we need to care for our elderly, nor the people to pay for that care. Our region is becoming more tense and less stable. We need sovereign capabilities in cybersecurity, in the technology that will support our submarine defence program. Immigration is not the complete answer to any of these problems, but it is the part answer to all of them. Immigration is one of the biggest levers we have to drive our country forward, and it's fast and it's powerful, so I want us to pull it. Now, this is not a discussion about a bigger Australia. It's not about big increases to the migration numbers. In fact, it doesn't have to mean an increase at all. This is about thinking about our migration program as we should. How can we use migration to build our nation for what the decades ahead will throw at us? Now, in order to build a migration system for the future, we are all going to have to make a big shift in our thinking. And that shift is moving away from a system which is almost entirely focused on how we keep people out to one that recognises that we are in a global war for talent. For the first time in our history, Australia is not the destination of choice for many of our skilled migrants. Those best and brightest minds who are on the move around the world, they are looking to live in countries like Canada, like Germany, like the UK, and those countries are rolling out a red carpet to welcome them in. So what does our migration system look like for potential migrants? The program is fiendishly complex. There are more than 70 different visa categories, each with their own criteria, their own set of subcategories and subcriteria. There are hundreds of labour agreements and multiple skilled occupation lists, and we've got an outdated visa processing system that is anything but fit for purpose. So people who may actually want to live here can spend years filling out forms at incredible expense and then only be allowed to stay for a short while. 
for the workers that do make it here, there's no guarantee that they will be looked after. And in the previous session, we heard some real life examples of a serious problem that we have with worker exploitation, and that's got to be addressed. It's time for a dose of humility and a reassessment of our national self-image. Now, we're all here today because we want to put a line under a decade where we just did not move our country forward. And if we want to go back to being that smart, bold, clever country that thinks strategically about who it invites to become Australians and helps them build a life here, we are going to have to roll up our sleeves and get in the global game for talent. We've got to get into the fray. Unless we do that, we will not be able to sustain the years of seemingly endless growth that we have all become used to. Because those days of easy dividends, they are behind us. We are all going to have to work so much harder to give our children the great gift of prosperity. So where are the big opportunities? Let me share some of my ideas. A migration program with a strategy, one that's designed to help us thrive in the coming decades and to grow jobs for all Australians. A simple, fast program that's easy for businesses, big and small, and for migrants to use. A system where our training and migration systems are seamlessly connected so that skill shortages feed right back into the career advice that we are giving to young people in this country. A process where workers get protected and valued and one that unlocks the potential of all migrants, including refugees and the many men and women who come here as partner or secondary visa holders and one that helps us prepare for the big challenges we face, climate change, technological shifts, our ageing population, and the need to think about sovereign capabilities, in particular in my portfolio responsibility of cyber security. In the coming weeks, the Albanese government will ask three eminent Australians, supported by a team of brilliant thinkers, to consider how we can rebuild our immigration system in Australia's national interest. And I want to come now to our panel and to the discussion with you in the room, because now it's over to you. We have a genuine chance to talk about this, and we have four brilliant people here right on the stage to discuss some of the ways in which this program can be, uh, can be made so much better. So to our panel, to our delegates here, the eminent Australians who will review this system, they will do so on the basis of the conversation we have in the room right now. Tell us what you think the immigration of the system of the future looks like, and we will use this discussion to build the terms of reference for their work. So thank you, everyone, and it's my great pleasure to hand over to Professor Brian Schmidt, a Nobel Prize winner and someone who we are very, very lucky decided to make Australia their home. Thank you, Minister uh, O'Neill. I'd like to acknowledge that we are today meeting on the lands of the Ngunnawal Nambri people who for uh, more than a thousand generations have met here and it is a privilege to be able to meet here today and discuss such weighty issues. So 29 years ago, me as an American and my wife as an Australian graduated with PhDs from Harvard uh, and our goal in life was to find a place where we could live, happily raise a family, presumably living in the same place and pursue our respective careers of astronomy and economics. In the end, it was the ability to get a high quality job and being able to reliably get living and working rights for both of us that made the decision for us to move to Australia. It was our choice over the United States, Canada, the UK and Europe because it was the best place for us. As Vice Chancellor of the Australian National University, ANU, I need to recruit the best and brightest from around the world the low friction environment I experienced is sadly no longer experienced by most of our incoming staff. For example, a few months ago, the average wait time for us to get a staff member a visa after we have offered them a job for, for example, India was 21 months. And that was typically for a three year job. Mine took four days. Needless to say, we lost most of those staff to places overseas. The people we lost were skilled in areas of national importance, in quantum physics, in cyber, in security studies, in biomedical, computer science, just to name a few. It makes a huge difference if you want to attract top talent. These people have global options. So 
I want to now come to our panel and uh, we're going to go through them and uh, one in time just to get a, a sense from their perspective. We're going to start with our own homegrown Scott Farquhar who with Mike Cannon Brooks created the Australian based Atlassian, a collaboration software company that is now the fifth largest market cap in Australia. He's also interestingly co-founder of Skip Capital that backed Canva, the other huge Australian software success. So Scott, how does Atlassian rely on skilled migrants and immigration to do this amazing business you've created? Yeah, th thanks for inviting me. Um, I think it's interesting uh, in terms of the skilled migration. It seems very different from a lot of the uh, issues we have with exploitation and uh, you know, regional workers and people working in horticulture. And I think it requires a little bit of a reset about our psyche as a nation because it's no longer a zero-sum game in Australia. If you think about, you know, it used to be that Foxtel was competing with free-to-air TV and they were competing with Optus t Television and it was a very much a zero-sum game. Today, they're competing with Netflix, Disney+, Plus, Hulu, and this is happening in every single industry that Australia used to have a very nice oligopoly uh, market conditions in. And I think we've got to separate our visa system and how we think about talent into areas that are domestic and are a zero-sum game, and that might be nurses and hairdressers and other areas where you know, it really is a domestic market, and areas of high technology which allow us to overcome the tyranny of distance that's plagued, at last, uh, plagued Australia since uh, the Federation and well before. And in those high-skilled jobs and those high-skilled areas, we really are playing on a global stage. And when we say we have a skills shortage, if you have a skills shortage of nurses, like that's one thing, if I have a skill shortage of technology people, those jobs go overseas. Those careers, those industries, that export dollars just migrate to somewhere else uh, around the world. And so for us, the choice is, do we put those technology jobs in Australia or do we put those technology jobs in another location somewhere around the world? And we still have a great opportunity in Australia to migrate the best and brightest from around the world who still want to come here and build amazing export uh, d businesses and those dollars come back to enrich uh, Australia. Over the next 12 months, we're going to hire about 1,032 Australians into R&D jobs. Uh, we hope to hire them all around Australia because uh, we allow people to work from anywhere, so that's regional areas from, uh, you know, and as well as capital cities. But again, if we can't find those jobs here, they will go overseas uh, to other locations. And when we think about our our visa system, it should reflect that. We should be falling over ourselves to bring the best and brightest over from overseas to come build our export markets here. Thank you, Scott. And I think you make a, a really important point about uh, the, the, the change of how the market has evolved for skilled workers being able to go anywhere, yet we still have the domestic things, and, and they really are uh, two sides of a, of a coin. Uh, next up, we have uh, Mita Radnakrishnan, who is a co-founder of a young uh, SME here, Different Technologies, that works to bring tech to property management. She came, and very exemplary of people like herself, came to Australia via the US, Canada, and Zambia. So, Mina, as an SME, what gaps do you see which immigration can help based, I guess, on your experience of a bunch of different systems overseas? Yeah, I think as the co-founder of a tech startup, I have similar needs as Scott, but a very different impact when that comes. So when Scott can't find a software engineer, he'll hire a software engineer in the US. When I can't find a software engineer, my business is going to fail because I need to bring that person on board. And so I think um, the really important part of it when I think about skilled migration and um, why, it, why it matters so much for, for us is just the ability for us to bring together skilled migration and also job creation in Australia. They're not, they're very complementary. Um, you know, in one of the sessions earlier today, a constant theme that came up was around learning, training, teaching, support, and that is incredibly important. And I guess the question I, I really want to ask here, and I, I think the answer will be obvious to everyone, is does the need for training, teaching, and support go away when you leave school and go into a professional career? It doesn't. We all know that. Who provides that? That's managers. You know, I think there's a very common saying that um, people don't leave jobs, they leave managers, right? And, and that is so true because it is the sport and the people who are around you who help enable you to get to that next level of your career. And as much as we need, um, our goal with the, with the TCA and um, this agreement also that I think we struck with the ACTU is to get 1.2 million tech jobs by 2030. 
We need 650,000 more people to do that over the next eight years. We, we just we can't do that in Australia. It's not possible. Even if we could, who's going to manage them? Who's going to supervise them? Who's going to create a great experience for them so that they not only come to tech, stay in high-skilled, high-paid, secure jobs, but stay there, that they continue to be in that. And that's why I think we need people who are going to come and do that. Technology in Australia is a growing but nascent sector. And so we need to find people, I think, who have that experience from other parts of the world, bring them here, make Australia the place for them to be, help them take in all of these people who are getting rescaled, getting retrained, coming into tech jobs, and actually enable them to keep growing and building that next level. Thank you, Mina, and I think it's interesting to see that some of the things you're facing as an SME are a little different than what Aslassian uh, faces. You don't have a global workforce to kind of move things in and out, so you have these different constraints, but the ecosystem of, of talent and capability is going to be really important to support in the long term uh, of our migration system. Now, this is overlaid, of course, with a whole other set of needs within uh, the economy. And so Daniel Walton is National Secretary of the Australian Workers Union, Vice President of the Australian Council of Trade Unions. So Daniel, as a union leader, uh, how do you see these high-tech needs linking in um, to the areas that, for example, your union uh, represents? Thanks very much. And uh, I'd also like to start off by acknowledging the traditional owners and the land in which we meet. Um, certainly, uh, most of our members don't operate in around the technology space, and I don't think many of them would find themselves working at Atlassian um, anytime soon, but I think it's certainly uh, a growing part of our economy. I think it's important just to have a look and pause the conversation that we have around migration at the moment. The main aim of migration was to try and bring over super skilled workers to create enormous value for our country in roles that could not otherwise be filled by Australians. Now, we fundamentally have lost our way on that proposition, and what we find at the moment is uh, more and more temporary migration being used as a way to paper over the gaps of actually training and developing locals to be able to undertake those roles. And as you mentioned before, if you look at migration, the other side of the coin, as you mentioned, is skills. And unfortunately, we've got this perverse incentive where in some skills and occupations, it is cheaper, cheaper and easier to bring over a worker on a temporary basis than it is to train and develop a worker. So we have to go back to our origins. We have to go back to identify the purpose of our migration systems. That is, that they are more permanent in nature, that they are for highly skilled roles, but also that there is an absolute requirement for business to train and develop people to be ready for those jobs of the future. I think if we just close our mind to that and simply look to cast a net around the world we will continue to have this constant cycle with this demand for roles that aren't being filled whilst we're not providing any training for their future. And I think the point that was raised before, I think Claire O'Neill might have mentioned it, it's incredibly different the environment we operate in now. We, as a country, like to assume that everyone wants to come to Australia, that we are a great place that will attract the best labour from around the world, but that has changed. We are in a very tight international market competing with workers from around the world and unfortunately our record of treating migrant workers who come here is not a great one. And many business leaders in this room will attest that some of the experiences that have happened make it difficult to attract people to our country. So I think if we want to have a look in terms of fixing the problems, we need to realise we've got to clean up the system if we're going to start identifying how we attract the best most talented people to come and work into our country, but not at the expense of local jobs and local wages and local conditions of workers. Thank you, uh, Daniel. So, taking from your point is that it's not all high tech, which is maybe a simpler place to fix than most, but we do have some foundational things we need to think about that underpin the future of migration. And I take that uh, having a plan of training and skills development of Australians has to be there to try to, uh, I, I guess, minimize the need to rely on immigration in those areas. I take that as one thing. And two, there has to be an, what I will describe as an ethical overlay about how we do treat the people who come here. 
So I think those are maybe two parts that I'm getting from there that I don't think will be controversial that should uh, overlay any uh, uh, future look at the long-term migration. So what we've heard here from uh, our two tech uh, uh, entrepreneurs is there are opportunities though to drive uh, highly productive industries in Australia uh, but there's also some overlays that you have, Minister, around sovereign capability. And those things are at somewhat at odds as, you know, between being, uh, as Scott described, as a zero-sum game uh, because, you know, if you have a sovereign capability, you kind of are trying to do it for the low po lowest possible cost, presumably, uh, versus these export industries that go out. And I guess it would be interesting to get your sense of the constraints you see on sovereign capability uh, with respect to migration. I note that a lot of things that are sovereign, uh, our students, for example, are not even allowed to uh, apply for because they have to be Australian jobs, even though we have skill shortages in those areas. Thank you. Um, one of my other portfolios is, resp is uh, responsibility for cyber security. So this is a very key issue in my everyday work. I think we are making a big shift in thinking post-COVID. Um, we had um, move to a kind of way of thinking about the globe where everything's optimised within an inch of its life and COVID really showed us that that sort of system's got real issues. Um, we need to think about how we're going to you know, survive as a country if supply chains get shut off and these things that really would never have been contemplated 30 or 40 years ago. So this is very much a part, a part of my work. And I just make the point um, with sovereign capabilities this hasn't been thought about as part of our migration program before. And what I want us to um, really think about as a room is what challenges lie in our future and how we can use the immigration system to meet those challenges. The sovereign capabilities point is important because we cannot grow the skills that we need, for example, in cyber. We can at that entry level and we will do a lot, I think, as a government about that problem. But one of the biggest gaps is for people who have got, you know, 15 to 18 years of experience in tech. We can't make that happen in a year. We are going to need to find a way to make these um, positions really attractive and some of the ideas that Scott and Mina have put forward I think are really important. So really this sovereign capabilities discussion is big because it's a, it demonstrates the shift in thinking we've got to make towards a much more strategic program. Thank you. So, Scott, uh, you as a global company that's operating across many jurisdictions are going to have to come, you're going to come across that sovereign capability overlay and how it affects what is generally a global business that's trying to, to optimize globally. So, how does that affect uh, your operations? When we look at where we put stuff globally, there's definitely a geopolitical overlay that didn't used to be there. And, you know, we don't have defence, so we don't have to put things, you know, in a specific country. But when we look at talent markets around the world, uh, where we want to put stuff, it's no longer just where do we get the best you know, availability of talent and the best cost of talent and the time zone that, you know, interacts with our existing uh, teams. There is a geopolitical overlay. You want to make sure that, okay, in five years' time, is that going to be a country that we're going to be friendly with? Uh, and uh, I think that also plays to Australia's strengths as well, though now, because it now opens up, you know, perhaps we're not the cheapest, uh, you know, lowest cost labour uh, place in the world, but for many of our allies, uh, we are a very friendly place to put uh, labour, and, uh, and so there's opportunities there as this geopolitical landscape shifts. Great. Mina, uh, so you have operated in two of our uh, close allies, the US and Canada, and I guess it's uh, do you have any reflections about how you find operating in Australia compared to those places and how it again feeds into immigration? And so a little bit of compare and contrast would I think be useful. Mm, yeah, I think for me this experience is really personal. You know, I've been, been an immigrant, it feels like three times over. My family's from India, from India originally. We moved to Zambia where, where I was born. We emigrated to Canada, came to the United States for university, I emigrated to Australia. So I've really been through this. I know what it feels like. Um, and when I, I think about the comparison around it, I think one of the things we shouldn't forget about immigration and high-skilled, high-paid workers, it's not, it's not some abstract notion, right? It's people at the end of the day. That's what it all comes back to. And um, 
And when it comes to people, like the best way to get the most out of people, is, which is what I think every country needs to be able to improve, is to make them feel like they belong, like they have a place where they're home. And I felt that in Canada. I remember coming there for the first time and feeling welcomed, you know? And I think that that's the kind of environment that we want to try and create, like here in Australia. Again. And just simple things like, how hard it is to fill out forms to come to a place to be there. The fact that it takes three months, like I came here on a marital visa, my husband's Australian. Um, and I remember like sitting there filling out these forms trying to prove that our marriage was real. I'm like, how do we prove that our marriage is real? Um, went to Facebook and took pictures of like screenshots so I could be like, look, they're real people at the wedding, they came, this was, this was something there. Um, that, that's a, uh, I, I welcome these, these, these things that we've introduced, right? Like more, more visas, faster processing times, 10-day processing times, ensuring it. And I think that that's a, that's a critical path to it. But for me, as I think about from these different places, what has made me feel welcome is that they want me to be here. They're willing to roll out the red carpet, make it easy for me to come, make those steps simple. And another, I think, big thing is that they recognize worth and value. So, for example, I think a really concrete thing is the list of skills that we have is not necessarily matched up with the list of needs that we have. I, I have a computer science degree. I'm originally a software engineer. You don't want me near production code anymore. I, I am now, I, I would consider myself in the world of product management. Product management, what is this job? It doesn't exist as a job. If I was to come here as a permanent resident, I actually wouldn't have a pathway to permanent residency. So I wouldn't be able to come to this country, start a business, create 100 jobs, and become a permanent resident of Australia. And so I think that these are, these are really important things to consider, right? As we compare and contrast what we can learn from other places, it's make people feel, feel welcome, um, decrease processing times, um, create more pathways for permanent residency, make people feel like they want to be here. Because don't forget, it's, it's not just your job. You, you come here, you raise family. I have two young kids here. I think my son has this Australia cricketing gear already. Um, you know, we, we belong here. And I think that that's a really important part of what we we do and, and I am of course speaking from the perspective of high skilled high paid you know secure jobs right that's a, that may be different it's not a one-size-fits-all thing but I can definitely speak to my experience in this place so I think I think you've highlighted uh, you know one of the things that has changed and I think uh, Joanna in the previous session highlighted is that you know uh, there's not a lot of rorting and the really high uh, you know, highly remunerated uh, positions that, for example, the three of us are, are doing. Uh, and I think having a high income threshold uh, as being mooted, at least within these areas, is actually quite nice if we get quick agility uh, to hire people. I, I think that's something that works uh, across and doesn't really cause you any problems either. Uh, is, is, that, is that a fair assessment? Um, well, I think so. I think so. The part that's been touched on a little bit is the labour market testing. Um, and you've asked pretty much everyone in the room, you know, it's an absolute joke. It just doesn't necessarily exist, doesn't keep up with the times. And if there is a change and Jobs and Skills Australia have got a more active role in processing that, then that would make a big difference. Um, and obviously reviewing the types of, therefore, the types of roles that we need. The other big part that's missing in this conversation, everyone's talking about we need to process the backlog. Well, how are you going to do it without increasing the number of public servants to be able to undertake that work? I know Jim said yesterday, don't throw up any suggestions that are going to cost money, but I'm sorry, mate. Um, uh, for our friends in the public service here, like, there is a massive backlog and there's enormous pressure on them to be able to catch up and process. So any decision taken by government has to recognise the fact that we do need to get through an enormous volume of work, and that takes people. Yes, it does mean also improving technology and processes to make that faster, but you're not going to do it without the people there with the capabilities to help. Certainly, Jim, no argument from me on uh, extra visa processing uh, staff, uh, also for Claire. So, I mean, I think that what you're, you're hearing here is uh, sort of an agreement that, uh, at least for part of the work, the very high-skilled uh, workforce, that is what I would describe as that global part, the ones who can go anywhere, we maybe need to think a little bit about how we can do that really quickly in something that doesn't involve uh, a 21-month processing uh, uh, time. Uh, we also talked a bit about, uh, Daniel, the, the need to fill skills gaps here. Now, what, one, what, let's go into your area. Uh, 
I, I mean, I run an ag tech uh, uh, group to, to create new, hopefully, ag tech companies that involve a bunch of people with PhDs, but they're going to be, uh, create, you know, thousands of jobs if they're successful. And so how would you want to work with, uh, for example, Scott and Mina to educate people in these tech sectors as they develop? Because we don't only uh, uh, hire, actually, the average person working in all these companies is going to be someone who is an average Australian. Um, well, I think it's a good question. I think there's a few parts to it. The first is uh, for a lot of our members and that of a number of unions that are here who work in particularly manufacturing, we've been used to working alongside automation and advancements in the way that they operate and technology has been a driver of that for decades. So it's not a new concept to have to learn and, what, uh, and adjust their practices. And our members are obviously more used, so users of tech than they are creators of tech. And so there's a differential um, that exists between those. Um, but for them, I, I think there's two parts. There is a responsibility, and maybe we've got a slight point of difference to what was said before. I think there is a responsibility here for business that if you are taking on migrant workers, that you also have a, a role to make sure that you are training people to undertake those roles. I know Scott spoke about this uh, last week, uh, I think it was, that you know, there's a lot of businesses that aren't doing that at the moment and should be, and if it's not possible, then contribution should be made so that there is funding in place so that we are training people. Um, Steve Murphy, I think, eloquently placed yesterday the story about the transition that's likely to take place across the economy. Well, we need to have money there available to train workers to be able to undertake those roles of the future. And where we do have gaps, then we look abroad to fill them, but fill them on a more permanent basis. And I think I largely agree with almost entirely what Joanna Howe said, maybe except for the point of Adelaide being the best city in the country. So, sorry, Peter, I find myself strangely align, aligning to Premier Perrottet on that one, I would imagine. But um, like that is the story of old. And so many of you in this room came here for back of a more permanent migration system where your families could get here and set up roots and call Australia home. That doesn't exist anymore. And so I think we need to fix that and if we do, we'll go a long way to solving some of our problems of attracting good people. I just want to add to that. Um, so people in this room may not be aware, uh, there is a uh, Skilling Australia fund that uh, when you bring a migrant in, you have to pay into. And for a four-year four -year visa, that's about $7,200 you, you pay into that. And uh, I don't know where that fund goes to, but I would really love it to go to Skilling Australians, um, and uh, particularly where uh, you know, we're missing people in the technology industry because they're bringing them in, we would love to then, you know, that money go back into training people in the technology industry. So um, it, that'll be one point. Uh, the second point of that po uh, path to permanent residency, it's great if you're a 25-year-old backpacker and you come here on a two-year visa that has no path to living here permanently. That's great, you come here and you, you do your work and you move on. The high-skilled jobs that we're looking for, people with PhDs, people that we can't train locally in the time we need because they have 20 years of experience, they have husbands and children, and uh, they're not going to uproot their life and move around the world uh, to another country and be told that there is no path to permanent residency here. That is a non-starter for those people. And so I don't know where the idea came that that was a, a, great, a, a great idea to have visas in that category, but it's an abject fail uh, for getting those high-skilled people that we need. Indeed. So, Minister, you talked a bit about driving uh, I would guess uh, productivity, what I would describe as prosperity, is being sort of underpinning part of one of the things you want to uh, achieve. So there is, I guess, the principle of whether or not we do things sort of bottom up, and we have two entrepreneurs here who have sort of invented their uh, companies uh, from a bottom up. Uh, but one would think that if you're going to try to get the most out of it, you're going to want to link the, uh, the productivity mission to what I would describe as uh, an industry policy, but not your area. But how would you go about trying to link those things up so we could actually design a system that gets the most out of what is possible here? Thanks, Brian. We do need to, um, we do need to think about this question because if we're going to um, reform this system to help us tackle those challenges, some of them are big national problems that the government's inherently involved in solving. Um, the sovereign capabilities point, the future made in Australia, these are important national priorities for Australia and, it's, um, and the Australian government. So we do need to shift our thinking about that. Um, 
I, I really um, don't think we can um, overstate the importance of Jobs and Skills Australia. I know it's so boring for everyone when a new part of bureaucracy is created and it, and it doesn't perhaps sound like such a big deal. It is a huge deal. We have never had in this country a national body that is properly resourced and equipped to answer basic questions like what is the actual skills shortage shape and size in our country. And it is a big part of why we've never had an immigration system which has any sense of a long-term lens. So I think one of the really important things we did, Brendan O'Connor talked about it before, is create this body. It is going to drive a huge change, I think, in how the migration system and the skills system speak to one another. And it's going to help us provide a genuine fact base for a lot of these difficult questions in the migration system, such as what an actual skills shortage is. Thank you. So one of the uh, things that your uh, review is, is trying to look at is an optimization for Australia long term. Uh, what is the, I mean, I guess you, you talked around the jobs and skills side of that. We also have demographic issues in this mm -hmm. country. And uh, as we say, not everyone is going to be uh, a rocket scientist coming in here. Uh, and even I think there's going to have too many rocket scientists. <laughs> so you, but, but so, so you have this overlay of skills and driving productivity, but we also have the issue of having demography. If you yep. don't actually make sure it adds up over 30, 40 years, then you can end up with demographic bumps that leave the country in a lurch. So, I mean, I guess, uh, is there an appetite uh, for there to be a long-term body, bipartisan input, to make these sort of 10 to 20 year calls that have to happen, rather than the, uh, I would say, kind of ad hoc mm -hmm. new visa classes. Yeah. You said we have 70 visa classes. There's no way to optimize a system with 70 visa classes. Yeah. It's just going to be chaos. Yeah. So absolutely, very much appetite for that. And the whole point of this is the lack of strategy in this program. And a big part of the lack of strategy is the fact that it's driven too much bottom up, I think, and there isn't enough thinking about what we actually want to do here. And I just, you know, I think Dan made a really good point earlier. Let's just get back to basics here. Why do we bring people to Australia to help us? Because the system that we've created doesn't meet any of the objectives that I think anyone in this room would, would answer that question with. So I think there's huge appetite to have that conversation and it should certainly form part of the review. And so uh, you would say the possibility of having this review try to create what I would describe as a precision system where you take migration around skills, the demographic issues, humanitarian issues, getting to, for example, those principles of prosperity for Australians, an ethical overlay that we treat everyone well and make sure that everyone is sort of better off by the migration system. That is something you think you would have after. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know if I'd describe it as a precision system because that, uh, that makes me think of complication. And one of the issues is that we've tried to solve every problem in the labour market by adding a new visa and that's left us where we are today, which is this totally unwieldy beast that's not working for the country. I think if I can say one of the big challenges here is how do we get Atlassian workers in for you and your business, Scott, and they will do so much for our economy. And how do we create a system that also allows us to bring in, for example, aged care workers that the country desperately needs and make sure that they're protected in their role and valued and loved and welcomed and given that pathway to permanency that we all want them to have. This is the difficulty. We need workers right up here and we need workers who are perhaps never going to earn the Atlassian salary. Um, we've got to create a system that's simpler for both groups and that protects both groups. All right, thank you. So uh, I think it's time to go to the floor and ask, uh, I have a few comments. And so I think we first up have uh, uh, David Littleproud uh, uh, to have the floor. Thank you, the Prime Minister, just helping me there. Uh, and firstly, can I just say <laughs> a thank you to, to the Prime Minister and Treasurer for inviting us to this summit. Um, I'm genuinely here to be constructive. Uh, to, to try and help, uh, particularly for regional Australians. The challenges that we face are real and they are unique and we want to be part of those solutions in a constructive way. Uh, and those numbers are real, as the NFF and COSBOA articulated this morning. Just to get food from a farmer's paddock to your plate, we're about 172,000 workers short. And I welcome the federal government's continued support of the Pacific schemes. Uh, they are important, but they can't do it all. 
And so we have to be pragmatic about how we achieve that uh, because I saw firsthand the human toll of this only last week in Western Australia in Carnarvon. Uh, there was a farmer that walked away from his property. He was born on it. He simply didn't have the confidence to plant a crop and, and to be able to harvest it. Uh, because there was no people. He didn't have the investment confidence there. And those, those farmers that are there are really only planting 50, 60 per cent of their capacity. So you're not just going to have a cost of living crisis. You're going to have a food security crisis unless we face this together and be pragmatic about this. And it's not just in the agricultural sector in regional areas. It's also in many of the skills, pubs, mechanics. We need a whole range of it. I've got pubs even in my own electorate of Bar Calden, uh, the hometown of the Labor Party where the pubs aren't open for, for a feed at night. They simply can't get cooks. Uh, these are the challenges we're facing. They're far more acute in regional Australia. And that's why I'm here wanting to be part of this solution. And, and while we put the Ag visa, and there's many that have said that it's solely focused at horticulture, it's not. It's more broadly than that. It was to go right through that supply chain from the paddock to the plate. And we need to understand how we're going to fill those 120,000 jobs Otherwise, we're all going to pay for it. And I think there are pragmatic ways. And the ag visa, let me say from what I've heard today, and a regional skills visa, we're on the same unity ticket on a pathway to permanent residency. I want to see the next generation of migrants come to regional Australia, not pass through. I, I, we've had enough of people just coming, picking crops, or being part of the processing sector and just coming and going. We want them to live in regional Australia. We actually want them. That's where we've been built, built so strongly on, has been because of migration. And we think if you, you allow them, and we think there's been moves by the Fair Work Commission that's making sure that we have that, that minimum page, but it also, it also gets rid of the exploitation if they're invested in those communities. Because you know what? In small regional communities, they're going to look after their mob. And if someone gets done over, I can tell you the whole town's going to make sure they get looked after. That's how we operate, and that's the trust. But there are mechanisms that we continue to need to work on, and I'm pragmatic about that. But don't constrain us with that. And I think this is a real opportunity in terms of the migration piece, in understanding that the, the challenges particularly, and I think we should all acknowledge, for Western Australians, this is far more acute. Uh, there's a lot of East Coast politicians here, but we've got to understand Western Australia is feeling this bigger and, and worse than anyone else, and we've got to appreciate and understand that. But well, there are pragmatic ways that we can do this together in doing that. But can I also say migration, I don't want to just sit here and think that we're here just for migration. I think it is important. We want to invest in Australians, and we strongly believe in allowing pensioners, veterans, but also those that are on disability pensions to have a crack, to work a bit, to work a bit more, to be able to be part of this solution as well, and investing in our young people. Incentivising, I'm sorry, Jim, I'm going to spend a little bit of your money here. We started a program around paying the hex uh, debts of graduates, of, of doctors and nurse practitioners to come and work in the bush and we'd pay their hex debts. Well, we should look at that, where there's skill shortages, not only in doctors, registered nurses that can go into our aged care facilities, pharmacists. Be pragmatic around that in trying to incentivise our young people, but also invest in our young people. The regional university centres, let me tell you, this is a great initiative that means that kids don't have to go to big regional centres or capital cities to get a university degree. There's a little lady in Dirrambandi, she went to school in Dirrambandi, a town of 800 people, finished off year 12 in St George. 320 kilometre round trip every afternoon to do year 11 and 12. She was flipping burgers at the local servo, wanted to do something more. We put in a regional university centre. She's now studying nursing and working part time at the Dirrambandi Hospital. That's what the empowerment of regional kids and being able to give them the opportunity to learn at home and be part of our community is so important. So, can I say we'll be part of the solution? And the other big piece I just wanted to touch on that wasn't touched on yesterday around childcare. I, I welcome and I understand the pressures of the budget around bringing forward childcare, but just appreciate that in regional areas, it's not necessarily just about affordability, it's actually about availability. There are women that can't go, get back into the workforce because there is no childcare places at all. And I think if we're going to spend money, let's not just tackle the affordability, let's actually ch tackle the availability. Don't discriminate against anybody because I think if we do this together, we can solve this together. And regional Australia, let me tell you, will be part of that solution. Thanks for having me. So, uh, thank you, David. Uh, Daniel, anything you just want to add, given uh, it sounds like uh, there's actually a fair bit of agreement there? I'll be 
cautious in the spirit of collaboration not to say too much on this other than um, obviously I think a large part, I think the NT Chief Minister talked about yesterday if you're going to find solutions for training and education it should be for all parts of Australia, particularly regional Australia and I think that's a good point, one that um, strangely we probably have alignment on with uh, David Littleproud. I think there is, uh, with a big focus on TAFE, there's enormous opportunities to skill up as young Australians where despite the, you know, the low unemployment rate around the rest of the country, in regional centres is still incredibly high for young workers. And so I think that is a, a big place where we could get enormous productivity uplift for the whole country if we can get young Australians trained in regional centres to get into the workforce. Great, thank you. So our next question is from Zali Stegel. Thank you. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge traditional owners of country and welcome the opportunity for them to have a voice to parliament, hopefully, in this term of government. And I'd also like to acknowledge my crossbench colleague, Carly Teek, whose spot I'm actually in today because she's ill, and my colleague, Dai Lee, on the crossbench, because we represent communities and we are frustrated that there's high unemployment in a community like Dai's, and yet in my community I have businesses crying out for more uh, staff and skilled labour. So there's clearly a disconnect and it's great to have a conversation to talk about how to fix it in the big picture, but there is that immediate urgent need. And we need to talk housing and infrastructure if we're going to talk about fixing uh, skills and jobs. Yesterday we discussed mega trends and opportunities in shaping Australia's future economy and the potential for us to become a green energy, green manufacturing superpower. So we do need to talk about developing those skills locally before we just talk about bringing them in from a skilled migration point of view. And I would like, whilst I welcome Professor Schmidt here, there hasn't really been much conversation from the education sector of how they are going to be able to cope with this increased need for, to educate. We talk about a global war for talent, but there's also a brain drain in Australia to the lack of incentives when it comes to the focus from government on innovation and research and development. We've got inadequate support for startups and companies seeking to innovate. Australia has some of the world's lowest R&D investment, 1.8% of GDP. We're 25th on the Global Innovation Index. That doesn't make us an attractive place for skilled talent worldwide. So I think when we talk about this, yes, there's the high paid jobs, there's the lower paid jobs, but it's also that question of what are the jobs, the skills, and what are we going to try and attract are we doing everything we can locally before we look to the rest of the world? And how we treat people when they come here is incredibly important, recognising their skills and qualifications. We have too many engineers that are Uber drivers at the moment, and yet we have skill shortages. So it's, you know, I welcome and congratulate the government on this conversation, but I do put to the minister, it's not just about bringing in skilled migrants, shortening the visas. It is also about what do we do locally. Our youth are incredibly worried about their future and the challenges we have ahead. So what I hope we can, comes out of this session is an action plan and not just um, a lot of consideration of issues. So I guess, will the minister put forward an, an action plan coming out of this along with the other sessions we've had today? All right, uh, thank you, Zali. So the minister is going to have a chance to reply. I'm just going to uh, wrap things up uh, for time. What I think you're hearing, Minister, is that there is uh, an appetite across the board uh, to make sure that we are able to drive productivity in the high skills, but anything we do is going to have to be a system, and a system that interacts, obviously, with domestic needs, uh, the whole issue of sovereign capability, uh, the global marketplace, but also the education and skills agenda. You cannot easily separate the two. And so I think you'll find there's a, a big appetite for that review of, uh, of immigration provided it is able to stick to those principles, underlying principles of what we want is a prosperous Australia that's ethical and fits the demography, but also uh, doesn't forget the education and skills agenda as it creates the immigration program. So on that, we'll hand back to you and, and Brendan, I believe. Brian, that was... Uh, Brian, that was uh, a fabulous conversation and brilliantly, um, brilliantly run by you. And you've picked up some threads of really important commonality and difference too between the, the, the panelists there. So um, let me wrap up where I think we've got to. So um, Zali, you asked about an action plan. We've announced this morning four 
big changes to the migration settings that will occur immediately. We've got six areas where there's an agreement to do some urgent further work. And coming out of the discussion here, we are about to initiate a major review into our migration program. That is not going to be an endless exercise that tells us the answers in three years' time. We're going to have to renovate the plane while it's in the air because our migration system is, uh, is back up and running. Uh, but my um, focus here is for us to make big improvements fast. That's, uh, that's always where I'm going. Um, and I'm hopeful that we can do that by working together. Um, so a few things I just want to mention. Brian, you opened by talking about your migrant journey to Australia, and I'm sure a lot of us are sitting here thinking, would the young Brian Schmidt of today ever have made it here? And if the answer to that question is no, then we are definitely doing something terribly wrong and we do need to fix it. Scott, you talked about um, the amazing um, job creating potential of companies like Atlassian and the fact that if you're not getting skills you need, those jobs are going offshore and that is a tragedy and we need to address it immediately and I do think that's a really urgent priority. And Mina, I think your point about the fact that, you know, there's a big business end to this conversation but for you, if you can't get the skills to, that you need, it's life or death for your business in a matter of weeks, not something you can wait a year to get addressed. Um, Dan, you talked about um, some really important points about how um, fundamentally wrong we're getting things, but I think your points about exploitation are really important. This is about how we treat people when um, they're here, and I think uh, globally our reputation's taken a bit of a hit on some decisions that have been made recently, and so we do need to address that. And the technical aspects are important. You know, Mina, when you're sitting there filling in forms and paying money and, um, you know, endlessly kind of waiting for answers, it doesn't make you feel like Australia wants you here, and we do, so we need to sort that out. Finally, I just want to finish on um, David Littleproud's point about consensus and bipartisanship, and this came back to what Joe talked about earlier. Um, this has got to be a national project. It's not going to belong to any political party, and we've got different parties represented in the room here, different crossbenchers. We want to work with you to get this right with the, um, with the rest of the communities that are represented here. So I really look forward to coming back to you and reporting back on what we're finding through the, the discussions that we're having. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Minister, and to, to the panel. I think we all share your view that that was an incredibly constructive and interesting discussion. We are now going to break for morning tea. It's going to be super quick. Uh, I'm thinking about 10 minutes, and I'll, I'll see you back here. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this um, important uh, session uh, this morning. I believe this panel could be one of the highlights of the two days. I want to introduce the panellists, Shema Hussain, Nathan Kurilis, Diana McMurty and Stephanie Agnew. That said, some of the content being discussed in this next session might be difficult for some people to listen to. Our panellists may discuss or refer to family violence and abuse, self-harm and suicide, mental ill health and other potentially distressing material. Should you need to speak with access support after this session, we have arranged exclusive access to a counsellor. Details on how to access this support is included in the event info section of your participant app. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce the Minister, the Honourable Amanda Rishworth, the um, Minister for Social Services, to introduce the panel. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and I'm really, really pleased to be doing a short introduction uh, to this stream of the Jobs and Skills Summit, which is lifting participation and reducing barriers to employment. And I am so grateful. This is a really, really important discussion. Before I start, though, I would like to acknowledge that we're on the lands of the Ngunnawal people and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And I think this, to this, these next three sessions on lifting participation and reducing barriers to employment present us all with enormous opportunity to give all people who want to work the opportunity to do so. 
No matter their background or the realities of their lives, if we are creative in the approaches and we reimagine solutions, Australia can tap into this unused human capital and reap the benefits. Now, we all know the labour market is performing strongly. At 3.4% unemployment, it's the lowest since the 70s. But it's important to recognise not everyone is getting that opportunity of employment. So we're here together today to identify what, what is driving these inequalities and what are the solutions that can break down these barriers. Now, today's sessions have been informed by roundtables held by myself and other ministers, Minister Burney, Minister Shorten, Minister Giles and Minister Burke. And already at this summit, there has been significant discussion about training, increased skilled migration and solutions to workforce shortages. And there are very many viable solutions. But if we're truly to unlock the full potential of our country and address labour shortages, then we do need to take seriously that there are many who continue to be excluded from the labour force but want to join it. These are our older Australians, our First Nations people, those who live with a disability, single parents and women. These excluded Australians are still facing enduring structural barriers, institutional bias and entrenched outdated attitudes that contribute and compound their exclusion from the workforce. During this summit, we've spoken about the untapped potential, particularly of women. What we're going to do in this stream is talk about the disproportionate representation of some of the other groups in our community experiencing barriers and discrimination. Too many women, as we've heard, are unable to participate in paid work to the degree and level they aspire to due to bar barriers such as care responsibilities. But they also continue to face discriminatory workplace attitudes that hold them back from achieving their full potential and make their best contribution. Already identified in the session yesterday, the need for workplaces to support the flexibility of employees who are balancing employment and unpaid caring roles is essential. It's worth recognising also that a quarter of working age people with a disability who are not in the labour force intend to work or look for work. And research by COTA shows that age discrimination is a problem holding older Australians back, with 35% of those looking for work being told they were too qualified, 31% were told they were too old, and 19% were forced to retire or semi-retire before they'd planned to. The proportion of those on job seeker payments from non-English speaking backgrounds currently represents 19% of all recipients and a total of 14% of job seeker payments are made to our First Nations Australians. These statistics aren't just numbers on a page, they're real people and often being forced to the sidelines. They're also a missed opportunity for business and community. People who experience barriers to work not only have trouble getting into work, but are twice as likely to experience discrimination when they do accept the job. And of course, we've heard in many of our roundtables that having a workplace that makes people feel safe and accepted is critical to having a career. And particularly, I know that in Minister Burke's roundtable, uh, that women in the media, theatre and the arts sector felt this was particularly an issue of having a safe place to actually work. There are currently 480,000 vacancies in today's job market. Businesses are, as we've heard time and time again, facing barriers to attracting and retaining workers. But there's more than 300,000 people in Australia who are unemployed or underemployed and have some capacity to work or increase their hours. So what's holding them back from taking up these vacancies? We've also heard at our roundtables from those with lived experience that it can be just simple things. It could be that a person is applying for a job but is being turned away because the job specifications are too rigid and do not actually reflect the skills needed for the job. For example, does a job really need a driver's licence? If not a requirement for the job, why have it in the specification? Because you might be turning away a qualified worker. Without opening up a dialogue about these barriers and understanding a little bit more about a person's circumstances, 
Businesses and government and potential employees alike are being held back. It is entirely possible that some of the solutions to workforce shortages is to challenge ourselves. And I just want to paraphrase a story I heard from one of the participants at the Disability Employment Roundtable we held. He shared an experience where a prospective employer explicitly advertised a job as being open to people who may need workplace modifications. And, this, the, and in fact, job seekers that needed this were encouraged to imply, uh, apply. What that meant for him is, and this is what he said, when the job advertisement showed me that my disability was not a barrier, the employer immediately opened the door for me to apply for the job. That he felt really heard and the message to him was, we want your skills, we want your strengths. This week, I also had the pleasure of meeting Steve Fordham, who's just down the front here, who has built a business, BlackRock Industries, focused on recruiting First Nations people who are transitioning from prison into life outside through training programs and onto pathways to work. Now, while a lot of his work does go into preparing and training people for jobs, what struck me was the sentiment he shared that I've heard in other forums. It was the powerful message he and his company shares with participants that say that as an employer, I want to take a chance on you, that this is an act of acceptance that gives that job seeker the confidence to see themselves as worthy of employment. Could making some simple changes to language of recruitment advertisements to encourage those who feel locked out of the labour market actually ensure that those job seekers can seize the opportunity? Could focusing on the skills which a person brings uh, to be more productive to your organisation be important rather than focusing on the differences? To this, business, government and organisations must embed inclusion in their workplace policies, their HR departments and management must believe in it. Data released today by the social enterprise Jigsaw states that Australian businesses with a diversity and inclusion policy are more likely to have hired or worked with a person living with a disability. Conversely, those organisations without formal diversity and inclusion policies in their business were more likely to claim that the most recent person they hired with a disability was not job ready. Making a commitment to an inclusive culture and formalising that in policies and procedures of our businesses, our government departments and institutions matter. Now, bias and community attitudes have a significant economic and social cost. We are missing an important opportunity to contribute to Australia's economic growth. Hiring older, experienced people, single parents, First Nations people, for those from culturally diverse backgrounds, people who struggle against disadvantages and other barriers. These all make good business sense. The Australian Bureau of Statistics states that Australia's GDP would rise by about $70 million per year for every 1,000 people who live with a disability that we support into employment. And when we achieve gender parity in senior leader, leadership positions, we are looking at a $5 billion improvement to GDP. So that's what we're going to explore, explore in the first three sessions we've got coming up. Now, our first session is a really exciting one. It will draw on lived experience of people who, because of their circumstance, face barriers to gaining employment. These are deeply powerful stories that will help all of us here today think outside the box on how we deconstruct the barriers that are holding back potential workers who want meaningful employment. Now, sharing these stories is not an easy task, and I want to thank them sincerely for being here today to do so. It's always easier to tell someone else's story than your own, but the messages they will give will hopefully have a powerful change to mindsets. And as in the audience you listen to these stories, hear them with an ear tuned to potential. I urge you to hear what they can't, why they can't participate in the labour market and, of course, listen for the value that they could add to a workplace. Our second session will show us some of the successful methods to building an inclusive workplace and what it means to really partner with business, government and community and what we can achieve if we set our mind to it. And our third session today will also examine some of the policy levers that government can use to increase workforce participation.
We've heard many ideas at this summit already, and these ideas will need to be turned into action. But we need to all work together to ensure, whether it is our business, our government, philanthropy, or indeed our community sector, we need to build collaborative partnerships if we're going to move the dial. I'll finally leave you with one, one point that I think hopefully will challenge you. And that is, when employing someone with a disability, 88% of those employed working age people do not require specific arrangements from their employer to work. We have a huge opportunity here and I really look forward to exploring it. Now, it is my great, uh, uh, great pleasure to introduce our next facilitator, Asaya, who is from, uh, from Changing Community Attitudes and Tackling Discrimination session. Asaya is CEO of ID Know Yourself. Uh, know Yourself is an Aboriginal mentoring organisation that Asaya has in was inspired to create through his own experiences as a child who lived in foster care and through all but two months of his childhood. He's there making a difference. I'll now hand over to you, Asaya. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Nara Galangorjali, which means hello and good day in my language, which is Butchala language. Uh, Butchala country is up, uh, uh, up in um, uh, Harvey Bay, Maribor, Queensland and Gari. Gari is the traditional name of Fraser Island, which uh, we've fortunately been able to reclaim back. Uh, it means, uh, Gari means paradise also in our language, so if you haven't been there, you should definitely head up there. A few of you might need to take a vacation there. I'm sure our mob will be happy to show you around. Uh, as, uh, and thank you very much, Minister. As the Minister said, I'm the CEO and founder of an Aboriginal non-for-profit mentoring organisation called ID Know Yourself. Uh, the, I, I started up the organisation because I was one of those kids who were left behind and forgotten. I grew up in out-of-home care from the age of two months old until I was 18 years old. But during that time in foster care, I went through 17 different foster homes. I, like many other Aboriginal kids in out-of-home care, was taken from my culture. I was uh, taken to many abusive placements and as a young kid it was never about thriving in life. It was always about, you know, am I going to survive this situation that I was going through. I actually grew up uh, not too far away from here in a small country town called Yass. Um, it's about 45 minutes. And I, uh, I was so fortunate to grow up actually there with a an incredible Ngunnawal elder. His name was Eric Bell. He did a lot for the community. He did a lot actually around employment um, and helping uh, set up the Aboriginal walking trail back there on Ngunnawal country. And I, uh, you know, he, he unfortunately he passed away, but his spirit lives on and his legacy lives on as well. He taught me many things as a young fella and I think uh, that's why I got into the work that I'm in today is about passing that baton on and instilling um, a positive future for the future generation. And so I'd love to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the lands of which we're on today, which is the Ngunnawal people. Pay respects to those who have helped preserve, sustain and maintain the beautiful countries that we're all so lucky to be here today. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here. They've helped, um, help, you know, we've been able to play here, call it home, work here, and if it wasn't for those ancestors and, and people like uh, my old foster papa, Uncle Eric Bell, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So I pay respect to, to elders past, present and, and emerging, but also to the indigenous people here in this room and to the non-indigenous people in this room who are helping pave the way for reconciliation in Australia. Uh, Galangon Yin, which means thank you. We know that many indigenous children in out-of-home care uh, face many difficulties, just like I did when I was a kid. Uh, a lot of them are taken away from their culture, their belonging, their sense of identity, their purpose in life. And these are all barriers to employment, which we have heard from the minister not too long ago. And this is why we're all here to, to talk today. I'm joined here on stage by some incredible uh, contributors to today's panel. Their stories are absolutely powerful. Some of what they'll, they'll have to say will shock you. But hopefully what they will say will shift the conversation and help us all work together and help find solutions to help shift some of those barriers to employment that we see so entrenched in our communities. Now enough from me, let's get to our panel. I won't give an introduction to the people sitting up on stage with me, but I'm going to get, let them tell their stories in their own words and I'll just be here to guide the session. I think 
everyone has a voice. But often at the time, the difference is a platform for people to be heard. So I feel absolutely privileged to be able to facilitate this panel so these amazing, incredible panelists can share their stories. So let's, let's go to Steph first. Steph, can you tell us a little bit about your, yourself and, and maybe detail to the audience your experience of losing your vision and the impact that it had, that it had on your career? Thanks so much, Isaiah. My name's Stephanie Agnew. I'm a senior consultant at Get Skilled Access, and I've been with the organisation for three years. When I was 19 years old, I was diagnosed with a degenerative eye condition called cone rod dystrophy. I was told that I'd slowly lo lose my vision, but they had no idea how long it would take. Could be five years, it might be 20, or it might not happen at all. I ended up losing my vision slowly over 10 years, and I'm now completely blind. When I was diagnosed, I was working in the real estate industry, and it was my absolute passion. I loved it, and you know what? I was pretty good at it. As I slowly lost my vision, I started to do things a little bit differently. So we made small adjustments, and most of my employers were really great. Until the very end, when I started losing the remainder of my vision, and I was with a different employer, and things started to really change for me. First, they called an organisation that I was working with, I was learning how to use a cane, and they call, called that organisation, and they said to them, we hired an able-bodied employee, and we no longer have an able-bodied employee, what are you going to do about it? Now, when they were informed that that's clear discrimination, uh, they started to try a different way. Now, I am, for those of you who may know me, I'm a very strong person, very strong-willed, and so at first, the things that started happening to me, I could get through them. So uh, they asked me to get reports around whether I was safe to be in the office because I had low vision and they were worried about me on the stairs and they wanted to check with their insurance whether I could legally be in that office. And then I was given a present from a client, a really expensive bottle of champagne, and we all love that. But they decided to hide it knowing that I couldn't see it. And I asked for it back, and I was told that, you know, if I didn't like the joking, then I could go elsewhere because that was the culture in the organisation. You know, little things of mine would go missing, and it was really, really difficult. They ended up breaking me, and I'm pretty hard to break, but they broke me, and I found it really difficult to get back into the workforce. Once I started disclosing my disability throughout different industries, people didn't want to hire me. And I was really skilled. I knew I could do the job. I just did things a little bit differently. But unfortunately, people just couldn't see that. Thank you, Steph. And you are incredibly strong. You are incredibly strong, but no one deserves to go through what you had to go through. Now, what helped you most to build your confidence to apply for your current job? I fell into my current job, so I didn't go through the mainstream industry. I actually found out about this role through a support organisation that sent out a newsletter about a job opportunity. So I'd stopped looking on Seek and the mainstream platforms because of what I'd been through and some of the responses that I'd had to resumes. But I saw this ad came through and I looked up the organisation and the signs and symbols that they had around their disability inclusion, I was like, oh, I feel really confident that I can go in and potentially have a chance at this job. And it was the first time since losing my vision and even you know, acquiring my disability that I could walk into an interview and I knew for a fact that it was my skills and my knowledge and my expertise that were being assessed for the interview and not my disability. And that was huge for me because I could be confident and I could present my best self in that interview knowing that my disability didn't matter. And at the very end, they asked me a question. I know Minister Rishworth spoke earlier around that question. Do you require any adjustments so that we can help you to be your best self? 
And that organisation asked me that question. And that, again, that was a sign and symbol for me for inclusion, knowing that you know, they want to know how they can support me because they want me to succeed. So, so what has supported you to thrive and build in your career? Definitely asking the question. So asking and not assuming. Asking me, you know, what do I need to be successful? But also creating a pathway for me to be able to grow. You know, we often hear about roles for people with disability that might be entry level roles and then we get stuck there and we don't have that room for growth. But at Get Skilled Access, they've provided me with a pathway to be able to learn and grow and have that ability to grow. So I started off as an administration assistant and then I went to consultant and recently I've just been promoted to senior consultant and don't think I'm stopping there. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, I wanted to add to that, you know, if you think back to that employer I spoke about at first, if they had have allowed me to use my assistive technology and recognise that I could steal my job, sorry, still do my job just as well. I mean, I was an award-winning real estate agent. And if they had have opened, oh, I'm using non-inclusive language, opened their eyes <laughs> um, and let me be able to do that, who knows, I could be running that organisation right now. So it's so important to ask what people need, not assume, and give us that pathway for growth. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us, Steph. Let's move now to Diana. Diana, can you introduce yourself? And I understand you left work to care for your son who has a disability. Can you tell us a little bit about this and what led to your decision? Thanks, Isaiah. Um, I'm Diana. I am a very proud carer of my son who is 13 with complex disabilities. I want to preface this by saying I'm just one example of what a carer looks like. There are so many spaces that we are supporting amazing individuals in. I was actually uh, training in and working in the education space when uh, I became a carer on top of a parent. And I was advised that now that I was a carer, it was not advantageous for organisations to support my continued training or that workplaces would want me if I wanted to work 15 hours a week or if I needed to book time off. And at first I thought I had not experienced those kind of barriers before and I argued and I begged and I negotiated and then I, like Steph, I broke. I started to believe the narrative that there wasn't a place for me, that I wasn't a value. And and I know I'm not alone in that space. I know that carers are making choices to either burn out and not have the space to build up the people they're supported, or they're stepping back and not sharing those skills that we have. We want to work, and the reason that I specify part-time is because when I go to work, I want to give everything I've got with all the energy I've got. And now that you've found work, what, it, what has made it possible for you to, for you to re-enter into the workforce? I was really lucky. I happened to um, click on a link from my local carers organisation, Carers Queensland. Uh, they were running a uh, program to get carers back into jobs, volunteering or employment, uh, training, sorry. And I had no belief when they called me. I was like, I really don't want to do this. Uh, there's no space for me. There's no space for me in employment. Uh, so they lured me in with volunteering. And I found the passion that I had for education in human services. I found connecting with people. And so we added 
that I was a carer to my skill set and to my experience. And please, when you see that on a resume, read it and believe it, because I was being honest. And I got a lot of interviews, um, but a lot of them were when I was at work, I wouldn't be a carer. Uh, I needed to guarantee that I definitely wouldn't be taking time off in the first few months. I kept getting supported by Carers Queensland to try just one more interview, and I did, and I met my boss at Empower Autism, and he said, tell me about the skills that you bring as a carer. I'm interested. Tell me how that's informed you. And we talked about partnership. We talked about the fact that carers are partners. We're not guides, we're not doing it. We are actually just there to be another person facing the barriers together. We're there to facilitate empowerment and thriving of our loved ones, of our neighbours, our parents, our kids. Because barriers are tough. <laughs> um, a it was a boss. It was a mm. boss who valued me, and I'd lost that. I can see why we have mental health challenges and health challenges in our cohort, because you, you stop believing in yourself. And I'm not going to do that anymore, because there's three million of us, and we're amazing, and we can bring those skills to, to more than just human services. It's not, uh, I love human services and I'm passionate about it, but we belong in finance, we belong in retail, we belong in business. We will bring skills like every other person on this panel. And connecting us means seeing and seeing the value and creating belonging for us in this community. And for the employers here today, what is one thing that you would like them to remember about carers? Open your dialogues. Ask questions, please. Don't be afraid to talk about it because I'm comfortable and empowered to speak to my boss and say, these are my boundaries. I'm going to speak out of turn here and say, when I walked in today, walking through the press gang, one of the media said, well, wouldn't we all love to just say to our bosses, I need flexibility to make my dental appointment? We're not talking about that. We're talking about people who require flexibility to access the community, to maintain their well-being, and to support their loved ones to thrive and to survive. No carer will push your boundaries. They won't ask you for extra time as an excuse. Nor, I can be certain from speaking to the amazing people on this panel, will anyone else. We're asking for an opportunity to share, and that comes from being comfortable to have those discussions first. Please talk to your carer employees, ask them if they'd like to work flexible hours, ask them if they have appointments coming up. They will talk to you if you create the safe space, but we're probably a little fearful of rejection and judgment. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us, Diana. As I shared earlier today, uh, you know, through my experiences of growing up in out-of-home care, uh, the next panellist, I can relate to a lot of your story and the experiences that you've had. Nathan, during your pre-teen and teenage years, you experienced a lot of trauma and instability. Can you share just a little bit about your story? Yeah, absolutely. So, like you said, lots of uh, trauma in the past as a child, you know, I lost my mum to family violence when I was 10. And, um, you know, lots of 
anxiety and depression、um, stemming from that, which then, you know, eventually led to me disengaging from my high school and education really entirely. And 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 during that time, we. Were you thinking about, you know, what did you want to do in the future? Were you thinking about, you know, what you what did you want to be in your life as a career or a job? Future really never really it was it was never something that I thought that I had. I never thought about me at any end point. I didn't. That was never something I envisioned for myself that I would、mm. end up in a place where I felt like I should be. Yeah, and did you have any kind of role models or people that you look to or aspire to be like? I think really, I was just withdrawn from everybody in my life who was、um, trying to be that for me. But you know, being anxious and that, it just, I didn't, I guess, at that point, want to、um, be better. Yes. Yeah. And and what would you say? I mean, obviously, it's you know I, I hear this question a lot as well. And what do you think is probably one of the biggest challenges that you had growing up? Yeah. Really, it's just the biggest challenge of mine is、um, like inward. You know, trying to because I've been withdrawn from like everything that、um, I feel like you know my peers. And、um, people around my age have done, and I, I feel like that I have missed out on a lot of stuff in my life because of that.、Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 really difficult、um, to try and now、uh, reengage with everything、yeah. because I feel like I'm really really late to the game.、Mm. And so, what、oh, we were yarning before as well, yeah. You got a daily job now. What what was the difference between you getting into employment? Yeah, so getting into employment recently has been really, I think,、um, been through the Brotherhood of Saint Lawrence, which I was linked to.、Um, they have really fostered in me, like you know, endless、uh, courage, you know, and. The introspection that I think I needed to to strive to be better and outgoing and a more you know happy person, happy with me. That's incredible, brother. Thank you so much for your openness and and for sharing your story. Shaima, you arrived in Australia from Afghanistan in 2015. Can you tell us a little bit about your story? And your employment journey. Yeah, sure.、Uh, so I arrived in Australia with my parents and my siblings, my two siblings, younger ones. So I was the eldest of my family. So coming to Australia is like coming to a new country, new environment. I came from Afghanistan, as you all know. Like, what's the situation there for girls, especially? Although I was for some years, I was in Pakistan as a refugee again. So again, the Pakistan is the same. They have the same situation for the girls, especially. So I never worked out、uh, like something like in a cafe or restaurant, something like that. But I was like new teachers there. New teacher were like teaching them.、Uh, when I came here, so everything was so new. I faces many challenges in my life because being the eldest of the home is there is a too much like responsibilities. Uh, I, I was looking after my parent, my siblings who was younger than me. They were not working; they had no license. So I was like supposed to get license. So I went to English class like other refugees. I went to English class. I wanted to be a journalist. Then I was doing English classes. My teachers suggested me or told me like you can't be a journalist with having accent because English is my third language, so I can't be a journalist. So then I was thinking, why I should study? Why I should continue my education if I cannot be like a journalist? If I cannot achieve my goals in future? So why I am here? I was thinking Australia will be a good place to live, a good、uh, country for especially for women. Uh, who was coming like a refugee? Then it was giving me a tough time. Like the government, they are providing job seekers, especially 
or we are calling job provider, something like that. So I had job provider who was giving me the toughest time in my life. They were pushing me to find job at least, I think, 20 jobs. I think it was per month or four night. Although I was new in a country, I had no resume, I had no cover letter, I even don't know what it was. Uh, because in Afghanistan or Pakistan, mostly the women, they are not working. If they are working, so they are teacher or something like that. But the boys, they are working at a restaurant or cafe or the shops. So they were just going to the shops and like talking to them in person. Like, do you want any worker if they want? So yes, you can, come on. And here, for, it's like even for the cafe or restaurant or even cleaner, we need a resume and cover letter that I had not won. And I was asking them and they were like, you have to find 20 jobs. I know like they were responsible to give a report to the government that they are with us and they are looking for a job. Although like I'm telling this here, I was just clicking Submit, 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 submit. I had no cover letter, no resume. I made one, like, I was thinking from Google, okay, write cover letter or resume, that it was not perfect one. Then I was doing my English in the same time. I was looking for the job. The thing was also challenging for me. When I was going to the shops in my local area, I'm living in the government uh, local area of Hume in uh, Victoria, Melbourne. So I handed my resume, which I was like, my name is Shema, or some few words there. And I'm looking for a job. And there was no skill I, because I had no idea what I should write in my resume. And I never get back from any of them. And that was giving me more stress in my life. And yeah, so because they need a local experience, which I had not won because I was new in the country. So. And Shema, what, what eventually helped you to get it, gain employment? Well, then I met Brotherhood of St. Lawrence. They had a program run uh, Youth Transition. So I participated in Youth Transition. They helped me with writing my like, resume, cover letter, looking for a job. And I got my first job as well through Brotherhood of St. Lawrence and my second job in the Melbourne airport. And of course, my third job, I'm working with Brotherhood of St. Lawrence now as a youth advisor, which was like my biggest dream because I wanted to be a journalist. Then as I meet Brotherhood of St. Lawrence, I was involved with them. So I thought like, why not I should change my career and help those young people or those young new refugees who are coming to Australia and who are new in Australia and who are struggling, who don't know what to do and they're not sure with their pathways. So I was thinking, why not I should join community service. So I did my community service and I, now I got my first step towards my goal. That's me. And Shema, we're in a room full of, of business leaders and government officials. If they could take one thing away from what you've shared today, what would it be? Please give opportunities to young people, especially, I think Aussie people, they are saying like fresh in the market, something like that. So please give opportunities to the young people. If you don't give opportunities, so how they can uh, like prove their skills or how they can show their skills. Every, in every like work, as we are looking for jobs, so they need experience even for having diploma but having three or five years of experience just please be like logical how 20 years old or how 25 years old person can have five or six or three years of experience so please give opportunity to young people thank you very much Shema for sharing your story wow what an incredible panel that we've had here today. I'm sure you, you could all agree. Can we please just give everybody one more round of a big applause? It's, it's definitely not easy, you know, sharing your personal stories, perspectives, let alone being up here on this stage and talking to all you friendly guys here. It's, uh, but it, what it has been has been incredibly open, open um, it's really been insightful 
and you know, hearing these different varied experiences uh, and stories, I hope that this is uh, a way that we can move forward. You know, hearing these stories um, is a way that we can move forward together and provide solutions to make sure that you know, these things don't happen again. Um, you know, what is a clear and, and, key, uh, and clear common theme that we've, we've heard though throughout this discussion is that there's persistent barriers um, and experiences of discrimination, whether that be intentional or unintentional, uh, that make it really hard to keep on trying. Yes, we've heard some incredibly resilient stories, but I think a lot of the challenges that these people have experienced up here on the stage don't have to happen. And the people in this room have an incredible opportunity to be able to make a difference and give a platform and give opportunity um, so we can you know, break this cycle that we're seeing. So now I'm going to hand over to Helen, who will now help drive some of the contributions uh, from the audience. Galen Gonyin, thank you very much. Fantastic. Nicely done, Isaiah. Uh, we are, as you would probably guess, pretty tight on time, so I am going to ask um, the contributors of this session to keep it super tight, if possible. And with that, I'm going to go to Australian of the Year, Dylan Alcott. G'day everyone. Um, firstly, I'm wearing a, my name's Dylan, I'm wearing a black turtleneck today, got grey pants on, sitting in a black wheelchair, and Steph will be pleased to know I've got a really average bowl cut haircut going on at the moment. Um, I, I want to firstly thank everybody up there for your vulnerability in talking to us today. It took me 28 years to fully feel worthy of my disability. I'm 31, and some of you just spoke up there with no experience. I could not have done that. I honestly could not have done that like you just did, so thank you very much for that. Um, also, the very awesome Steph, um, she's the senior consultant at, at our company, Get Skilled Access. Steph, you're about to get 129 business cards offering you a job. Please don't leave me, all right? Please stay um, with us. Hey, judging by the amount of silence I had in the room then, everybody had in the room then, you can hear a pin drop. It has not been like that the whole time and I can see there is a thirst from everybody in this room that you actually want to do this. I've heard the word disability spoken about so many times and that is awesome. But how do we do it? What are we going to do? We need buy-in from everybody, from government, from business, from education departments. We've all got to come together and, and get this done. From the government, there are people on the NDIS who, uh, who want to get out and build capacity to be able to work. There's a, a lot of red tape where money isn't going to the people that need it and we need greater flexibility so people on those programs can spend their budget however they want. If it is to build capacity to work, well then that's great. There are also people on the DSP who could work. Um, there are uh, staff shortages absolutely everywhere. However, when you do work on the DSP, you risk losing your pension. Two by medicine to live, two by food, two by shelter. There's no reason to up to a point why people on the DSP couldn't get out there and have a crack and do a little bit of work to try and help our economy grow. And also keep funding, both state, federally, keep funding programs, education, training programs that go to small and medium businesses who might not be able to access, but also goes back into the public sector as well. So we can lead by example and get more people with disability employed in the public sector. But it's not just government. It's business too. And you cannot sit around and wait for government funding all the time. The time to get out there and do it is right now, to invest in your businesses, to increase productivity and workplace morale, as we spoke about yesterday, but also to reflect your customer base. Because what are we? Consumers, just like you. We shop at supermarkets. We want to go on planes. We want to use technology. But if we get left out of that economic conversation, we can't do that. And you need a re your workforce to reflect your consumer base, and we are your consumers. And we need the educational institutions to get involved as well. Unis, TAFEs, schools, to make your education accessible and inclusive for everyone, so we can get the skills to get out there and, and go thrive. And look, I'm going to be honest with you. When my alarm went off this morning, I put it on snooze, because right? I was tired. And I felt a bit sorry for myself. And then I reminded myself, I am privileged that I have a job and a career, but most importantly, choice over what I do. I am privileged, and every single person in this room is very privileged to have had multiple jobs and multiple opportunities throughout your lives. People with disability deserve that same choice to get out there and be the people that we want to be. And you know what? You might stuff it up, just like when you employ an able-bodied person. 
That's okay. As long as you listen to, listen to lived experience, invest and have a crack, we can all do this together. Because it's not you versus us, it's we. We all have to do this, and I think the time to do it is right now. Thank you, everyone. Dylan, thank you very much. Um, outstanding contributions, um, as we've come to expect over the last two days. Uh, CEO um, of uh, Coles Group, Stephen Kane. Thank you. So that was a bit quicker than I expected there. Um, um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners across the country and uh, pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you for inviting us to the conference and the opportunity uh, to speak today. I'm not sure I would have uh, dared come if there weren't any uh, lettuces and strawberries back on the, back on the shelves, so uh, I hope you're enjoying those. And thanks to our resilient farmers, who, many of whom have been wiped out three times this year. We're one of the largest uh, public sector, uh, or sorry, private sector employers in the country. We employ around about 1% of all working Australians. Scott, somehow you managed to uh, slip the net, so there's a bit of an investigation uh, going on in that one. Um, we're on a diversity journey with still a long way to go, but I wanted to share some of the progress we've made and how it's been achieved. Including in the first day of the summit, we heard a lot about equal access to employment opportunities. At Coles, our Better Together strategy recognised that we'll be a better organisation through the diversity of our team and, importantly, the diversity of their thought. We want to foster a safe, inclusive and diverse workplace that is reflective of the community and, as Dylan says, the 20 million customers we serve every week. We, uh, every, well, if we look back at our journey on safety and inclusiveness and so on, over the last four years, we've reduced safety incidents and injuries at Coles by more than 50%. And in our recent uh, anonymous culture and engagement survey, completed by more than 90,000 of our team members, more than 80% more, more 80 of them said that their manager genuinely cares about their well-being. With regards to gender diversity, we will achieve a significant milestone next year, which is for the first time in Coles history, and that's 108 years, uh, we will have 40% of women in leadership positions across the company. To achieve these milestones, we've done a number of things. First of all, we make sure that women are on our recruitment shortlists, um, because if they're not, uh, they don't end up uh, getting the job. We've introduced flexible technology programs to encourage women returning to the workforce, and specific programs to make sure that we get more women uh, into store management, which hopefully you've seen around the country. We've recently extended parental leave programs for women and men, and we've also uh, made the decision to make super contributions uh, for women on parental leave. We support our executive women with Sam and the chief executive programs that she runs. And that's just part of what we do to try and make sure that Coles uh, is driving a, a gender uh, agenda. As Dylan said yesterday, uh, Australia has made limited progress on developing careers for people with disability. We have 3,000 uh, team members at Coles with disabilities, and we need a lot more. And earlier this year, we teamed up with Dylan and with Steph uh, at Skilled Access uh, to dedicate roles this year in our technology team uh, that will be permanent and career development type situations. If we go to the LGBTQI community, we've got 10,000 team members who identify uh, in the Pride movement, and that's why we took the decision to sponsor the Sydney World Pride next year. Uh, and I have to say, the enthusiasm that that's created uh, in and amongst the Coles team 
is enormous and that enthusiasm will spread through our customer base over the next uh, six months or so. With regards to Indigenous, it's been great sitting here next to Patricia and uh, talking about what she's doing, what we're doing to drive uh, employment and careers for Indigenous people across Australia. We employ 4,000 Indigenous uh, team members today and we've set a target to get to 5% of our workforce and 3% of management roles. We employ role models as ambassadors and Eddie Betts is one of ours uh, to get about in communities of all backgrounds but in particular indigenous communities to make sure that sport is a part of their lives as they grow up and he is a great ambassador and doing a great job for Coles and the AFL in doing that. Role models like Dylan and uh, Eddie are important to success uh, but so are internal behaviours all notable internal meetings at Coles uh, are started with acknowledgement or welcome to country and the same when we, when we launch a new store in the community. We'll continue to pre present opportunities for indigenous uh, team members, for suppliers and the communities that uh, we operate in. Um, we want to, uh, and I might add that you know, the Prime Minister talked about the voice referendum. We are avid supporters of that taking place for the Indigenous community. We also support a much more ambitious childcare programme to allow more women into the working uh, environment. I'm lucky that I get to a lot, interview a lot of people who are interested in joining uh, Coles. In terms of building diversity, I would encourage organizations to make sure you have a very clear purpose. Our purpose is to sustainably feed all Australians and that includes the disadvantaged through Second Bite and Food Bank. Many younger people now, whether they're from Australia or abroad, want to work but they also want to work in a company uh, and in a world where they can influence change as they uh, grow up and develop. There was a lot of talk about accountability at executive levels yesterday around building diversity, and that's very much how it works at Coles. Every pillar of our diversity strategy has an owner in my executive leadership team with KPIs attached, and that's how we've been able to make some of the improvements below. Finally, in terms of inclusion, it would be remiss of me not to wish all dads present in the room a happy Father's Day on Sunday and remind the rest of the audience that Coles or Liquorland is perfect for a late gift idea. So thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I now call on Rob Scott, Chief Executive Officer of West Farmers. Thanks very much. Look, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting and pay respect to elders past and present. I also acknowledge how difficult it is to speak after Dylan. Dylan would still have goosebumps. No offence, Stephen, you are pretty good too. <laughs> As CEO of West Farmers, I represent 120,000 team members, and today I'm speaking for them as well as our shareholders. Importantly, the long-term interests of both groups are very aligned. Many of you will know our businesses, Bunnings, Kmart, Target, Officeworks and Priceline. We also have significant industrial operations and are developing one of Australia's largest integrated lithium hydroxide projects. We're a big company, but we also compete every day against some incredibly large multinational companies, so it's critical that we remain, our, uh, remain competitive. At West Farmers, we've long believed that our businesses will be more successful if our workforce reflects the communities in which we operate. And I do genuinely believe this is a source of competitive advantage for us. And Australian communities are very diverse. I just wanted to share a few perspectives. 50% of our team are women, which is not uncommon in retail. And I'm proud that half of our executive leadership team are also women. We wouldn't have achieved this milestone without making it a priority and being disciplined about measuring performance. Our greatest breakthrough came when we started thinking about gender balance as an opportunity for our business, rather than viewing women as a problem that needed to be solved. And this opportunity has motivated us to continue to work towards balance, 
gender balance in management roles, where we are approaching 40 per cent. Now, group-wide, we employ tens of thousands of young Australians, and for many, their first job is with a Kmart or a Bunnings, and where they learn valuable skills for the future. We also employ many seniors. Bunnings has almost 6,000 team members over the age of 60 and hundreds over the age of 70. For all these groups, casual or part-time work is a great way, a great opportunity for them, and also for many women as primary carers that seek flexible work. As we heard yesterday, so many of our IR settings don't support these outcomes. In Indigenous employment, a recent collaboration with the Commonwealth delivered a step change for us across West Farmers. We signed up to the Employment Parity Initiative, which seeks governments, which aligns government support around successful outcomes for Indigenous people who face barriers for employment. And we, of course, as we should, pay the wages. Now, over three years, we've onboarded more than 2,000 new Indigenous team members, and we're pleased to have moved beyond parity. And we're now turning our attention to creating more Indigenous leaders in our organisation. In less than 18 months, the Commonwealth's investment has been covered through the PAYG tax, and the multiplier of wages that we have paid to the initial investment is over 14 times. This was a great outcome for all involved, and it couldn't have been achieved without collaboration. But of course, the numbers don't tell the whole story, because every single job comes with a sense of pride, a pathway to a career and financial independence. Now, looking forward, we've heard today and yesterday about the need to better tap into the talent and creativity of Australians, of which there are over four million with disabilities. And the minister and Dylan spoke very clearly about this opportunity. Now, our businesses employ many team members with disabilities, especially Kmart, that once again see this as a point, a source of competitive advantage. But to accelerate progress, we need a sophisticated, flexible approach. And perhaps government and business could work together, as we have with the EPI program, to develop new collaborative employment initiatives. To be sustainable, it will need to have flexibility at, at its core. But with flexibility must also come fairness. We should also ensure that pensions and other entitlements don't present a disincentive for people with disabilities or indeed seniors seeking additional work. Now we're here today because we know that a job is much more than a paycheck. It creates a sense of purpose, builds self-esteem and a stronger community. And at West Farmers, our success is linked inextricably to our teams and strengthened by our diversity. And our team members' commitment and engagement drives our performance and innovation, which creates value and in turn develops careers. And this is great for Australia. Thank you. And our final contribution from the floor is Yasmin Poole. Hi. I figured since this panel was about lived experience, it might be useful to share a bit of my story and to talk about class barriers that I've experienced. Um, so I wanted to first start with, a, with my mum. My mum left a situation of domestic violence and left her as a single mum with three kids. Um, she was out of the workforce. She was a housewife for um, you know, a couple of decades and wanted to re-enter. Um, but she ended up, first she wanted to go into early learning. The pay was ultimately too low. So she decided to study nursing because there's always a demand. Um, she did get uh, Centrelink, but it wasn't enough. So she had to take out $30,000 in her superannuation in order to pay rent to provide. Um, and that was all that she had. Uh, not to mention the fact that she had to do unpaid placements while juggling family responsibilities and trying to make ends meet. When it came to me, um, I decided to go to uni um, and I found a university that was the best course and location that would provide the best job opportunities. I had minimum wage savings, so not much, and I couldn't rely on my family to provide financial support. It was really scary to make the decision to relocate. Um, it was pretty much jumping in the deep end with no, with no security blanket, um, but I decided to do it anyway. I did get youth allowance, but again, it was just enough to cover my rent and not the additional costs. Um, I remember going to O-Week and they had like an O-Week ticket and I couldn't even afford to pay 15 bucks just to meet first years at my uni. Um, and this is 
for me, I was actually lucky enough to receive a generous scholarship. Because I was able to live at home uh, in the beginning, I was able to volunteer um, and have the additional um, advocacy work that led me to get my rent paid for. But that's not the reality. You know, that was a, the generous scholarships available are merit-based, and we know if it's merit-based, it usually goes to the people that are most privileged. And you see that with GO8 universities, they're largely the, the worst when it comes to low socioeconomic representation. This is the reality for many young people, not just me. And I think about how many thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands low-income young people have slipped through the cracks. Amazing minds that we could have benefited from that had to punch down barrier after barrier and it just got too hard. So um, not only that, you know, expecting them to have the resilience to do so when often many have not been supported throughout their life and told that they can. So ultimately my recommendations, uh, I'm in favour of increasing ab study and youth allowance. We know unis are doing it tough. We need more support from government to provide that financial support, not just scholarships. We need better pathways for mature age students, including people who have left domestic violence situations. Um, and that includes things like paid placements for low-income people, including in nursing. Um, and we also need things like domestic violence grants before leaving, not afterwards. Um, I'm, I'm also in favour of bursaries to relocate interstate. There are some available for those who live regionally. I li didn't live regionally, but it makes all the difference from those who, for those who can't afford it. And finally, can I just say that this panel once again demonstrates the power of lived experience. And I've been so grateful to work in spaces with young people from all diverse backgrounds. We're not the same. And what the power of that listening to young people is, is that we've faced these systems. We've felt the gaps. And yes, we won't have all the answers to address them, but often we've felt what um, can be difficult to see unless you've lived it. So I welcome uh, Labor's commitment to create a youth steering committee. I think that's really encouraging and just want to reiterate that power of, of youth voices. Uh, thank you, Yasmin. And um, that concludes uh, Changing Attitudes and Tackling Discrimination. As promised, it was a highlight of the two days. To the panellists, um, Isaiah, uh, very well done. Uh, Shema, Nathan, Diana and Stephanie, Stephanie, thank you so much for your contribution. Okay. Um, as uh, that panel is um, departing, can I introduce the uh, next um, speaker, facilitator? It's Danielle Fralin. She's the Chief Executive Officer of Get Skilled Access. We've already heard a little bit about that organisation today. Danny's involvement in the disability sector began after the birth of a child who has a rare chromosome abnormality. It's a, Get Skilled Access is a disability inclusive consulting firm that supports organisations to be more inclusive of people with a disability. And with that, I will hand over to Danielle for this session, which is titled Boosting Workforce Participation, Challenges and Opportunities. Where are Hello. <laughs> Perfect. It's all yours. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we're meeting here today, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders here today. Um, a couple of thank yous to start with, or acknowledgements. Um, one is Minister Rishworth sitting next to us. I think she's hit the ground running, <laughs> which has been amazing. Um, and some of the early work that has been done before this summit has been quite extraordinary. So thank you for doing that. Uh, and everybody else who's been involved in organising the summit. It would be remiss of me to not also thank uh, Australian of the Year, who happens to be a really good friend, a business partner, and probably my boss. So if I don't do this right, I'm in really big trouble. And welcome to all of you. Um, I have to say uh, that I was a little bit terrified when asked to do this and quite honoured. Um, the rationale that was given to me for me actually facilitating this session uh, was 
that I had an extensive knowledge of the disability sector, which I do. I have a son born with trisomy 9P syndrome, and if you Google that, you'll probably find very little, um, but is an extraordinary young man who is also a barista and one of our associates who, when he was diagnosed, was told he would never work. Um, and I've also got a mission, and my mission is to ensure the world would be as equal, he had equal opportunity as his brothers and sisters do who don't have disability. I'm a first generation Australian from refugee parents. I'm a woman. I'm a reasonable facilitator, but we'll wait and see how this goes. An even more compelling reason I was given by the minister's staffer was that I was a older Australian. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> so um, you've heard the stories in the last session and they were all quite amazing. Um, this session is more about what do you do with these stories. This session is about us actually saying here are some examples of what you could do but actually just taking the first step is going to be really important if you haven't already and clearly some organisations have. We have three incredible speakers actually next to me on the panel. Um, we have, from an employer's perspective, Megan Lilly, who's from the Australian Industry Group. From the, uh, the Australian Council of Social Services, we have Dr Peter Davidson. And from an employee perspective, we have Travis McLeod from the Brotherhood of St Lawrence. And I think it was a little bit of an advertisement for you <laughs> with the speakers we had earlier. We also have a number of really experienced people and experts in the audience um, who have attended some of the roundtables prior to uh, this particular summit and will be invited to uh, share their thinking. So you all in this room are tasked with the challenging and yet rewarding um, opportunity of boosting workforce participation for many people who have traditionally been forgotten ignored, or simply in a system that doesn't work for them. Given we've only got 45 minutes, I know we're running over, so we'll work quickly, concisely, and with much energy to harness the collective minds in this room. Each of our panels will have, each of our panel members will have five minutes to speak. And trust me, I will be ruthless with timing. We'll open the floor then uh, to hear from the other experts that are in this room. Let's not get stuck in the how-to at this point. Um, let's just simply shift the dial, shift your thinking, so that we're not sitting in this room in another summit in five years' time asking the same questions or hearing the same stories. This is a session about leadership. And you, in this room, are Australia's leaders. And so this should come easily to you. Having spent 25 years of my life um, consulting on leadership and culture in organisation, I've learned more in the last four years as CEO of Get Skilled Access than I have from any book I could read. Our team, 85% of whom have disability or lived experience, um, teach me something new every day. And I have to say, we've also taken leadership lessons from COVID and um, the greater need for understanding of difference, different people's needs, the capability and adaptability of the sort of people we're talking about today. All of these are present in our untapped workforce. Um, we at GSA have a really, really good saying, which is we call people in rather than out. Uh, and so that really sits with us the whole time. We want to move forward and work together and work with government and work with organisations to ensure that uh, you actually know how to be more inclusive because most of the time it's not that you're wanting to be purposely in exclusive. So how do we help you to see what needs to be seen? I think we have a secret source at GSA, born out of the resilience, work ethic and humour our team bring to work every day. Would I employ any of them in my old firm at PwC? 100% I would, all of them. And you should too, except not my team. <laughs> so one thing to ponder before we hear from our speakers, the current pathways to employment do not fit everyone. The current pathways to career progression do not fit everyone. 
the current culture in organisations is often not inclusive and indeed exclusive of individuals who are not like you. What could you do to give everyone an opportunity? Let's hear from the experts. Over to you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, and it's my pleasure to be here today. But firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm the, on the land of the Ngunnawal people, and I pay respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. I would like to identify the issues today and then talk briefly about some solutions, what business can do and what governments can do. The current extremely tight labor, Australian labour market provides us with a rare opportunity to tackle the seemingly entrenched disadvantage too many individuals persistently face in obtaining employment. Multifaceted strategies are required. These include increased investment in our training system and further workplace reform. Disadvantage is not limited to financial poverty or low incomes, but extends to social exclusion, material deprivation and higher expenditure needs. Women, First Nations people, refugees, people with disability, culturally and linguistically diverse people are often overrepresented amongst those that are disadvantaged. One size fits all strategies and solutions to lift the employment participation of such individuals rarely succeed because disadvantage can impact an individual's life in often complex ways. It's an important starting point for employers to understand. Many businesses are already employing individuals that have come from disadvantage. Some large companies in particular embed diversity and inclusion in their core employment practices. However, the tightness of the current labour market has prompted many more businesses to reach out and recruit beyond traditional cohorts and traditional methods. We are seeing some success here, but if we wish to see a step change in lifting participation, we need deeper understanding of the needs of business and strategies to build success. Lifting participation should also be about diversity of employment arrangements to attract larger cohorts of unemployed or underemployed in our community who want more work. This includes ensuring our IR system is responsive and flexible to accommodate how working arrangements have evolved recently, including through widespread remote and flexible work opportunities. Our training system needs to fully embrace lifelong learning, enabling all working age Australians to develop skills and to keep them up to date. This will involve developing new models of training that are, amongst other things, more accessible. Full qualifications remain important, but need to be supplemented by the expansion of funded micro-credentials, skill sets and other shorter form credentials that are aligned to the skill needs of the labour market. Expansion of other work-based learning models may also expand the opportunity for employers to engage more disadvantaged individuals. Structured work integrated learning projects, internships and cadetships all enable individuals to gain genuine work experiences, building the individual's employability and work readiness. Digital skills need to be developed in pre-employment programs to ensure that people do not remain on the wrong side of the digital divide. Digital fluency, the other side of that divide, in fact can help ameliorate disadvantage. There is ongoing need for policy, so business will need toolkits to enable them to develop and implement successful strategies that can facilitate sustainable employment outcomes. There is ongoing need for policy to ensure that individuals and groups who face barriers to economic and social participation are encouraged and facilitated to seek opportunities. Similarly, policies are needed to develop these opportunities. Included here are just but a few examples of some of the initiatives that government could embrace in the short term. One, ensure that income support arrangements for job seeker and age, disability and veteran payments do not serve as unnecessary barriers for people who wish to enter or re-enter the workforce. High effective marginal tax rates concentrate income support on those who need it most but in so doing they create what are called poverty traps because income from extra work is significantly offset by reductions in income support received. The government can help by selective easing of income test parameters and also look at how limitations on superannuation contributions and requirements about the withdrawal of superannuation can impact on rewards for work. Employ mobility, and a huge shout out to Dylan Alcott who led the development of this strategy 
Employ My Ability, My Ability 2021 to 2031 is our national disability employment strategy that has a 10-year commitment for improving the employment outcomes for people with a disability. This program now needs to be energetically promoted and embraced and measured. Three, we have a draft national foundation skills strategy, draft being the operative word. This strategy urgently needs to be endorsed and implemented across the nation. Government investment in increasing the foundation skills of adults has a direct and positive impact on labour productivity and on economic growth, with the greatest impacts to be gained by investing in improving skills at the lower level. And a final but specific example that is indicative of some of the issues or barriers that are in place is the Apprenticeship Disabled Wage Support Program. Making the apprenticeship system more accessible for people with disabilities must be a key consideration for increasing workforce participation for all. The latest data from the National Centre for Vocational Education Research shows that people with disabilities make up less than 3.5 per cent of apprenticeship commencements in a calendar year. The existing Disabled apprenticeship, Australian Apprenticeship Wage Support Program could help, but it pays rate, its pay rates have lagged behind inflation. In fact, the last time they were reviewed was in 2002, 20 years ago, 2002, sorry, 20 years ago. So clearly it's time to have a look at that incentive. In conclusion, success in raising participation amongst disadvantaged groups is not just about increasing hires. It is also about the experience in the workplace, about retaining people and about equipping people with generic and specific skills that will help their continuing participation. Employers can play an important role in these areas, but they can't do it alone. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Megan. Over to you, Peter. I too would like to acknowledge that we meet in, in the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present here today. Danny, I'd like to think um, I look younger than I am. I've been working at ACOS long term on long term unemployment. I remember the last government to commit to restore full employment. It was the Keating government in 1993. Back then, the unemployment rate was 12 per cent. There were 350,000 people on unemployment payments for over a year. Reducing long-term unemployment was the centrepiece of that government's working nation statement. There are two big differences between then and now. I'll start with the good news. With unemployment at 3.4 per cent, full employment is within reach. We can't be complacent about this, but as there's no sign of a wage price spiral, we have more room to deal with inflation and labour and skills shortages without repeating the tragic errors of the past and sacrificing more people to unemployment. The bad news is this. Because we tolerated high unemployment for too long and changes to income support rules brought many new people into the labour market, older women, people with disability and sole parents, without providing the support they needed to succeed, there are now 760,000 people long-term on unemployment payments. 760,000 people. Something's clearly not working in the labour market and our employment services when employers are crying out for workers but three quarters of a million people can't secure a job. One problem is that at a time when the share of entry-level jobs is diminishing, Almost 60 per cent have Year 12 qualifications or less. These are the people who always stood at the end of the unemployment queue and they're still there now. We can and must do better. Now I'm going to zero in on the vital role of employment services. Despite the reforms proposed by the Employment Services Expert Panel of which I was a member, in my view, the new system called Workforce Australia is still burdened with four key problems that weighed down the previous system called Job Active. One, 
Job Active was more of an employment payment compliance system than an employment service. It sent people out into the labour market when they didn't find jobs, told them to search harder. People were literally told it's not our role to find you a job. Two, instead of a clear pathway to employment, the system locked people into an endless cycle of make busy activities like work for the doll, Mickey Mouse training courses and the community development program in remote First Nations communities. Three, the system reached about 10% of employers and offered them little assistance. And fourth, the system followed a work first logic that people must take the first available job and not invest too much time training for a career. So here's how we can seize this opportunity to reduce long-term unemployment and help employers fill vacancies. One, the vast majority of people don't need to be pressured to seek employment. Replacing the heavy-handed compliance system with a lighter touch would improve people's self-esteem and mental health no end and free up resources to invest in an employment service that makes a difference. Two, work more closely with employers. Some of the most effective programs, such as the Launch Into Work program, for example, are demand-led. They start with the job and work backwards to find the right person amongst people unemployed long-term, offer accredited training, properly paid work trials, and a guarantee of employment at the end if, if they succeed. Three, replace ineffective make busy programs with a flexible jobs and training offer for people unemployed long term. That would include such things as well targeted wage subsidies, combinations of paid employment experience and training, accredited vocational training for jobs in demand, and foundation education and help with health and social barriers to employment for those who need it. Four, support and don't obstruct people who want to pursue higher qualifications to improve their career prospects. If a sole parent wants to train as a nurse, encourage them. Don't push them onto a lower payment if they undertake, if they dare to undertake more than 12 months of full-time study. We need more nurses and they'll have much better employment prospects if they complete the course. Peter, you have one minute. Okay. Finally, as we've heard in the last session, if people are going to repeatedly put themselves in front of employers and perform in job interviews and jobs, they have to be confident in themselves. They also have to be confident that they have enough income to put food on the table and pay the rent. Poverty isolates people and turns them inwards. We're supposed to have a social security system. This is not the Hunger Games. At $46 a day, Australia has the lowest unemployment payment in the OECD. We want it increased to $70 a day. And to finish, I'll throw out a few challenges to all of you. To employers, it's one you've received already. Consider people you haven't in the past and consciously recruit for diversity. You'll be rewarded with a reliable workforce that challenges you to work in new ways. To unions, support diversity in employment, as I know you do, and transitional pathways for people at the end of the unemployment queue, provided workplace relations standards are not undermined. And to government, change the system. Convert the present compliance heavy employment services system into a service that works for unemployed people and employers. And Thank don't repeat the mistakes of the past and sacrifice people to the gods of inflation control and then punish them with poverty. Thank you, Peter. Over to you, Travis. Thanks, Danny. Hi, everyone. Uh, can I start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people and paying my respects to Elders past and present and to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the room and watching online. Uh, I'm conscious of time, Danny, and that it's Friday afternoon and you've been here for a day and a half, so I might just flip the script for a little bit and ask you to imagine, of all places, that you're not in the Great Hall, but you're at a circus. And I choose that analogy because it was the metaphor of the trapeze artist 
that Ben Chifley used in 1945 when there was a push for full employment to describe the Australian social security ideal. And he said, the trapeze artist's net protects him through the whole course of his life. The net is not, of course, part of the main show. That goes on high above, and the higher it goes, the better we enjoy it. But anyone who has seen an artist miss his hold knows what peace of mind the constant presence of the net means to performers and audience alike. So it is with social security. The modern ideal is that there should be social security provisions to protect every citizen in his or her emergencies from the cradle to the grave. And I want you to think about that net in Australia right now, the one we've all needed through COVID. For too many Australians, as, as we heard earlier, if you're disconnected from the education system or you're thrown off the jobs ladder, you fall into a net where you don't bounce but you sink. It's a net where you're sentenced to interact with a broken employment services system, where mutual obligation and activity tests and income support can trap you into deeper cycles of disadvantage instead of opening the doors of opportunity and equipping you to walk through those doors. I was really proud of Shema and Nate earlier, um, who we've supported at the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, where there are over 2,500 staff and volunteers focused on key transition points across the life course. And the experience is that interacting with the employment services system can feel much more like a trap than a trampoline. It's simply not designed to build capability and confidence in the places and situations that disadvantaged job seekers find themselves. Places where the things you need to build a career, like transport, early learning, housing, care, and training are often lacking. Peter has described the over 770,000 people, including 110, 111,000 young people who are in the Workforce Australia system. And that number is still up 26% since before COVID. And I think, and I'm sorry to say this, but Workforce Australia is a bit like the $7 billion elephant in the circus. And BSL's view is that unfortunately, disadvantaged job seekers would be better off overall if Workforce Australia is given the boot. We need a better system and a better deal for those job seekers. I want to give two examples of where it can work for employers and for employees. So the first, and we've heard some examples in the last session, is where there's proactive business engagement. So at BSL, we're working with around 130 employers of all shapes and sizes in our Given the Chance program and with Jobs Victoria to build career pathways for job seekers who are marginalised in the labour market. And these employers, like ANZ, Arup, Scalzo Foods, the North East Link, want to build pathways for Australians, young Australians, people with disability, people exiting the criminal justice system, and migrants and refugees whose talents we have underutilised. They want their operations to look, look more like their communities and support their communities. And while some have been incentivised by social inclusion targets from the Victorian government through capital projects, these employees are regarded by the employers as among their best. When Shane Elliott started at ANZ and vis visited all of his sites, he found that often the employee that was put forward was a given the chance employee from a bilingual refugee background who spoke languages of more of their customers and could connect them much more effectively with their communities. I hope the employers here, private and public, are prepared to sign up to much more ambitious social inclusion employment targets. And the second example goes to how we can create much better partnerships at local and regional level. So BSL convenes the National Youth Employment Body and its network of community investment committees. They're in places like Logan, Shoalhaven, Warrnambool. And these are genuine partnerships between government, employers, training providers, employment services, and young people to build pathways that benefit them, employers, and local communities. These groups have worked together to engage young people into careers supporting people with disability and older people in Australia. We're seeing similar place-based approaches to build agricultural careers 
and to build sustainable economic empowerment and dignity for women. The problem is that these approaches have been the exception, not the rule, and we haven't doubled down on the regional and community job deals that can really make them thrive. We need to reimagine how government, business, educators and unions can work much more effectively in place. This is what uh, the brilliant economist, we had a brilliant economist yesterday morning, Danielle, um, but another brilliant economist, Mariana Mazzucato, means when she talks about a mission economy and an entrepreneurial state. And if we can do that, if this group can do that, we'll have a lot more trampolines than we have poverty traps. Thank you, Thank you very much, Travis. And I do love the idea of us in a circus tent. I think that's brilliant. Um, this is, uh, the panel speakers have given you and hopefully started to uh, get you thinking about what are the things that need to change. Um, we now have a number of people who are in the audience um, who are experts. What I implore you, please, who are speaking, can you stick to two minutes? There will be prizes for under two minutes. Uh, so if you can achieve that, that would be better. Um, and our first speaker is Mohammed Al Kafaji, who is uh, from the Federation of Ethnic Community Councils of Australia. Thank you. I'd like to start by acknowledging that uh, I am on the lands of uh, First Nations people, and as a former uh, refugee and a migrant, um, uh, I'd like to um, put my sense of appreciation for being welcomed here in Australia. Um, I'd like to share some of the conversations that came out of the many roundtables with the culturally and linguistically diverse communities and the sector, and this also includes issues around migration. Um, the recent census shows us that about half, half of Australians were either born overseas or have at least one parent born overseas. We're a proud multicultural and migra migrant nation. Discrimination and unconscious bias are a problem in Australia. It's everyone's responsibility to ensure that we devise strategies to deal with these harmful and discriminatory behaviours. We all must ensure there are strategies to ensure culturally and linguistically diverse Australians are represented in all aspects of business and society. You set targets for everything else. Please don't ignore the culturally and linguistically diverse communities. Multicultural communities' unique skills, including their ability to work in bilingual and bicultural settings, especially in the care workforce, must be meaningfully recognised and remunerated. We also need to support specialist service providers who know how to work with multicultural communities in a culturally safe and responsive manner. We also need a whole of government approach to access and equity that delivers for our communities. On migration, in recent years, Australia's reputation as a welcoming and inclusive nation has been bruised. At the height of COVID-19, we told temporary visa holders to go back home and that we will not be supporting them with JobKeeper. That was unwise and short-sighted. And now, Australia, like many other countries around the world, is competing for talent, and we are asking those people to come back here. Sadly, we lost those people to countries like Canada, but we can fix it. We can rebuild our reputation again as a welcoming nation, and that starts with our political leaders setting the tone. We need the government to be proactive and intentional about publicly celebrating the value and benefits of migration and multiculturalism. We also need to address serious issues like migrant worker exploitation, which we've discussed uh, earlier today. The unions and many peak bodies have made solid recommendations on how to do this. We Thank you, Mohammed. Um, can we move over to Caroline Hodge, please, of People with Disability Australia? Thank you, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we meet on today, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to thank the government for engaging in co-design with people with disability at the various forums held in the lead up to this summit. This is important because people with disability are the experts on the actions that need to be taken to turn around long-standing and high rates of unemployment they have experienced for decades. What we heard in those forums informs the actions I'll now highlight. Firstly, we need to ensure that people with disability receive an income that is no less than the minimum wage. People with disability working in Australian disability enterprises can earn as little as $2.37 per hour. This can't continue. 
Secondly, we need a transition plan to end segregated employment and provide people working in disability enterprises with a pathway to open employment with at least minimum wages. Thirdly, reforms to the disability support pension could see employment disincentives removed and provide a safety net for people as they take on more paid work. And it's been great to hear that that's been supported by a lot of speakers this morning. Lifelong eligibility for the DSP could remove the fear that taking on employment will prevent people from accessing the DSP in future if they need to, and increased income-free areas and reduced taper rates would allow them to keep more of the income they earn. We also need improvements to disability employment services so outcomes focus on supporting people with disability into meaningful jobs they're interested in and are likely to result in a career, not just any job. Finally, to all the employers here today, both public and private, we need you to be disability ready. I encourage you to reflect on the steps you're taking or can take to recruit, retain and develop people with disability in leadership positions, on your boards, in all levels of your business, including but not limited to entry level positions. We need a critical mass of people with disability in all areas of our workforce if we are to challenge long-standing high rates of unemployment. If you aren't sure where to start, I encourage you to work with a diverse range of people with disability, from First Nations people, people from LGBTIQIA, and cold communities to co-design your disability inclusion and employment strategies. That way, you'll be consulting with the experts. Thank you, Thank you Carolyn. And over to Andrew McKellar from the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Well, thank you very much, uh, Danielle. And indeed, can I acknowledge the uh, deep expertise and experience uh, on the panel uh, that is here today. And also, uh, I think the very powerful personal testimonies that we heard in the previous uh, panel, which was, I think, extremely moving and thought provoking. Uh, my perspective uh, now is uh, from a small business uh, point of view. Uh, small business owners who are struggling to find workers skilled or unskilled to fill the hundreds of thousands of job vacancies uh, out there at the moment. At a roundtable uh, last week with Small Business Minister Collins, uh, we heard from many small businesses about the challenges that they are facing. There simply aren't enough applicants, or in, in some cases no applicants, for the jobs they advertise. Small business owners are trying to find staff any way they can, using word of mouth, signs on windows, posts on social media and online ads, etc. Uh, one mechanism they are not using anywhere near enough is turning to the publicly funded employment services to fill their vacancies. And there are many reasons for this. There's not been a consistent or single point of contact. There's confusion caused by the constant changes of name of the system, uh, they can be annoyed by the receipt of clearly unsuitable uh, applications and when employers do reach out to the services, they've often been disappointed that the referred applicants have not met the core requirements or they don't show up for the interview. We fundamentally need to address the disconnect by in this disconnect by ensuring that the system reaches, uh, reaches out to the vacancies where they exist and offer a value-added service uh, to small business. In times of such low unemployment uh, and such great employer need, there's never been a better opportunity uh, for those that face significant barriers to get back into the workforce. Uh, we also need to overcome the employer's perception of risk in taking on a job seeker who has limited experience or who has been disconnected from the workforce for many years. Uh, although we recognise the government has discontinued the PATH program, it needs to be replaced by other programs that will enable the job seeker uh, and the employer to confirm that the relationship is uh, workable and ensures that the job seeker undertakes con concurrent vocational training with the hosted work experience. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, can we please go to Margie Osmond, Tourism and Transport Forum. Uh, thank you very much and I acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners, the Ngunnawal people, and thank them for hosting us on their land for this incredibly important gathering. 
Right up front, I have to say on behalf of the industries that I represent, we want to activate and enable more Australians to work with us in the visitor economy. We have huge job vacancies and future skills needs, and we see the local marketplace as largely the answer. My colleague Stephen Ferguson from the Australian Hotels Association and TTF, we've both been very vocal and active on the need to stimulate those local solutions. Older workers, women, First Nations people, school leavers, and importantly, people living with a disability and refugees. They're desperately needed by the visitor economy family. We completely endorse Minister Rithworth's comments on the positive power of diverse workforces, and we're looking forward to working with her to build on current industry programs to generate stronger, more diverse working community within our visitor economy. We're also keen to work with the government on First Nations people and create new pathways. This is a natural partnership. We're a people industry, and that means all people. If I can just very quickly, though, respond to some earlier sessions. We have some very short-term needs, too, in terms of working holiday makers and international students, and it is going to take some incentives. We really need to look at the visa fee for people to enter Australia. New Zealand's is half of ours, and many other countries in the world have chosen to waive the fees completely to get those workers here. We could also lift the age to 50, and then we get access to a whole new group of more skilled workers. I do really want to congratulate the government, though, on the changes they've talked about today, and we're so happy to hear their commitment to renovating the plane while it is in the air, something that no one in the tourism sector would normally say. Um, can I also put a special shout out for the arts and cultural communities and the events sectors who desperately need those changes very quickly to the visa systems? And one final point about future jobs. We're a long haul destination. People coming here, they expect that to be a sustainable experience. Things like sustainable aviation fuel, which our aviation players like Qantas Virgin and our airports are heavily involved in. This is an area where we are going to need to be able to measure, design, manage, innovate for Thanks, future Maggie. environmental reality. Thank you. Thank you. Can I please uh, go to now Mickey Wadengalumara from Arnhem Land Progress Aboriginal Corporation. Uh, good afternoon. Nambri Numa, Bukma. Thanking the Fumadilada speaking in your country. Alpa primary focus for the last 50 years has been supporting Yolngu people to become financial independent of welfare through encouragement, empowering, and building suitable business. Yolngu people has been always engaged in the economic and want, want, I want you to know that the Aboriginal people do not want to depend on welfare. They want jobs and support their family and to see with, I've seen with my own eyes, which we used we to do many things for ourselves rather than people coming outside to our community and building, flying and building and doing as, as we do. To enable this, we need to make sure the policy is setting and the next employment service program are right. That is, recognizing and investing in needs and in building in remote Australia. For structures and economic, sharing the indigenous people to employ and to provide real jobs and real wages and real future, not depending on the government of the day policy. We need to make sure the indigenous people that live in remote areas are not left behind. There are 70,000 people living in remote Australia who can be engage to the economic and, the, and just the need to right environment to do this. 
Ngayong umana pa naman means in a young umata is understanding and trusting one another. We need to build the trust and understand between our government and indigenous Australians to get the best outcome for the remote Australians and the, and the better future for our people. I have come to share my experience and how we can do this. I also in, encourage you to come and visit me to see and for yourself. I promise it, it is more warmer than Canberra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mickey. Can we hear from Luke Riken, please, Australian Youth Affairs Coalition? Thank you. I want to acknowledge country as well, meeting on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. Sovereignty was never ceded and it always was and always will be Aboriginal lands. I also want to thank you, Minister Rishworth, and of course, Minister Anna Lee, for your commitment to young people and establishing an office for youth. This government's already been in that work of genuinely listening to young people, and we did that through the roundtables. The government did a really good job of paying the young people who participated in those roundtables. The roundtables were designed by young people and they were facilitated by young people, and every business here can do the same thing. We can't talk about jobs and skills without recognising the current employment market for young people. The unemployment rate for us is more than double that of the general population, and the experience of too many young people is of casual, insecure and low-paid work that doesn't set them up for a meaningful career. A long-term failure to prioritise employment outcomes for young people alongside economic downturns has fundamentally restructured our experience at work. We are now facing increasing casualisation and a steady decline in the availability of entry-level jobs. And if we let this trend continue, we will all be worse off. We can't realise the benefits of full employment and a strong economy if the entry into the workforce is broken for all of us. There are more than 2.2 million young people in the workforce. They have the highest level of educational attainment than any generation before them. We've been speaking about the skills gap and young people are highly skilled and they need the support of everyone in this room, the businesses in this room, to take up the next employment opportunities. And we heard three recommendations to make this happen at the roundtables. Firstly, there needs to be a specific focus on young people in the white paper and the outcomes that follow this summit. And I'm sorry to the team at Treasury, but there should be a full chapter on young people, and that's what we want to see. This must address the increase in casualisation and ensure that young people can also benefit from full employment. Secondly, we've heard a lot this morning about industry guarantees and wage subsidies, but we can't do these things in isolation. An appropriate solution that brings these concepts together is a youth jobs guarantee that ensures every young person has access to free training and is offered a paid internship or job within a short time after becoming unemployed. This is an evidence-based and internationally tested alternative to Workforce Australia and mutual obligations that will better support young people experiencing disadvantage. And finally, we need to create more paid and accessible work experience opportunities and full-time entry-level jobs for young people there are businesses here who can make that commitment today and they need to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Can I now throw to Elia de Marchelia from Every Australian Counts. She did try and pay me to get longer than two minutes, but uh, she can't today. <laughs> oh no, I thought uh, Dylan was picking up that bill, so um, it's all good. Uh, I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. <laughs> And I want to throw, as a campaigner, my strong support behind um, the campaign for a voice to parliament. Um, I want to begin by thanking the Prime Minister for the honour of an invitation and uh, to, Min uh, to Minister Shorten for the trust he has put in me um, to deliver the results of the NDIS Jobs and Skills Summit. I also want to start by acknowledging that even though I am a proud, disabled, queer woman, I come with incredible privilege. I didn't get my career, you won't be surprised, with sporting prowess. I got my career because I had a courageous, strong, groundbreaking woman who took a chance on me. I was the only disabled woman in the workplace. It certainly didn't always go right, 
but that woman fiercely protected me and we went in there every day and I did my job for her and she protected me. But I'm not here to ask you to give people with disability a chance. I'm demanding you give people with disability a chance. Dylan identified all the devastating statistics. I don't need to go through them again. What I'm here to give you are the solutions. These are the solutions that people with disability identified at the NDIS Jobs and Skills Summit. And Treasurer, you'll be pleased to know, not a lot of them attach money to it. Number one, we want all organisations, businesses, government agencies whose principal function is to work with disabled people to employ at least 15% of their workforce to be disabled people. Not only will that create jobs for people with disability, but that will mean the programs, the products, the services that are given to us are actually going to be informed by our lived experience. And accessibility isn't just good for people with disability. I don't know if you've ever pushed a pram up a side gutter, but it's much better if you have that little ramp. Accessibility is great for everybody. I'm going to have to finish you there, Ellie. I just want to tell you that the, uh, Dylan said yesterday th that today is the moment. No, today is the moment you decide whether you are on the right side of history. And the train is leaving the station. Bold leadership is all that is needed. The solutions are already here. Thanks, Ellie. And we'll quickly move to Jade Ritchie, Unions Northern Territory. Thank you. I'm from the Bunda clan of the Gurang Gurang Nation. I pay my respects to the Ngunnawal people and I thank their ancestors for keeping me safe while I'm here. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and to their emerging leaders. I stand with you in solidarity to make the changes necessary for us and our future generations to thrive. We cannot discuss workforce participation challenges without acknowledging First Nations women, particularly those in remote communities, face unique challenges that need to be considered to ensure they are able to engage in meaningful employment. Challenges that, by and large, go unnoticed. Challenges that we need to make visible in this conversation and those to follow. Those challenges include, but are not limited to, culturally appropriate childcare arrangements, cultural obligations, geographical remoteness, gaps and the misalignment of mainstream education and training, and the need for flexibility to accommodate traditional family roles. We must shift the conversation from minimum wage to living wage. A living wage that acknowledges the vast difference in the cost of living in remote communities. We need to recognise the skills and remunerate accordingly for the roles that women are already playing in their communities. Aged care, disability, mental health and social support roles. The traditional roles of healers and carers. Let First Nations women broker solutions to workforce participation challenges in our own communities by establishing a voice to parliament enshrined in the constitution. First Nations women are the key to unlocking the indigenous estates, the key to locally grown and capable workforces. We have the lived experience and the knowledge, and if we continue to be silenced on the issues that affect us, the opportunity will be missed. There's nothing more powerful when it comes to national policy for First Nations women than to give us a voice. Thank you, Jade. A voice that we called for in the Uluru Statement. Ah, thank you. And finally, Speaker Luke Anir from Safety Culture. 
good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we meet upon and um, also pay my respects to uh, elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I was a workers' compensation investigator involved in 2,500 cases where I saw the incredible toll that uh, injuries take on people and, uh, and their families and the rest of the community around them. Uh, I decided I wanted to do something about that and I created safety culture from my garage up in Townsville and uh, with the help of, of one other mate we uh, set about naively thinking that we could change the way the world works. Today, 65,000 companies use Safety Culture's products. Every time a plane takes off, every time a hotel room is checked, or a uh, car is built, the chances are that we were part of that process. Uh, I think some of the challenges that we see you know, here affect regional Australia as much as the, the cities as well. And um, there was a recent roundtable uh, disability and employment um, discussion that was hosted by uh, Minister Rishworth. And, um, uh, one of the ideas that was floated uh, from the Tech Council of Australia was to be able to provide virtual work experience for everyone in Australia to be able to get access to today's jobs and the jobs that are coming for tomorrow so that they can experience what it's like to be in those jobs and decide for themselves what value they bring and get a better understanding of what's involved. So I'd like to propose uh, that we are able to move that forward with the help of the government and uh, make that as, as a submission that can be uh, adopted. It would be fully funded by the Tech Council of Australia and it's something that we can do. We uh, ironically have had a lot of funding in the tech industry. Safety Culture's had over $300 million uh, put into it and a lot of that money comes from the superannuation of our previous generation. So we take that responsibility seriously that we are working uh, you know, on the shoulders of those that have come before us. Final thing I just want to say is there's been some talk of the numbers of women at this uh, summit, particularly uh, compared to the 1983 forum. Numbers are great, but I'd also like to note the quality of the contributions that have been submitted over the last day and a half, with role models like Catherine Livingston, Robin Denholm, and uh, all the others that have spoken. I think uh, we have a very bright future in front of us, and uh, we're going to see more wonderful contributions ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luke. And can you keep that round of applause going for the panel members and everyone who spoke from the floor? Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, this is our final session for the day. Um, if anyone's wondering whether we're running a bit of behind time, we are. Uh, but we've got um, measures in place. We're going to uh, have a working lunch um, at your desks uh, where the Prime Minister and the Treasurer will um, conclude over lunch. So we will finish, hopefully, around, around on time, around on time, famously last words, no doubt. Um, but for now, I'd like to introduce the final session Policy levers to increase workforce participation. The panellists are Dr Angela Jackson, the lead economist, impact economics and policy, Professor Jeff Borland, University of Melbourne, uh, distinguished Professor Sarah Charlesworth at RMIT University, and Matthew Cox, the executive director of the Bryan Foundation. Uh, I'm going to hand back to um, the Honourable Minister, Amanda Rishworth, for opening remarks. Well, thank you very much, and we're very, very lucky to ha have a, a distinguished panel to really talk about uh, a really long-term discussion of what, what are some of the policy levers um, that we might be able to look at, and this is really a start of a, a longer-term conversation, but we need to start the conversation now. So I think um, when we're talking workforce participation and entrenched barriers to employment, we've heard some of the things in previous sessions about about services and programs, but now we're really getting into the big levers. So I did want to start with a Dr Angela Jackson. Angela, you've spent your entire working career as an economist, working across tax, fiscal and social policy. Uh, you've worked in government, but you've also authored a number of high-profile reports on health, aged care, disability, housing and gender policy. What do you see as some of the drivers of participation more generally, and what barriers do you think those of us in the room today are not seeing? 
Uh, look, thank you, Minister Ridgeworth, and I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners on the lands where we meet today, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects uh, to all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders in the room. Now, as an economist, I spend a lot of time, some might say too much time, uh, thinking about how financial incentives influence decisions, and the decision to work is no exception. We know that we can lift participation if we lift wages. We know that we can lift participation by reducing high effective marginal tax rates through replacing household with individual means tests and reducing taper rates on government payments. Payments such as the age pension, where older Australians face losing 50 cents in the dollar if they work more than one day a week. We know that we can lift participation by reducing income tax. Well, at least for low and middle income earners, we won't discuss those stage three tax cuts right now. And we know we can lift participation through reducing the cost of childcare. But as an economist, I also know, as we heard so powerfully this morning, there is more to participation than just financial incentives. That an individual's choice and ability to engage in work is driven by a multitude of structural factors. Structural factors that we often dismiss as out of our control, when in fact we have may way well have created them through our policy choices. Which is where the wellbeing budget framework, announced by our Treasurer and already implemented in a number of countries internationally, becomes so important. A wellbeing budget is not just about measuring life expectancy or happiness, and some of you might be disappointed to know it involves no yoga poses at all. <laughs> A wellbeing budget allows us to identify, to measure and to evaluate policies and government spending against the key drivers of an individual's ability to participate in their family, in their society and, importantly for everyone here today, in the economy. Drivers such as educational attainment, gender equity, mental health and housing security. A wellbeing budget framework will give us the tools to systematically dismantle the structural barriers to participation and work. Structural barriers like the childcare subsidy activity test that contributes to 128,000 children in our poorest households, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, missing out on early childhood education and care. Education that we know would increase their future participation and productivity. The activity test also places additional barriers in the form of administrative complexity and the risk of overpayment in the way of parents participating today. Structural barriers like our paid parental leave scheme that by not quarantining adequate dad's leave does not proactively support both parents to become skilled carers, making it harder for women to choose paid work because they carry the lion's share of unpaid work in the household. Structural barriers like the abysmally low rate of the unemployment benefit, which, we, which while arguably increases financial incentives from work, unforgivably undermines the ability of people to choose work because it puts job seekers in abject poverty. Poverty we know increases rates of poor mental health, which is so clearly linked to the ability of people to engage in work. Structural barriers like homelessness, where we choose not to invest adequately in social housing and as a result thousands of Australians spend every day looking for somewhere to sleep at night that is safe rather than looking for a job. The list goes on and my core message is that we have a real opportunity with this summit and this new wellbeing budget framework to systematically dismantle both financial and non-financial barriers in Australia that are limiting people's ability to participate in society and work. And I'm obviously progressing that we propose to do so, and I'll hand over. Excellent, thank you very much. Really, uh, I think, um, exciting. Did you want to just, uh, Angela, elaborate on the well uh, wellbeing budget and what opportunity you really think that that can deliver to Australia? Look, I, and I know I am a budget geek, and I admit that, and, and people in the room who know me know me as a budget geek, and perhaps I put too much faith in a budget process. But what, a budget, what the wellbeing budget will do is it will set up the domains that really matter in terms of lifting productivity and participation and wellbeing of the Australian people. 
It will set measures uh, that we can, you know, both in terms of you know, be aiming for, but also hold us accountable in terms of policy. And it will provide that real framework when we develop policy to know exactly what we're aiming for. The reality is at the moment, while we say we're aiming for GDP, that's a little bit opaque. And policies can really come into a bit of a vacuum. It can be the issue of the day. You know, there's a Royal Commission, we have a big aged care push, but then it gets forgotten. What the framework will do is year in, year out, hold us accountable to the things that really matter in terms of lifting our participation, productivity and overall levels of wellbeing. Well, thank you very much. Now I'll move to Professor Jeff Borland. Um, now you've received the annual Distinguished Fellow Award from the Economic Society of Australia in 2020 and your current teaching fields include microeconomics. Can you uh, give us your thoughts on the need to identify groups and collect evidence where there are opportunities and where there are opportunities to lift participation? Thanks very much, Minister. Thanks for the invitation to be on the panel. And yeah, I'd like to begin as well by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting and to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. So um, yeah, as you'd expect, I think evidence is, is important. I think evidence identifies the groups for whom we're best able or feel it's most important to achieve increases in participation. But I want to emphasise that I think at the moment the evidence is telling us that the, the biggest gains we can realise are amongst groups who are already in the labour force but whose labour isn't being made the best use of. I think we saw a brilliant example of that in the first panel in, the session, in, in this session where we had people who would be counted as being in the labour force but who are experiencing barriers in having their labour used to its potential. Similarly for the long-term unemployed, a great outcome at the moment is that long-term unemployment is 58,000 less than it was in March 2020. But if you compare with earlier periods when the rate of unemployment was 4% or below, that's actually higher than we would have expected. We might have expected another 45,000 people who are long-term unemployed to be in work. In this situation, an elevated rate of long-term unemployment relative to the rate of unemployment has now existed since the mid-2010s. So again, this is a group who are counted as being in the labour force, but who we're not giving the best opportunity to get into work. Third example, you know, which has obviously been a really major um, theme, is the female workforce. As long as we have no change in occupational segregation, then we won't be um, making uh, the most of increases in female participation. In the last 35 years, there's been virtually no change in occupational segregation. Uh, to give you one piece of evidence, a larger proportion of the female workforce today are working in jobs where 70% or more of the hours worked are done by females than was the case 35 years ago. In, in, in female dominated occupations, there's been virtually no change in 35 years. In male dominated occupations, there's been some change, but obviously not across all those occupations. So I think we need to use evidence, we need to use it to direct us to where labour force participation can increase. But I think it's importantly we need to use it to direct us where uh, available labour can be uh, best utilised. And what are some of those underrepresented groups do you think that really we have an opportunity to drive in addition to women's workforce participation? Well, I think it's the um, it, it's, um, groups that we, we've been hearing about sort of um, you know, um, during the summit. Um, you know, the, the groups, I guess, who I've mentioned, the first group we've heard about people with disabilities, uh, long-term um, unemployed, um, you know, uh, refugees, um, you know, people from um, with, um, uh, uh, yeah, that, 
Those are examples. Sort of. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll move now to Matthew Cox. Um, Matthew, I know you've got a key interest in uh, the early years, the early childhood. We've heard a lot about uh, childcare and early education. Um, of course, you've worked with the Bryan Foundation and you've spent 10 years uh, at the Red Cross. How do you think um, the community sector, um, philanthropic organisations, business and government can work to break down some of the barriers to employment? Thanks, Amanda. I'd like to acknowledge country and elders. Um, look, when it comes to economic exclusion, I think the conversation that's worth having is how do we make things better at scale and for the long term? And I think that sort of starts with an understanding of the task. So a reasonable estimate of uh, people who live with disadvantage in their lives every day is about 6% of Australians, a bit more than 1 in 20. It's about 1 in 1.5 1 million folks. Uh, those folks live overwhelmingly in certain postcodes, certain towns and suburbs across our community. Uh, uh, to give you uh, about 3% of postcodes, in fact, uh, bear the preponderance of uh, disadvantage in our community. And just to give you a sense of how concentrated that can be, in my home state of Queensland, about half of folks, about 46% of folks who aren't doing as well as we would like, live in just three places and they're the satellite cities around Brisbane, Ipswich, Logan and Caboolture. So that's our task. Uh, and what I'd like us to think about is how we can turn up in those places and be relevant and have long-term plans to turn things around for everyone for the long term. So the first thing we have to do is turn up in those places in the right way. We have to engage with local people and local conditions. Australia's a really diverse place. So there's very, the, with the needs of kids and families in what air are very different to the needs of kids and families in Mount Druitt or Elizabeth or Sejuna or Mildura or Shepparton, where long-term place-based responses are all underway. So that's the first thing we have to do. We have to come in and turn up in the right way and think about how we can engage with local conditions and local people and start thinking about these long-term social and economic development plans that are right for those communities. The second thing we have to do is do human development things. We have to build human capital. We have to build human capability in these places. This is the answer to everything. Probably the easiest way to understand that is the human life course. So from birth through the early years, through the school years, not into adulthood, this is the journey we all make. And the more opportunities uh, for things to go right that we can put in front of people on that life journey, uh, and the more adverse experiences we can avoid or help people avoid, then we start to stack the odds in our favour that that life journey is going to go well. So this is a knowable, scalable and doable idea, I think. And the more people for whom that life journey goes well, if we can start to get that to scale in these communities, that's when large-scale social change really starts to take hold. And you get really positive social norms that create their own weather, and that's when things really take off. So uh, in that zero to 25 journey, the science is pretty clear that the place to strike, the most economically efficient place to strike, the place where you get the best bang for your buck is in the early years. And there's two reasons for that. One is you can get a result with kids. That's a lot harder to get with adults. And the second thing is uh, those kids carry those benefits through the rest of their life. So the early years, uh, is a massive uh, investment in the early years is a massive economic as well as a social uh, obligation and opportunity. And I've been delighted to see the discussion around the early years over the last couple of days, the big moves that Victoria and New South Wales, to some extent Queensland have made in recent months. It's really wonderful uh, public policy. But I want to have, uh, I want to leave you with one note of caution. Uh, pulling these big universal levers like early years investment. That's a wonderful thing to do. But uh, the rising tide will not necessarily lift all boats in the communities that I'm talking about. We need to do extra and special, different and clever things that are locally engaged using these place-based approaches. And then we can use the resources that we have through these big universal systems and customise and uh, amplify their, their effects in local places. So that's pretty much the formula, I think, for large-scale social change. Human development, particularly focused on the early years, in places where most poor folks live, most economically excluded folks live. 
What does it turn into? It turns into some wonderful things. It turns into child and family centres, like the brilliant network of child and family centres they've built in Tasmania. It turns into intergenerational schools, where, like the ones we're trying to build in Queensland, where you can enrol you and your family at birth, and it's a birth to graduation experience with stuff for kids, stuff for adults, and it's a whole centre of community life. So these intergenerational school models, our place model in uh, Victoria, another fantastic uh, example. And these are wonderful nurturing places that help kids do well, help parents do well, help the community do, do well. So that's, what, that's the plan, that's what we're interested in doing. Uh, and Amanda, I might, I've, I've got a bit more to say about how we might get started and where we might go over, say, a 25-year period. Uh, but I'll hold it there and I'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, well, thank you. I might go straight to you and uh, actually ask the question about what does this partnership look like? This We're talking place-based intervention, meeting the needs of a local community, but of course you've got to have a lot of partners in that. You talk about uh, leveraging off universal systems, but how, what does true partnership look like in that? Well, look, I'll give you... Um a place that I think we should start. So uh, uh, last week I wrote to uh, the Treasurer uh, with about a dozen of my colleagues who are CEOs of other philanthropic foundations around the country uh, and we made an offer and we said we're prepared to put in hundreds of millions of dollars of our own money, our own private money, uh, probably billions, uh, if we can agree a early childhood uh, plan that really uh, burrows in and attacks the social conditions in these places that I'm talking about. So that's the plan we're interested in. Uh, the office on the table, um, we very much think that that's a beginning. We think that uh, our corporate leaders, other philanthropists around the country can probably help us get a lot further down the track than that. But that's our starting point. And that's how we could get started. We're impatient. We'd like, we reckon we can start before Christmas. We can get that money flowing to projects that make a difference for kids. So that's the... Um, the short-term answer. The long-term answer is I think if we want an intergenerational change then we've got to think in intergenerational timescales. So I think we should think about a 25-year plan, uh, maybe chopped up into five-year sub-plans so we can give it a go, see how we go, then go again. Uh, and I'd like to think that in the 2040s, by the time that the new uh, subs are hitting the water, and clearly we can think long-term in other areas of public policy, uh, that we can have saved so much money from the economic uplift we'll get from investing in our kids and our families that we'll be able to pay for the entire fleet of submarines with those savings. And I've even got a name for this scheme. I think it's the Healthy Bubs for New Subs scheme. <laughs> and uh, Treasurer, um, if you've uh, not already thrown out the back in black mugs that you might have found in your office, don't do that, hold on to those mugs, because I think we could replace them uh, with an attractive little sticker that says healthy bubs equals free subs. And uh, I've, I've mocked one up, here it is, the healthy bubs equals free stop subs coffee cup. <laughs> and I think this could be a wonderful bit, a memento of the summit, and we could, uh, I think, rally Australia around a coffee cup like that, and this could be official summit uh, merchandise. <laughs> Excellent. Well, the great news is that the uh, now government has committed to an early years strategy. So we look forward to, uh, I'm sure the Treasurer particularly, looks forward to seeing that extra money invested. So thank you very much for that. Um, okay, we will now go to Professor Sarah Charlesworth. Uh, you're a professor at RMIT and your work is centred around gender inequality. You're a panel member on the 2012 ACTU independent inquiry into secure work and an advisor to the Australian Human Rights Commission. So we have talked about gender at this summit and some of the uh, issues around care, uh, but tell us a little bit more about how you see gender as a barrier to employment. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, and before I respond, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the unceded lands on which we're meeting today, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to the First Nations people here. So gender, of course, is absolutely crucial. As long as women in Australia continue to 
uh, as Angela has pointed out, to shoulder the, uh, an unequal share of unpaid care. Gender is both, present, is both a problem, but it also presents um, possibilities. Today I want to draw on the uh, research evidence from members of the Work and Family Policy Roundtable, which I co-convene with Elizabeth Hill from the University of Sydney. And the Roundtable is a policy advocacy network comprised of over 30 gender work and care scholars across Australia. And I'd particularly like to acknowledge Senator Barbara Pocock, who's here in her previous incarnation as a preeminent uh, scholar, in, Australian scholar in this space, who founded the Roundtable back in 2005. Now, we very much, our work is very much about uh, reviewing and also generating research evidence around, around these problems. And our work shows absolutely that the work of unpaid care is a major barrier to workforce participation that sets up gender inequalities over the life course. Work is essential to human well-being and economic prosperity. And high quality care, both paid and unpaid, enables the development of human capabilities, well-being and economic productivity. An inadequate investment in care services and supports for carers, uneven coverage of paid leave for workers in insecure work, and low wages and poor working time conditions for the essential workers who keep our communities functioning, limit women's economic participation and weaken the economy. So what do we need? We need new integrated policy architecture that can better support individuals and families manage work and care across the life course to ensure that everyone has the right to work, to care and be cared for, to be treated with respect and be able to look forward to a dignified retirement. Now some key aspects of that policy infrastructure have already been covered. We've spoken uh, a bit at this summit about uh, extending paid parental leave, about quarantining a period of leave for uh, partners and fathers to incentivise shared care. And our view is that sole parents should also have access to that additional um, period of leave. We also need, and um, it's been interesting hearing Matthew really uh, drill down on the absolute importance of early childhood education and care, not only as a way of bringing women into the workforce, but of value in its own right in terms of its development of children. So, we think that we need a system of free, uh, publicly funded early childhood education and care that should be available for all children, regardless of parents' workforce participation, where they live, or their socioeconomic status. And we also need fair and equitable social protection measures that act as a buffer for periods out of the workforce over the life course and provide adequate income support through a permanent increase to job seeker and other income support payments. But even if we have all that in place, the reality for many women with caring responsibilities who are in paid work is that that work is insecure and unpredictable, and that really makes it much harder, not easier, to manage work and care, and leads to significant stress both for women and their families. So if we're really serious about unlocking the potential of women in the economy, we also need to establish a stronger foundation for decent work that's widely accessible to all workers and explicitly recognises the importance of unpaid care responsibilities and workers' lives. So that would include uh, a robust floor of universal worker rights through amendments to the Fair Work Act to protect all workers, no matter their contract status. It would include, for example, a right to a living wage, and that was mentioned in the last panel, and a secure predictable income, improved working time security in feminised sectors through a minimum floor of secure weekly working hours and continuous daily hours of work. No more split shifts. It's impossible to manage um, care if your work is fragmented across the day. We need an enforced cap on long working hours to increase men's opportunity for shared care. We have the most polarised gendered working time in the OECD in Australia. We also need to revitalise awards, skills and classification structures to reflect the, work of, um, the value of the work carried out by, work in, by workers in feminised sectors and to provide career progression in good jobs. And a right to paid leave, including carer's leave and personal leave. So if we had this policy and regulatory architecture in place, we could also meet Australia's commitments on the Sustainable Development Goals, not only on gender equality, but also on inclusive and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment and decent work. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, we, I am aware of the time, so we might. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to Helen to go through. Uh, I, I'm a bit. Uh, I don't want to cut anyone off, so I'll give it to the tough taskmaster, Helen, to go through the contributions from the floor before we sum up. Thanks, Amanda. Um, yes, we are running a bit behind, so um, please, on this occasion, um, if you can, uh, stick to the two minutes because um, that mystery person that doesn't turn up, turn the microphone off, is back um, and will turn your microphone off. Um, uh, my first uh, contribution is from Edwina MacDonald, who's the Acting Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Council of Social Services. Edwina. Thank you to the panellists and the participants who've shared their lived experiences and solutions with us today. We need processes that meaningfully include people directly affected, experts by experience, and ensure that their voices are at the centre of policy debate and development. As we talk about supporting people into paid work, and uh, um, sorry, as we talk about people, supporting people into paid work, how many of the participants here at the summit are currently unemployed or living in poverty? Across Australia, there's 930,000 people who are on unemployment payments, locked out of paid work. 930,000 people. We must acknowledge that the major barrier to employment that they face every day is simply not having enough money to survive, to pay the rent, to pay for medicine, and to cover three meals a day. Not having enough money to get a haircut, buy a new shirt, or travel to a job interview. Unconscionably low payments undermine physical health, mental health and self-esteem. Instead of lifting people up, our social security system is breaking people. A woman on youth allowance has told us, I feel like I'm seconds away from drowning at all times. Every time I step into a grocery store or look at my bank account, I lose a bit of myself. I'm thinking about money so often, I find it difficult to think about or do anything else. Keegan, who is on Job Seeker, has told me, they tell me to upskill so I can get a decent job that will last, but training takes time, and that means more time that I don't have enough money to get by on. I'm stuck at the bottom, scrambling for bottom-level short-term jobs just so I can survive. As set out in ACOS's joint statement with the BCA and the ACTU, a substantial increase to the rate of Job Seeker and related payments must be a priority coming out of this summit. We must increase payments to at least $70 a day so that our social security system stops being a barrier to workforce participation and stops driving people further into poverty. Thank you. Edwina, thank you so much. Um, Dr Ben Gauntlet, the Disability Discrimination Commissioner at the Australian Human Rights Commission. I wish to acknowledge and pay my deep respects to the traditional owners of the land, the Ngunnawal people. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, the participation rate for people with disability is and has remained at 53% for 28 years. The participation rate for people without disability in Australia is 83%. The participation rate for people with disability includes people legally employed at or around $3 per hour. The likelihood of a person with disability having graduated year 12 is half a person without disability. Furthermore, there is no formal education about disability in Australian schools. Is it reasonable to expect young people to discuss disability at work or alternatively work in the care economy after school when they learn about disability from television. Silence is a gateway to exclusion. Good disability policy benefits all Australians, but it is built upon a foundation of different levels of government working together and leaders within the community, whether it be in politics, business or philanthropy, appreciating the power of awareness raising language and intent. I wish to make five very brief points today concerning policy levers to increase workforce participation. First, we need a workplace disability equality agency 
to research, assess and promote how we recruit, retain and advance people with disability into long-term careers and economic participation. Second, we need a whole of community engagement on disability inclusion. Under 20 per cent of the top ASX listed companies have a disability action plan under the Disability Discrimination Act. This needs to change. Third, we need law reform. 50 per cent of all complaints made to the Australian Human Rights Commission concern disability discrimination, many of which are in employment. A better regulatory framework is needed, one which leads to systemic and long-lasting change. Fourth, the close analysis of the interrelationship of employment and training and other policy frameworks is needed, with an emphasis on data and local solutions. The entitlement to government support to live, for health care and housing is often compromised by an effort to pursue employment. We need to review and test whether the disability pension and associated policies are fit for purpose. Fifth, we need to embed people with disability in new industries and new projects through training and work opportunities. Disability is diverse and people with disability are diverse too. However, much like housing, it is best to build in universal design considerations up front. 4.4 million Australians presently live with disability and 2.65 million Australians have caring responsibilities. However, good disability policy benefits all Australians. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sam Mostyn, President of Chief Executive Women. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, in acknowledging the country we are on and its elders, I would also like to acknowledge that there's been much work conducted in the last few days around the summit by First Nations people and women particularly about the roles they will play in the very nature of the discussions we've been having and we'll welcome hearing from them after the summit. And I'd also like to acknowledge the fact that Linda Burney has joined us and to pay respects to Linda for her extraordinary leadership, not just on First Nations issues, but in leading a government that cares about the important things. So wonderful to see you. Linda. Um, I will try to be very, very brief, um, and fortunately I can do that because a long list of the uh, policy priorities that I would, like to, I would have spoken about have all been advocated by either a number of you around the summit since we started yesterday morning, I hope encouraged by Danielle Wood's wonderful um, opening that, that set out the, the problems ahead and how we can solve them, um, but also from the panel this afternoon. So to hear Danielle and Sarah and others, they are all the policy prescriptions that Chief Executive Women would like to see. Um, I'll only add just a few more comments. Um, we would love to see extending the superannuation guarantee payments to time spent out of the workforce for those with any caring responsibilities and potentially looking at a care credits model um, as, a, as a creative way of thinking about respecting that work. Um, Ainsley Van Onselen, who's right here beside me, has done work at the Chartered Accountants um, Organisation, and they are recommending the removal of the annual cap on the superannuation limits and replacing that with a lifetime cap so that women who take long periods of time career breaks and look after their families, when they return to work, they can actually top up their superannuation rapidly without breaching the superannuation cap. Very simple things that take a disincentive from keeping financial security high in the minds of those returning. Now, not everything should be about parenting and motherhood and dealing with the motherhood trap, although that is critical. As Trav has said in the previous panel, we need safety nets in place and CEW alongside ACOS, the BCA and others very much supports the increase in the job seeker payment rates and we've heard, I think, almost universal support for that here today. Most recently, I'd like to highlight the incredible work of National Treasure Professor Anne Summers AO, who in her report, The Choice, Violence or Poverty, utilise for the first time our ABS data to reveal the experience of single mothers in Australia, the women who face poverty when they choose to leave violent relationships, and 50% of the women who do escape violence now rely on government payments as their main and often their only source of income. A single policy step would be to reinstate the single payments parent and to the single parents payment to support sole parents into secure employment and escaping the desperate poverty trap that so many find themselves in. I'm really encouraged that across the, uh, the, the proceedings in the last two days, we've seen businesses, um, leaders, government leaders and others talking about the fact that they commit to uh, diversity and inclusion and, and leadership in all the things we care about. 
But I have to tell you that um, CEW next week will launch our census results. The sixth year we have looked at the uh, position of women in leadership across the country. And whilst we've done well on boards, I can't tell you the number today because that would, um, that would upset CEW at the moment for our release next week. Um, but we are going backwards when it comes to women in leadership in large organisations, particularly in the ASX 300. Um, that seems an abomination and a, a ludicrous um, result given all the commitments that have been made around the panels today. Um, there's lots that can be done to fix that and for government that would be um, uh, uh, supporting those companies that actually commit to women in leadership as procurement favourites um, and ensuring that those who don't do it understand that there is a consequence to pay for not having women in those positions. And of course if we're looking at women in leadership those, those same uh, presumptions should be for all diversity in leadership and I can't help but reflect on the fact that the tone of this summit has been uh, generally changed by, the, by just the range of diverse people in leadership who are leading the conversation in a different way. That should be in every organisation, no matter where we find ourselves, to actually get to the point of better policies and outcome, no matter whether that's governments, business, the community sector or elsewhere. I almost also don't want us to forget two sectors. They've been mentioned in passing this afternoon. That's sport and um, the creative industries and arts, where so much work is done for women. Um, I noticed uh, Steve mentioned the Father of the Year, or the Father's Day. Father of the Year this year is Craig Foster. And if you wanted to see a model of a, a man who is committed to diversity um, and inclusion and has used the power of soccer to bring um, pathways for the Afghan women's national soccer team to find work and employment in Australia through sport, there could be no better example of why sport plays that incredible role. I think I'll, I'll leave it there, Helen. Yeah, the, yes. At the end of the day, you're at, you're at five minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Apologies. I think you can see where it's going. I think. But, um, and thank, thank but you it was a very worthwhile five minutes, um, and good luck with the work that you're doing um, post the summit. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge also the work that Ainsley Van Onsen has been doing uh, in this space as well. Uh, that brings me. I've got two more. Um, Leanne Ho, Chief Executive Officer of the Economic of Economic Justice Australia. Thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners. I've put a lot of black through this page, so it's going to be short. Sorry, Leanne, <laughs> but go for it. So I'd like to start with the words of a victim of RoboDebt who wrote to me last week after the welcome announcement of the Royal Commission. My husband suffered a sudden heart attack, leaving me sole carer for three disabled kids. I suffered immense stress and trauma from the RoboDebt letter with one month to repay. We did the right thing. We got the information from past employers, took it to Centrelink, out of our minds, leaving important parenting duties behind, stressed out of our mind for fear of fines and having to borrow money to pay it back. There's no headspace to even think about looking for work when Centrelink puts you in this crisis situation. The impact of punitive interactions with Centrelink are no different today than they were back then with the robo-debt letters. Economic Justice Australia's legal centres see thousands of people every year whose job-seeking efforts are frustrated by their dealings with the social security system. A mum who can't finish TAFE because she's swamped with parents' next obligations. A mum who can't pay for meds for her disabled child because she got cut off payment when her child was in hospital. Permanent skilled migration may well be the answer to our skills shortages. However, we make migrants wait four years before they can access even the payment of last resort special benefit. Remembering how we left them without support during COVID lockdowns, migrants may well choose options other than Australia to contribute their labour. Disability support pension is a payment that allows people with a partial capacity to work to cycle in and out of employment as their capacity allows them to participate. But you only have to look at the 56 pages of forms to see how impenetrable that system is. Here's a question on page 23. Are you 21 years of age? Wait for it. 
Have you worked and earned at least 75% of the maximum wage level A of the transitional Australian pay and classification scale or a modern award applicable to trainees within an 18 month period since last leaving secondary school? Can anyone in this room answer that question? <laughs> The social security system has the power, the potential to change lives. We helped a survivor to get onto parenting payment, having her domestic violence recognised. She used that payment to retrain as a social worker and now she helps others in the same position. A great result, but she needed a lawyer to get it. It shouldn't be this hard. We need the system to change. It's the system that needs to change. Thank you. Leanne, thank you. Uh, and one final contribution, Andrew Forrest. Thank you. I'll be very brief. Last week, I picked up a distant sister of mine from a female prison. She reminded me, uh, as she does, of where I grew up, who taught me to hunt and to track and to speak Yamaji, who I was related to by blood and marriage. And then in her dreadful addiction, she took me back to her own life and the people in the prison which she had just left behind. She reminded me again of the dreadful scourge of alcohol and drugs and how they keep vulnerable people vulnerable. And if you're not vulnerable, you get exposed to it, you quickly become vulnerable. And those people around you are vulnerable and you're caught in this vortex of drugs and alcohol. And I say that we now employ thousands of vulnerable people, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, and it seriously breaks my heart that we're not yet able as a country to address this scourge. And when we do, we apply the same old formulas. And I can tell you we're identifying with Einstein's interpretation of insanity, hoping for a different result, doing it the same way. So I just want to put that out there. We have to go after drugs and alcohol if we're really going to go after vulnerability in our beautiful country. The second and last thing I want to say is to combine a few of the great subjects. My wife, Nicola, and I have been fortunate enough to fund tens of millions and parts of hundreds of millions of dollars of paediatric brain science. We now know how the developing brain works. We now know that it grows several times more between one and five than it will ever grow after that. Well, it's just a couple of percent. That's your development. Can we please bring in, as my only and my last idea, can we bring in affordable childcare, affordable childcare for all mums and dads, and bring into that that distilled paediatric brain science which allows that little human to grow up with all empathy, love, everything we love about humanity, see it into that person because it is not, it is not the intelligence often where you went to school, it is the character you are which is connected through those trillions of neurons can we please have early childhood development in, early, in uh, affordable, early, affordable childcare within early childhood development? Thank you. Fantastic. I know I pushed you all, but you're all excellent con contributions. Thank you so much. Um, Amanda, Thank do you. you want to add anything? I'm just going to quickly sum up, uh, because I'm standing in between you and lunch. I'd like to thank everyone for their contribution. I think we've made a very broad-ranging discussion. I think what the message is, is there's a challenge for us all, a challenge for us all to shift this dial. I would like to say that there is some long-term challenges out there about how we make government systems work, whether that be employment services, whether that be the social security system, that is something uh, uh, that is a long-term piece of work. Certainly the disability uh, employment service, it's been very clear from uh, that we are working and want to change that to ensure that there is more options for people in uh, the rest of the country. I think there is a, a need and a commitment about partnership here, and I think whether that's the partnership opportunity 
opportunity that Matt has thrown up to us, whether that's the partnership with business, and I'm very pleased that through this summit uh, we will see a signing of a memorandum of understanding with the Business Council of Australia and government about how we uh, work to increase disability employment services, uh, oh sorry, employment, disability employment um, in uh, member organisations, as well as uh, uh, a program around the visitor economy. They've been really productive discussions for people with a disability. I uh, appreciate the Tech Council of Australia who have um, put on the table to develop a virtual work experience program. It is a commitment of the government to move forward to make sure that we do have meaningful work experience opportunities, place-based mentoring programs and a set of best practice principles and that I know is something we have committed to. But in addition, um, I, I with the Tech Council making that commitment uh, around, uh, around those opportunities for work experience. I'm very pleased that the government will commit to delivering 1,000 digital traineeships in the Australian public service over four years with a focus on uh, the opportunities for women, First Nations people, older Australians and veterans transitioning into civilian life. The emphasis on place-based, the importance of place-based is something that the government is very much committed to, but also getting programs that work. And I would uh, acknowledge um, the announcement made yesterday by Minister Burney, who talked about uh, replacing uh, the old community development program with a program that delivers real jobs and proper wages, but importantly, making 25% of that existing funding flexible to look at how we actually deliver solutions in place-based, uh, in, in places in remote communities. So a, a really important commitment to that. Um, I think also uh, how we uh, support uh, businesses to uh, uh, make sure that they've got the right things in place is really important. And I'm really pleased that uh, the government will put in place a carer-friendly workplace framework with training modules to make sure business Businesses understand really what a, a carer-friendly workplace looks like. So there's a range of things um, we can commit to now. Evidence was something that was brought up as well, and I'm very pleased that the government will provide additional funding to the ABS to strengthen information on barriers and incentives through the Labor Force Survey. And the government is pursuing with the states and territories also uh, the uh, disability data asset to really get an understanding of the experience for uh, people with a disability. There is, of course, they are the immediate things we can do. There's also, of course, a lot more work to do. Some of these issues, as Matthew rightly pointed out, are, 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 are generational, but of course also many of them are significant system changes. So I know that the government is looking uh, particularly at early childhood education. Uh, I know the states and territories are on board on that in elevating that to make sure that that is is, uh, there is a long-term vision um, through all states and territories. So I think there's a lot to work on uh, in the short term, but also a lot of uh, stuff that we can work on the long term. And I thank everyone for uh, not just today, but the ongoing collaboration we're going to have in the future. Thank you. Lunch is ready for you up the back. Go and grab it. You've got 10 minutes back here with, to see the, the Treasurer <laughs> and you. the Prime Minister Sorry, conclude. And I'm told I'm there'll sure be uh, some announcements, so don't miss no, it. No, you Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for um, joining me. Uh, in such a timely fashion back in the room. I hope you enjoyed that shortened lunch. Please continue eating if you uh, need to. I know we've um, truncated the agenda this afternoon to fit everything in, which um, was very worth the effort. And again, uh, thank you to Minister Rishworth for those last three sessions that were um, in moving around the room, incredibly moving for uh, many of you here today. Uh, so with the the official um, sessions concluded. I now call on the Treasurer, Jim Chalmers.
Thanks once again, uh, Helen, and thanks for everything that you've done uh, to help uh, make sure that the conversation has flowed as freely as it has. It hasn't been easy. Would you please put your hands together for Helen? I acknowledge, as I think all of the speakers have, uh, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people, their elders, customs and traditions, uh, and I'm proud uh, that First Nations uh, ideas uh, have been such a central part of what we've been discussing uh, the last couple of days. Uh, my job before you this afternoon, uh, in addition to inviting the Prime Minister to wrap up the proceedings, uh, I have two other tasks. Uh, first of all, to thank you, uh, and secondly, uh, to run through uh, the announcements, the outcomes, uh, and the further work that the Albanese government is preparing to undertake with you uh, in the aftermath of what has been really a uh, tremendously successful conversation the last two days. So in thanking you, I wanted to thank you for showing what is possible when we tap into the best collaborative instincts of the Australian people. I want to thank you for your ideas, your ingenuity, your candour, your commitment and the really quite remarkable enthusiasm that you have shown in this search that we've all been on for consensus and common ground. I wanted to thank you for demonstrating our country's capacity to come together when we need to, to find that common ground in a common cause and for the common good. Uh, and when it comes to the outcomes of this Jobs and Skills Summit, I wanted to thank you in particular for exceeding even our most optimistic expectations. Uh, and I really mean that. You know, we had relatively high hopes for this Jobs and Skills Summit. Uh, we tried to keep our expectations in check, but we've detected, I think, haven't we, Prime Minister, around this country, certainly the last few months, but before that as well, a genuine hunger for some real talk about our economic challenges and a genuine appetite to see what we might be able to achieve if we work together. Uh, and in doing so, all of you here today, indeed everyone who's participated in more than a hundred workshops and mini summits and consultations around Australia in the lead up to yesterday and today, you have genuinely exceeded even our most optimistic expectations for what we might be able to advance together. And I want to tell you uh, how the, the way that that is most obvious to me as I go through the draft of the outcomes document from this conversation. Uh, and I want to let you in on something. Uh, when I was working with uh, these colleagues here, indeed colleagues from throughout our team led by the Prime Minister, we were trying to make sure that at the end of these two days that we might have had at least a handful of concrete outcomes. Uh, in our, the best version of things, we thought it would be great to have perhaps 10 or a dozen uh, outcomes. Uh, and I am just so incredibly pleased and incredibly proud to tell you uh, that what we will announce today is 36 concrete outcomes, which are a consequence of what you have told us, either from these lecterns and from these microphones or in conversations around this Jobs and Skills Summit or the ideas that you have brought from every corner of Australia and every part of our economy. There are 36 concrete steps that the government intends to take with your help, con consulting with you in an ongoing way as an outcome of these Jobs and Skills Summit. And so one of the consequences of that, and this is where you'll breathe a sigh of relief, was that I was hoping to read out all of the outcomes uh, that we've <laughs> that we've got before us, but uh, I'm proposing not to do that. Instead, uh, we will circulate quite a detailed document. We'll make that available, not just to everybody here, but to everybody around Australia and beyond who wants to look at that document. There's 36 concrete outcomes, steps that we think that we can take this year, more or less immediately. Uh, and then there's about the same number of areas that we have identified for further work. So 36 immediately this year. Uh, around the same number for further work. And that is in addition to uh, some of the policies which are incredibly relevant to the issues that have been raised that we took to the election or have announced subsequently as well. 
And I know that the Prime Minister will want to speak about some of these outcomes in slightly more detail, so let me just gallop through some of the outcomes that we are announcing today, uh, or indeed that the Prime Minister announced yesterday. The first, of course, is that billion dollars in joint federal state funding for fee-free TAFE in 2023 and the accelerated delivery of the 465,000 fee-free TAFE places. Uh, there will be, and the Prime Minister will talk about this in more detail than I will, uh, there will be recognition uh, that in order to get more older Australian workers into the workforce uh, that we need to make that easier uh, by relaxing uh, the various work tests and we will make it clear how we intend to do that and I know the Prime Minister wants to talk about the, that shortly. Uh, we will make it uh, possible for uh, $575 million in the National Housing Infrastructure Facility uh, to invest in affordable housing uh, by attracting financing from super funds and other sources of private capital. So there's an important step there on social and affordable housing. Uh, we will modernise, as you know, our workplace relations laws, including to make bargaining accessible for all workers and businesses. We will amend the Fair Work Act to strengthen access to flexible working arrangements, uh, make unpaid parental leave more flexible and strengthen protection for workers against discrimination and harassment. We will improve access to jobs and training pathways for women, First Nations, regional Australians and culturally and linguistically diverse people, including equity targets for training places. There will be 1,000 digital apprenticeships in the Australian public service along these lines and other measures to reduce barriers to uh, employment as well. Uh, we will increase, as Claire said earlier, uh, the permanent migration program ceiling to 195,000 in 2022-23 to help ease widespread critical workforce shortages. Uh, we will extend visas uh, and relax work restrictions on international students to strengthen the pipeline of skilled labour. And we will provide additional funding to resolve the visa backlog that a number of you have raised in the course of the conversations uh, as well. And so that gives you a bit of a sense uh, of the level of ambition. Those are examples, only a small amount uh, of the 36 concrete steps that we propose to take. Now, there's something that won't be listed in the outcomes document that I think deserves our acknowledgement, if not our celebration. Uh, I think we have shown together, uh, all of us, uh, that we can do politics and policy discussion and debate better than it has been done before. We do have a fresh approach to problem solving that I think our country has been crying out for. And that's what we wanted this summit to be about. Uh, that is, as I said at the opening, what this Prime Minister and his leadership is all about, and it's what he's made his government all about. Uh, but obviously, we cannot do all of these things that we seek to do on our own. Uh, I mentioned the state premiers and, chief, and territory chief ministers yesterday. I uh, wanted to acknowledge as well Linda and her colleagues in local government right around Australia, massive employers in their own right, but also when it comes to so many of the things that we want to achieve together, uh, an important part of what we're trying to do. I want to acknowledge all of the industries here, and some got discussed more than others, and that's inevitable uh, in a conversation of just two days. But so many industries were identified, and I was talking to Anna Bly as well about the finance industry, where so many of these challenges come together too, and so many of the industries that you uh, have raised that you represent. I wanted to thank you for providing uh, all of that uh, input as well. Uh, this is, I think, the beginning of a new era of cooperation and consensus. And our task now is to take this moment, take this momentum, and to build something bigger on it, to build change that lasts, that bigger, stronger, broader, more inclusive, more sustainable economy that we desperately want for Australians so that more of the opportunities that are created by so many of you and by our country uh, can be reached for and reached uh, by more and more Australians in every single part uh, of this country. Uh, I mentioned before that I wanted to uh, do some thank yous 
uh, and I've thanked Helen, uh, and I want to thank uh, all of the facilitators of all of the sessions, uh, all of the speakers, of course, uh, all of you who participated in those conversations, and everyone who participated in the weeks leading and months leading up to uh, the beginning of proceedings uh, yesterday. Uh, I also wanted to uh, thank a group of people who don't often get enough thanks. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, all of the staff uh, that have made uh, what we've achieved at this Jobs and Skills Summit possible. Uh, I of course want to begin by thanking all of the Parliament House staff uh, and everybody who has worked on the event itself. Uh, and in addition to that, I wanted to shout out uh, the staff, the advisors, the teams in my office and in the Treasury, in the offices of my ministerial colleagues and in their departments as well. Uh, and if you'll forgive me for a moment to single out one person, which breaks all of the rules of politics, I'm aware of that. Uh, but I wondered if you wouldn't mind putting your hands together for Claudia Crawford and the team that she so ably leads. And many of you have seen now in the last two days what I've seen for the last 15 years or so, and that's just not Claudia's remarkable intellect but her extraordinary patience as well. Uh, we're grateful for that and I know that she would want me to say and I want to say that the team that she leads is really quite a remarkable team as well. Uh, the, my ministerial staff, all of the staff in the PMO and the ministerial officers, the staff in the Treasury uh, and all of the departmental officials as well. I wanted to make sure that they have been uh, appropriately uh, acknowledged. Uh, I want to thank the coordinating ministers uh, who have done really an incredible job. I was thinking about Amanda there, chairing three sessions in a row at the end. Uh, I was thinking about all of the work uh, that colleagues have done in the ministry. Beyond that, we've got a number of colleagues here from our parliamentary team, very valued colleagues. Uh, and I wanted to acknowledge them as well. Uh, many of them have made massive contributions to what we are announcing today. Uh, and finally, I wanted to uh, thank the Prime Minister. Uh, and I wanted to thank the Prime Minister for not just the really quite extraordinary and genuine trust that he places in his team, uh, in his cabinet, in his ministry, in his parliamentary team, uh, I wanted to thank him for the trust that he places in his country, uh, the belief that he has in this country, the humility and the respect with which he goes about his job, which recognises that not every good idea has to come from him or from his office, that the best ideas in this country come from the ground up and they come to Canberra, not always necessarily from Canberra. And so I wanted to, uh, in introducing the Prime Minister to wrap things up formally, I wanted to say, PM, that I think this summit was a success in large measure because it reflects your natural instincts to cooperate with people, to build coalitions, to find common ground, and as I said, to do that with a degree of trust and respect and humility as well. So from me, and I think from everybody here, uh, I wanted to thank you for all of that, and I wondered if you wouldn't mind putting your hands together for the Prime Minister of Australia, Anthony Albanese. Well, thanks very much, um, uh, Jim, for that very generous uh, introduction. I, I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting and pay my respect to Elders past and present and thank the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us today who've contributed and made this forum just so much better uh, through your input. Uh, I do want to uh, now return the favour and ask everyone to thank Jim Chalmers. Uh, this has been a, a, an event which has been far more successful than we could have hoped. And to Jim and your team, uh, to all of my ministerial 
uh, colleagues who've done so much hard work uh, for your staff, for all of the dedicated public servants. I spoke at the National Press Club uh, this week. Being a public servant is an honourable profession and one of the things that we have to do as a new government is to rebuild the public service, rebuild it as a body that can give frank and fearless advice, rebuild it as a body that is given respect and ensure that it can uh, deliver uh, the sort of advice and delivery of services uh, that Australians can expect. And it is one of the things that I believe has characterised the first 100 days of the government I'm proud to lead, is ministers going to their departments and talking to their people in those departments on the ground and engaging with them and encouraging them uh, to be the best that they can be. So I do think that this has been an extraordinary success. And all of those people are deserving of our thanks. But most importantly, I wanted to thank all of you, the participants at this summit, for attending in good faith, for leaving old disagreements behind, for contributing and presenting with conviction and depth, for challenging our assumptions, for pushing us to think, and for engaging and listening with that respect. Respect for one another and respect for the people you represent, the people this summit was designed to serve. The everyday Australians whose courage and initiative and hard work help power our national prosperity. I believe that people will look back on this summit and they mightn't remember all of the 36 points that have come out of uh, this two-day process and the lead up to it as outcomes. But I tell you what, I reckon they'll remember the time, remember the first time that there was a national gathering of this sort that had 50% representation of men and 50% representation of women. Uh, not just as uh, people who were here uh, participating and listening to debate, but as presenters, as chairs, as contributors. They'll look back and they'll remember, wow, remember the diversity that was there, the fact that the group represented uh, by having working people talk about their experience, people with disabilities, people who've done it tough, talking about their own experience as people did in that remarkable session this morning. And having uh, people here uh, who are incredibly successful business people listening to, as I spoke to a couple of people before, I won't embarrass them by quoting them, but it's a big deal to come and to give a presentation if that is not uh, the thing that you do for a living uh, like myself and my colleagues and so many of the representatives here do, in front of not just the Cabinet, but CEOs of major global and Australian-based companies, of the leaders of the trade union movement, of people who they get to see on TV at night from time to time. So I thank the courage of those people who came and spoke uh, out of their usual comfort zone. Uh, because you enriched these two days by your contributions. So whilst there has been a great diversity of perspectives here, I think there's also been a striking sense of unity. Uh, when we had the discussion before about workers in the ag sector, I, I think it's fair to say that Daniel Walton and David Littleproud haven't always been on the same page. But essentially they were in the same direction about what is needed. And that's a great example, I think, of the, the goodwill uh, that has been here, that sense of common purpose. 
every presenter in every session was totally clear about the scale of the challenges that we're facing. No one sought to downplay or explain away the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And yet the prevailing atmosphere over the past two days has not been one of dejection or frustration or resignation. Instead, there's been a powerful sense of hope and optimism, a belief in the transformative opportunities that this moment represents for our country. And above all, a determination to seize these opportunities, to make change work for everyone across our country. We owe it to each other and we know it to the Australian people to carry that spirit forward. The discussions, the engagement, the shared principles, all of this is greatly encouraging. Of course it is. But the real test, the true measure of these days will be if we can look back and say that as a result of what we have agreed here, more young Australians found apprenticeships or enrolled in TAFE. More small businesses could find and keep the staff that they need to grow. More people turned good ideas into successful companies. More workers were able to sit down with their employers and negotiate for better pay and greater security. And more Australians who have been locked out of the economy were given a way in. If we can look back and say that these conversations helped open the doors of opportunity for people with disability, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians, for veterans, for older Australians, for people who have suffered the dislocation of long-term unemployment, then this summit will have done more than exceed our expectations. It will have helped change our country for the better. I can promise you this, the government is determined to see these discussions make a difference. I want to draw attention to just three areas giving proof to that. Firstly, the fact that we are boosting our national skills with that bring forward of 180,000 fee-free TAFE places to launch a training blitz from the 1st of January next year more Australians learning the skills they need for the job they want, helping more young people to learn a trade and build a rewarding career. And alongside that, tackling the immediate shortages across the country with an increased migration intake to 195,000. But something in which there is clear consensus from people in this room is that we need a more straightforward and certain pathway to permanent residency. And I believe there's an important and genuine consensus, not just in this room, but indeed around the country, that migration should not simply be about bringing in workers to fill gaps. It should be about helping people to put down roots to join in the life of our country towns, our regions and our suburbs to make a home, to raise a family, to join our Australian family, strengthening our economy and our great multicultural society. Secondly, I'm very pleased that we will be making up to $575 million available within the National Housing Infrastructure Facility to invest in social and affordable housing and to attract more investment from private capital such as superannuation funds into housing. We hope that that $575 million is a multiplier, is just a proportion of a multiplier impact, whereby you use that as a catalyst for super funds to invest many times that in order to expand the supply of housing in this country because so many opportunities in life depend upon having a secure roof over your head. And thirdly, picking up on the very good discussions that we've had around increasing workforce participation for older Australians. Today, I'm pleased to announce that the government will act to provide aged pensioners with a new $4,000 work bonus income bank credit. Now, this will mean 
the older Australians who want to work can earn more income before their pension is reduced. And we'll move quickly to change the law so that instead of pensioners having their payments cancelled after 12 weeks, if they exceed the income limit, they won't have to reapply for payments for up to two years. And they'll retain the pensioner concession card for two years as well. This will apply this process again, like the bring forward of the take places for the current financial year. And we'll legislate in coming weeks to make sure that this can happen. Some older Australians stay in the workforce longer because they have to, and some do it because they want to, because they love what they do, because their job is part of their identity, a source of friendship and stimulation and pride. It's been another great point of agreement to emerge from the summit. All of us, federal, state and local government, and I do join with Jim in thanking the Premier's Chief Ministers and local government representatives who've joined us here. Employers, unions, we can all do better at valuing older Australians for their wisdom, their experience and the contribution they make to our country. A final point I want to make before we conclude. Uh, Michelle O'Neill noted yesterday that the, at the 1983 Economic Summit, 96 out of the 97 participants were men. Just think about how far we've come as a nation. The steps that have been fought for, let's be clear. Uh, the doors that have been kicked down in order to advance uh, gender equality in this country. We, of course, have more to do. But I do hope that the participation and the coverage that this summit has received will mean that when other gatherings are held from now on, if there isn't, you don't have to have 50, but you've got to get close. We exceeded it this time. If there are unrepresented bodies, people will say, why? If the National Jobs and Skills Summit could do it, why couldn't you? And I think that will uh, not really be needed as a source of pressure because the participants I've spoken to over the last two days and last night at the dinner were all talking about what a difference that it made, how it uplifted uh, the very uh, basis and culture uh, in the room over the last couple of days. So friends, we came here to find agreement and we have across so many areas, perhaps across a greater range than we could have possibly hoped for. But let us leave here resolved to build on this foundation and let the legacy of this gathering be a stronger economy that works better for people that works better for workers, that works better for business, for those who live in our regions and those who live in our suburbs, for women and men, for young and old, for all Australians for the years to come. This is how we turn what was a theme of my election campaign of a better future into an objective not for a political party into a reality for a nation, a nation that can have a better future, that the prospect of achieving that is far greater if we've got everyone heading in one direction or where we're not completely in agreement about heading in that direction or at least respectful and not questioning the motives but engaging, talking through differences, coming up with solutions rather than arguments. If we continue that, I have no doubt that we will realise the enormous potential that we have as a nation. The potential I spoke about uh, yesterday morning when I opened the summit and what I conclude with as it closes here, and I wish everyone a very safe uh, visit uh, back to your cities, your regional towns, and to your families. Thanks very much.